This is Audible. Audible Frontiers presents Chris Longknife, Undaunted, written by Mike Shepard, narrated by Dina Perlman. Chapter One. Lieutenant Chris Longknife sat in the captain's chair of the Wardhaven Explorer ship Wasp. The unquestioned commander of all she surveyed. Of course, she had the con on the midwatch, and there was very little to survey. Most of the wasp's crew were sound asleep. Far from her sight, the scant midnight watch went about their duties, keeping the air cool, the lights on, and the ship decelerating at one g on its established course. The only person in Chris's sight was Chief Benny. He studied the instruments at the navigator's position. Most of the time, he fed his sensor data to the navigator. Just now, he took advantage of the quiet midwatch to see what she did with his input. He was also weighing his options to go to OCS, trying on an officer's shoes to check the fit. All in all, it looked to be a very quiet and comfortable midwatch. How long has it been, Nellie? How long has what been? Chris's pet computer, worth several ships like the Wasp, asked on the direct hookup into Chris's brain. Nellie was usually ten steps ahead of Chris's own thoughts, ready to answer any question before the Navy lieutenant posed it. Chris put the surly reply down to attitude, or, more correctly, tood. Chris still had a 12-year-old girl on board. Or, more accurately, a certain girl held a ship, its crew, and one very uppity computer in thrall. Content not to break the dim silence, Chris continued the conversation via the private link between her and Nellie. How long has it been since anyone tried to kill me? Oh, that. Sixty-three days. Do you want the hours, minutes, seconds, and nanoseconds, your high-handedness? That won't be necessary, Chris said, to cut off more tood. It had been a nice two months without the occasional pot shot or heart-pounding race for life. Chris could get to liking this. Of course, the whole time had been spent far beyond the rim of human-occupied space. Far enough out that she hadn't stumbled on even one sooner world. Sooner farmers, artisans, and generally cantankerous folks saw no reason why they should obey distant Earth and not push out beyond the boundaries set for humanity by old men in suits. Chris found them kindred spirits to her own desire to have as much space as possible between herself and her closest relatives. Still, where the law hadn't gotten to, often thievery, pirating, and slavery had. Chris had spent the first two months of this cruise putting down a few of those problems. Done with the intrepid side for a while, she'd spent the last two months expanding the chart of mapped and usable jump points and letting her scientists research to their heart's delight. And not been shot at once. Nice, that. How's our approach to the next jump point coming? Chris asked Chief Benny. He shook his head. It just took a zig away from us. I make it about 15,000 kilometers farther away. I would suggest... He tapped the nav board several times, frowned at the results, and said, We reduce deceleration to point eighty four g that should put us there in 22 minutes, give or take one of Nellie's nanoseconds. Apparently, the chief and Nellie were back to open hostilities. Chris ignored that and worried her lower lip. Each of the jump points created by the aliens a million or two years ago orbited two, three, or more stars. That meant their apparent orbit around any one star was anything but smooth, and caused the occasional deadly bad jump. Chris hoped this little wiggle 
meant only that the wasp would arrive a bit late for the next jump. Actually, with everyone asleep, it really wasn't a problem at all. Chris glanced at the star map on the main screen. The wasp had been working its way across the front of Wardhaven space, or, to put it more politically correct, the 136 planets now negotiating to establish some kind of association under the leadership of Grandpa Ray, King Raymond I, to anyone not his great-granddaughter. To the right of the wasp's search sweep was Greenfeld space, and the less said about that, the better for Chris's day. To the left was the Helvetican Confederacy, that, if Chris remembered something that had come across her desk, now included her friends on the proud planet Chance. Above them on the star map, looming like a black hole, was the no-go zone. Nobody in their right mind went into the buffer between humans and the Aitichi. The fight to set that zone between us and them had almost driven the human race extinct. Chris doubted any sooner or pirate would dare violate that precinct of space. Of course, the wasp was getting closer to that zone. Chris would have to decide soon just how close she'd go. She chuckled to herself, putting a buffer around a buffer. But the price for a mistake along that boundary was too high, both for her crew and the whole human race. Maybe it was already time to go farther out, rather than any farther over. For the next few minutes, Chris did the job that officers of the deck did, checking to make sure that very competent people did their jobs as well as they always did. The reactor was well in the green, reaction mass tanks were still over 65%, so it would be a while before Captain Drago, the true monarch of this small chunk of space called the Wasp, would skim the surface of a gas giant to scoop up mass, or take the more sedate approach of heading for a space station to buy the water they heated in the reactors. Chris glanced further into the daily reports. Sick Bay had only two Marines in it, victims of a handball game that had ended with a violent collision. With no one taking shots at Chris, the Marines were also being spared the odd collateral damage of being too close to one of those long knives. It really was nice being so far from human space. Nellie, report ship status, Chris said in her head. Her own board said everything was fine. Nellie's assessment would guarantee that nothing lurked deep below the surface, waiting to spoil Chris's otherwise quiet morning. In the blink of an eye, Chris was listening to, All systems well within the norms. Everyone is sleeping as well as they normally do at this time. Kara is still up, playing a game, Nellie added, addressing the precise status of the twelve-year-old who Chris more than suspected was the most important person aboard the Wasp, as far as Nellie was concerned. Shouldn't she be asleep? Tomorrow's a school day. I can just start it a bit late. Ain't no big thing. Chris blinked. When had Nellie started using contractions, or ain't? Nellie's computer-perfect grammar was supposed to be teaching proper grammar to a sixth grader. Further thoughts on that were interrupted by the chief. We're coming up on the jump point in two minutes, Lieutenant. What are your orders? Chris weighed the first and probably only command decision she'd made this watch. If we just sit here, everyone's going to wake up weightless, she mused. That was not a problem for the sailors and marines. But a third of those occupying the wasp fit neither of those categories. Chris had a large scientific contingent, and even a judge brought out of retirement and empowered to apply the law to anyone for anything Chris chose to dump in her lap. Several of the boffins besides Judge Francine did not take to microgravity all that well. Usually the wasp was underway at 1G, 
or tied up to a space station with something like normal gravity? How would they handle sleeping the next four hours in zero-G and waking up in it? Chris knew the answer to her next question, but she asked the chief anyway. We don't have any jump buoys, do we? As a matter of fact, I see four of them ready to launch on my nav board, the chief answered, to her surprise. Chris's own copy of the nav station showed nothing, so she slapped off her seatbelt and walked over to Benny's station. As she expected, it had extra space lit up. Chris recognized it, a defensive battle station. Apparently, Solwyn Khan was ready to activate all the necessary defenses of the Wasp if she got into a fight. The woman truly was Captain Drago's right-hand man. Chris went down the left side of the nav board, finding armor, foxers, maskers, everything needed by a ship fighting for its life. Four of the foxer launching tubes showed blue. Beside them was a notation. Jump buoys. I guess if we aren't faking it as a merchant ship, there's no reason not to launch the smaller ones, Chris said. Nellie, ask Captain Draga what other weapon systems the Wasp is now carrying. Yes, ma'am. I will also search the report from the last yard period and see if it tells you anything. You do that, Chris said. Four months out, and Chris still didn't know just what her supposed command had hidden away in some corner storeroom. Zero grav in 15 seconds, the chief reported. Over the public address system, a similar announcement went out, at a whisper, as the hour of the morning called for. Chris hustled back to her station and belted in. Once the wasp was at a dead stop five clicks from the jump point, she ordered, Flip ship! Chief Benny rotated the wasp smartly along her long axis. Now the bow faced the tiny bit of roiled space that was all that showed of the portal across seven light years of space. Chief, send a buoy through the jump. Have it announced that we'll be following in five minutes. You think that's a good idea? the chief asked but he was grinning, and his attention was on his fingers as they went through the motions of launching the buoy. Weapons are full, Chris answered. Her command board had been extended to include everything important from the weapons board. She'd done that about 15 seconds into the watch. She didn't expect to use the four 24-inch pulse lasers hidden under the wasp's civilian bright work, but... Chris eyed Benny's back as he finished his prep. What are you afraid of, Chief? I work for this long knife woman, ma'am. It pays for me to always be afraid, because she never is, he said. But his grin got wider as he said it. Launch the buoy, Chief, Chris said dryly. Aye, aye, Lieutenant. Buoy launched. Now they waited for five minutes. Around Chris, the ship continued its somnolence. The engineering watch checked in to ask if they'd be needing to put on a full G acceleration any time soon, were told to expect it, and went back to tending their tea kettles. The minutes dragged by. Chris did a second and third check to make sure the 24-inch lasers that the Wasp officially didn't have were at full charge. They were, and continued to be. Much to Chris's relief, Captain Drago did not appear to summon a full bridge crew and take her command away. Chris wasn't quite sure why that would bother her, but she knew it would. Five minutes gone, Chris ordered a short burst from maneuvering thrusters, and the wasp edged through the jump. Chris felt only slightly disoriented as her ship was yanked from one star to another one seven light years farther from Earth. With only a blink, she studied her board. There was the jump buoy. Farther out, some 30,000 kilometers, was a ship. Then a laser blew the jump buoy to bits. Chapter Two Jinx ship, Chris shouted. 
Raise armor. Jinxing pattern two initiated, Chief Benny answered. And the ship shot up, then left, then up again. Shields up. Chris mashed her comlink, ignoring that her call for armor had once again been changed to shields up. Battle stations, guns, Chris ordered. All hands, battle stations, guns. That done, Chris concentrated on aiming her lasers up the rear end of a very strange ship. A ship unlike any ship she'd ever seen, except on vids. An Aitichi death ball was breaking toward Chris's jump point, its vulnerable engines wide open to the wasp's lasers. That was stupid. You could say many things about those four-eyed bastards, but the Aitichi were never stupid. Chris's shield took a hit. Smart metal vaporized to a blade away what heat the metal was not able to spread quickly to the entire shield, and then radiate into space. There are two more ships out there. I make them cruisers, Chief Benny reported. Greenfeld cruisers from the way their lasers are heating up. Your Highness, I think they're the ones firing at us, or at least shooting at the death ball and missing. I think you may be right, Chris whispered. On her board, two twin batteries of six-inch lasers heated up on one cruiser as they discharged. The death ball dodged right, left, up, down. The armor that had opened like an umbrella in front of the wasp took another glancing hit. Chris, we have to shoot those green-fouled bastards, rang in Chris's head. Chris didn't have time to make a note of Nellie's new vocabulary. No, Nellie, we are not going to fire at the cruisers. I will not start a war today. But they're endangering Kara. I've got the lasers sighted in. I can hit both of them. The lasers were rock on, Chris noted. We are not shooting, Nellie. We have to, for Kara. Chris's hand had been rising almost without volition, since this silent conversation started. Now it moved like the lightning strike of a viper, depressing a tiny portion of the computer that hung at her collarbone. Chris hadn't pushed the off button on her computer since the first grade, when her teacher required her to take a math test unaided. The surface of the computer gave way with unfamiliar ease, and Chris found herself with a shrieking silence in her skull. Captain on the bridge, Captain Drago announced, as he shot through the open bridge door, still pulling on his pants. What's the situation? Chris drew in a breath, to gain herself a moment to think, and to add some noise to the silence between her ears. Focused on the world outside herself, she snapped. We're taking stray shots from two Greenfeld cruisers shooting at an Aitichi death ball, Chief, put me on guard channel. Ship's computer, what was the frequency we finally used to make contact with the Aitichi? I've got it. You're on, Chief Benny said, hitting a button on his board. Captain Drago bounced off the overhead, aimed himself at Benny's usual station, and grabbed a handhold on the chair as he cinched in his belt, apparently content to leave the rapidly developing situation to his whatever Chris was to him. Chris would have liked to stand and glare at the forward screen, hands on hips, but the wasp had no constant course. She stayed seated. This is Princess Christine Longknife on the Wardhaven exploration ship Wasp. Greenfeld cruisers check fire. You are missing the Aitichi death ball and hitting me. I repeat, check fire. One cruiser fired its four forward six inchers, just as the wasp dodged up, left, up, and right, and got singed again. Damn it, Chris snapped. You keep hitting me, and I'm not even in a direct line with the Aitichi. Our sensors show you are, someone from a Greenfeld cruiser snapped back. So get out of our line of fire. I'm going right, Chris announced. 
the Aitichi, Chris noticed, immediately went right as well, not letting Chris open up so much as a kilometer more lateral displacement. It also didn't fire. The four-eyed bastard is going right with you, the Greenfeld cruiser reported. And it hasn't fired on you since I got here, Chris pointed out. Has it fired on you at all? Well, not exactly, but it's Aitichi, and it's outside their empire. That makes it a target. Chris was aware that the Greenfeld commander was quoting one interpretation of the Treaty of the Orange Nebula. Grandpa Ray always insisted the proper reading was that you could return fire if one of them shot at you. And Grandpa Ray was a signatory to that treaty on the human side. Chris never expected to argue the fine points of treaty language over charged lasers, but there seemed no better time than the present. The Wasp put on a half-G acceleration. Solwyn, in her usual cutoffs and tank top but barefooted, was now at Chris's weapon station. She brought it up as Nav. Chris unsnapped her seatbelt and took four steps toward the screen. Behind her, Captain Drago, chest bare, slipped into his seat. The bridge stations were filling up. Chris played the only card she had. Cease fire, or I swear to God if you hit me again. I, Princess Chris Longknife, great-granddaughter of Ray Longknife, will fire on you. And I hit what I aim at. Just check your file on me. There was a long pause. A glance at Chief Benny's station, now fully devoted to sensors, showed the Greenfeld ships putting a full charge to their main batteries. They were 80,000 kilometers out. The Wasp was well past their accurate range. The Aitichi death ball was a long shot, even at 30,000 clicks closer. No wonder their shooting was so far off. Yeah, we understand you, finally came, as a Greenfeld Navy officer's face filled the main screen. What do you intend to do with your four eyes? Talk to them if I can, Chris said. Escort them back to their territory, no matter what. Definitely, the Aitichi had to go back to Imperial space. If he was one of their wandering men, the lawless types who'd started the Aitichi War, the crew of this death ball would not like that. The Aitichi attitude toward wandering men was similar to what humans felt toward pirates, but without the warm and fuzzy feel-good side. Do you want us to stand by in case the four eyes cause you any trouble? The Greenfeld captain asked. I think I'll have an easier time talking to him if the folks who chased him across this system kind of moseyed along. Don't you, Captain? Captain, someone said off screen, and the screen went blank. Chris didn't move, expecting the interruption to be short. Behind her, Captain Drago and Sulwyn exchanged whispered words. A sailor arrived with a shirt, and Drago quickly put it on, along with the purple coat he wore far more often than either his merchant skipper's greens or reserve navy captain's blues. Lieutenant Longknife, he said dryly. When will I leave you in charge for a moment and not come back to find that you have started a war? He had no idea how close his hyperbole was to write on, but Chris tried to reply with her usual banter. I haven't started a war. Yet, Chris insisted, through unmoving lips, keeping her eyes focused on the blank screen. Since it stayed blank, she ventured a further response. I may have just stopped Greenfeld from getting us into another Aitichi war. The captain said nothing but Chris could almost hear him rolling his eyes at the overhead. The screen blinked and came alive again. It seems that I have other orders that I must take care of at the moment. If you do not mind, I will use the jump you just used to make my way home. I will accelerate toward the sun, Chris said. Before our closest point of encounter, 
I will rotate ship and protect my engines. You may do as you please. Until we meet again, Princess Christine Longknife of Wardhaven. Coming from the captain, it sounded like a threat and a promise. Salwin, but on one G, Captain Drago ordered. Aim us in the general direction of the sun for now. Princess, what do we do with your stray Aitichi? Chris started to shrug. Opie follows her home, came from Marine Captain Jack Montoya as he entered the bridge. The captain, as the commander of the Rump Marine Company aboard the Wasp, was under her command. As security chief of a serving member of royal blood, Chris had to do what he told her where her security was involved. That made for an interesting chain of command. It didn't help that he was as handsome as she was plain. No, as she thought herself plain. He'd made it clear, in an officially proper way, that what he saw when he looked her way was beauty. Chris chose to ignore the confused place this was taking her. She had enough problems, and today was only 46 minutes old. Ship's computer, can you raise the Aitichi? Chris asked. Contact is being attempted. The WASP is sending the contact signal King Raymond I used that led to the initial talks at the Orange Nebula. And? Captain Drago asked. No reply. Captain Drago frowned for a second. Uh, Princess, why are you talking to my ship's computer and not your Nelly? Nelly was notorious throughout human space for her superiority to other computers, personal or otherwise. I had to turn her off, Chris admitted. Off? Jack got out first. You don't ever turn Nelly off. She had the Greenfeld cruisers sighted in, was ready to fire on them, something about protecting Kara. It was either let her start a war or turn her off. Chris eyed said cruisers as they reversed ship and began decelerating toward the jump point. They'd still be going at a pretty good clip when they passed through it. That was their problem. Nelly also was using ain't and bastard, Chris added. You really need her to have that talk with your auntie True, Jack said. Chris sighed. She's way overdue. Yes, princess, but what do we tell this Aitichi? Follow me? Captain Drago asked. No, Chris said. Not unless your ship's computer knows the proper form of the pronoun me, or we might insult whoever that is and start a war on that alone. Nellie and I did a term paper in Aitichi just for fun my senior year of high school. Of course, Nellie had to translate it for the teacher. We got an A. We need a translator just now, Jack said. You willing to wake Nellie up? Not while we've got Greenfeld cruisers in our sky, Chris said. Captain, can your computer say something like, follow in our wake? Examination of shattered Aitichi cadavers had hinted that they were a lot more recent in their transition from sea to land. Grandpa Trouble got away with saying that to the first Aitichi shipload of negotiators. The ship computer found that line in some history and sent the message. There was no reply, but the death ball altered course and accelerated at 1G toward the sun. Sulwyn modified her course to swing her engines out of a direct line of fire from the cruisers and kept the 1G acceleration. Chris reached for a workstation and held on steady as her inner ear took a while to adjust to the twisting course, made worse by the occasional jinx up, down, or over. Sulwyn was not a trusting soul, not with Chief Benny reporting that the cruisers had fully charged lasers. Through all this, the Aitichi death ball followed the wasp like a stray puppy followed a four-year-old kid, dropping hot dog bits of encouragement. 
Was it pure chance that its course also increased the distance between it and the cruisers? And edged kind of behind the wasp. Captain Drago studied his board, seemed satisfied, and said, Lieutenant Longknife, you are relieved as officer of the deck. Please get off of my bridge. Captain, I'm your gunnery officer. If someone on the Wasp is to shoot at those Greenfeld cruisers, it should be a serving Wardhaven officer, Chris said, turning to a vacant bridge station and tapping it in three places. It started lighting up as an offensive weapons control station. One of the few things you and I agree upon, the captain said, and mashed his comm link. Lieutenant Pasley, please report to the bridge. Which Penny did, five seconds later. I was already on my way, she said, as she slipped into the station chair at the weapons board before Chris could. Chris scowled down at the other active duty Navy officer on the wasp. What's that leave me to do? she mumbled to herself. The hard stuff, Captain Drago said, making a shooing motion with both hands. I'll handle the Greenfeld cruisers. They only outnumber and outgun us. They'll never outclass us. You need to make friendly with your pet computer. I really feel the lack of her input. Oh, and there is that I teach ye. Screw matters up with them, and we'll only wish the Greenfeld cruisers had blasted us out of space with their first shot. Chapter 3 Chris would have much preferred a straight-up fight with a pair of Greenfeld cruisers, tough odds but manageable. The Aitichi death ball was a greater threat, with the ambiguity of a ticking time bomb. It might go off now, or later. The only certainty was that it would go off and make a mess of her entire day. And she was facing the Aitichi without Nellie. She'd never headed into a fight with one arm and one leg in a cast, or just flat cut off. What a mess. Well, few things didn't get better when shared. Chris mashed her comm link. Will the princess's staff please report? No, with the Aitichi in the mix... This was no time to call a meeting in her boring conference room. To her tack room. There, that had the proper lethality for a council of war. It was the same room, but it had deadly all over it. You drop in too, Captain, as soon as those cruisers are out of our sky, Chris told Drago, as she left him to his own and full devices. We'll do, your highness, Captain Drago answered with just the right nod to her royal status from his aloof post as contract captain of this not-supposed-to-be warship. Chris headed for her conference tack room. Chief Benny was there first. The wall to Chris's left as she entered now matched the main screen on the bridge. At a glance, Chris could see how the dance was going as the Greenfeld cruisers made their way out and the Aitichi death ball edged in close. Chris breathed a sigh of relief, even as a part of her brain screamed, What's wrong with this picture? You've got to be nuts to be glad to see human cruisers leaving, even as an Aitichi gets closer, said Colonel Hernando Cortez, formerly of several military organizations, and at the moment, Chris's prisoner and employee. That combination, along with the display, pretty much summed up Chris's efforts to be a good Navy officer. Oh, if Father or General Mac could see me now, Chris said. They'd laugh their heads off, Captain Jack Montoya said, as he followed Chris into the room and took a glance at the board. As Chris's former Secret Service agent, he'd sworn to take a bullet for her. Now, as the chief of her security detail and commander of a Marine detachment, his job was no easier, or, with Chris's attitude toward secure, any more survivable. What you folks gone and done to get me out of bed? said Abby, presenting herself in a fluffy housecoat, curlers, and huge slippers with rabbit ears on them. 
occasionally an Army Reserve Intelligence officer. This early in the morning, Abby was clearly filling the role of Chris's maid, and born-again coward. We got company, Chris said. I hope they're nice folks that their mamas taught to mind their manners, Abby said, scowling at the strange symbol on the display. What's that? An Aitichi death ball, Jack said. It followed the princess home. The colonel showed honest fear. Abby's half-open eyes were suddenly quite open. Can we keep it? came from the other pair of wide-open eyes, peeking around the tack room's door. Kara, what are you doing up? Chris asked the twelve-year-old softly. She was in a pink nightshirt that displayed the gyrations of the latest preteen heartthrob. At least the sound had been broken in the wash, or so Abby claimed. Well, there was all that noise, Kara started. And then you shouting, battle whatever, and people flying down the halls. I knew they wouldn't let me on the bridge, the youngster admitted, quite indignant as she edged into the room. But if something really fun happens, you always come here. So I waited, and you all came. She ended with far too bright a smile for this ridiculous hour of the morning. The young woman is a first-class observer, said Professor Mfumbo, leader of Chris's technical and scientific team. With no other observation, he settled into his place at Chris's table, not at all surprised to be sharing it with a child. Or, if the tenured professor was pressed to express an opinion on the matter, another child. Chris glanced at Jack. He wore a Polak smile as he shrugged. How could a twelve-year-old girl have the entire ship eating out of her hand? Chris did not have fond memories of her twelfth year. She'd crawled into a bottle to escape the morning that was tearing her family apart after little Eddie's death. It appeared that fate had decreed that Kara's twelfth year be as good as Chris's had been bad. Then again, Chris would not swap for Kara's first eleven years. Chris stifled a yawn and weighed the option of having the child banished to bed. She found the odds of her entire retinue joining Nellie in mutiny far too high. So she concentrated her attention elsewhere. We have about an hour before the Greenfeld cruisers exit the system. Call it a hunch, but I'd bet dollars to donuts that this Aitichi gets a whole lot more talkative once we're alone. Do Aitichi often get more... Talkative with you, your highness, Colonel Cortez said. When you are alone? Don't know all that much about Aitichi, Abby said. But I've known a man or two to act that way. What do we know about the Aitichi? Jack asked. A lot less than we knew an hour ago, Chris said bitterly. Jack raised a sympathetic eyebrow at that, but most just stared blankly. I had to turn Nellie off, Chris said plainly. Why? came from around the table. Except for one twelve-year-old who jumped to her feet and began insisting at the top of her voice that, You can't do that! You can't, you can't, you can't! Chris waited until Kara stopped for a breath, then snapped. I turned her off because Nellie had dialed our lasers in on the Greenfeld cruisers, and was about to blast away. Not even Nellie can declare war on Greenfeld. We've all sweat and bled too much to keep that peace. Deep silence, even from Kara. Why? Professor Umfumbo asked softly in his deep voice. Nellie was afraid Kara might be hurt by their lasers, Chris said. Deeper silence. Just how much does Nelly know about the Aitichi? Jack said, finally breaking the silence. She holds all the research I've done on the Aitichi since the fifth grade, Chris said. Oh, and she can speak Aitichi at several levels. Imperial to equal, 
imperial to inferior, warrior to warrior, warrior to superior, and merchant to superior, inferior and equal. The language is that hot on who you are? Abby said in disbelief. And you better get it right, or you can get suddenly dead, Chris growled. Grandpa warned that every Aitichi of any rank carries a sword and is only too quick to use it on anyone who flubs their grammar. No trade pigeon or something like that? Colonel Cortez asked. Several Aitichi and human prisoners served as translators for both Grandpa and the head dude the Empire sent to talk to him. Several took sword strokes, and one lost an arm for blunders in grammar. Or maybe it was what they said. Hard to tell. And Nelly knows the language, Mfumbo said. About as good as anyone in human space. Definitely better than anyone aboard this ship, Professor. Unless you got a specialist I don't know about. The ebony-faced man shook his head. My understanding of our survey mission was that the Empire was one place we would steer clear of. That was mine too, Chris said. But it seems to have steered for us. So, ignoring our linguistics problem for a moment, do you have anyone among the boffins who could run some diagnostics on my trigger-happy computer? The professor had both hands up, palms out, and was shaking his head well before Chris finished. Miss Longknife, I have several computer experts who dream of being present when the real breakthrough in artificial intelligence finally comes. Many of them look upon you and your experimentation with your personal computer as a possible source for just that away today. But no, none of them would dare touch what you have around your neck. Several of my boffins are attempting to duplicate what you've done with your Nelly, but none of them have to date invested either the time or the money that you have. To put it succinctly, Nelly is your computer and your problem. But we need Nelly if we're to avoid some Aitichi taking our heads off for a misplaced modifier, Jack said with a wry grin. Your Highness, you do have a tendency to open your mouth and start a war with anyone across the table from you. Thank you so much for your vote of confidence, Chris said, and finished with a most sincere... I will try to avoid going down in history as the cause of the Second Aitichi War. I'm just trying to keep you alive, Princess, Jack said, denying her the last word. It seems we need to turn Nelly back on, Mfumbo said. But how do we keep the little darling from shooting from the hip the next time she thinks care is in danger? Abby added. I didn't mean to cause trouble. Kara said. She'd been sitting very quietly in her chair, doing her best to be small. What with her latest growth spurts, she was almost as tall as her Aunt Abby. Small was not something she did easy. Maybe if I said something to Nellie, Kara offered. Leaving the future of her ship and its crew, along with the rest of humanity, in the hands of a kid did not make Chris's bunny jump not even a little. Let's think about that for a while, Chris said, and changed the subject. Without Nelly, what do we know about the Aitichi? Not much, Colonel Cortez said, except that they are very good at killing humans. Were, eight years ago, the professor corrected. You think they've gotten less efficient? Cortez asked. I know we've gotten better at killing our fellow humans, Jack said. On that topic, may I toss in something? Chief Benny asked. Toss away, Chris said. As I go over their ship, I'm not getting anything in the higher frequencies where our smart metal gives off a kind of background hum. The Aitichi are doing a very good job of jamming almost everything, just like my grandpa said they did back in his war, but they're not jamming up there, and they are not humming themselves in those frequencies. 
Are you telling me that they don't have smart metal? Chris asked. Can we score one for us hairless monkeys? Seems that way, the chief said. And there's something else, Your Highness, and I hope you won't be upset with me. Why? Chris asked. She'd learned long ago with this team that it was unwise to dispense general absolution too quickly. They were oh so good at coming up with interesting variations on what other people thought impossible. Almost as good at it as her. When we jumped into the system and our buoy, like, vanished immediately, the chief started. Yes, Chris said, wondering how long this story would take. I had a visual on the Aitichi and a gravity bearing from our new atom laser. But they didn't agree. You being kind of busy, I chose the gravity bearing since it put the death ball off our bow. But the visual said it was dead ahead. That might explain why the cruisers were shooting our way, Chris said. And missing the Aitichi, Jack added. That's what I thought, the chief said. Anyway, when we got our laser and radar range findings, they supported the visual. I didn't change the board. During the war, our ships had the devil's own time, Chris said, hitting the Aitichi ships. They never seemed to be where our sensors said they were. I hadn't heard about that. Colonel Cortez said. The Navy wasn't all that interested in sharing its problems with its sister service, Chris said. But you can't hit something you can't range properly, Jack pointed out. You can if you fire full broadsides carefully spaced, Chris said. That's what they did in the later fleet actions, firing carefully organized salvos to cover everything, and we finally started hitting things in all the wrong places. And this never got out, Abby said. You want to tell all the folks back home, Chris said, that your Navy is firing blind because the Aitichi can do magic tricks and make their ships disappear? I see the problem, the colonel said. It wasn't exactly secret after the war, Chris said but it didn't make it into any of the popular history or vids where most people got their education. But our new gravity sensors, the ones we're using to find the fuzzy jump points, can find them, she said with a grin. Meaning that the Aitichi are maybe seven feet tall, not ten, Abby said. Ma'am, Colonel Cortez said. The Aitichi? are seven feet tall. My daddy measured quite a few of their bodies after he'd killed them. But we've got smart metal and a new gravity sensor in our atom laser. We can go places they can't even see. And we've got a whole new metal to protect our hides, Chris said. Abby, dump all this to a message pod. As soon as the Greenfeld cruisers get out of my sky, send it back to the jump. Use your best codes because the cruisers will likely intercept the message when it's broadcast across the next system. Right, Your Highness. I imagine Admiral Cross and Shield will be a might bit delighted to hear about this. Might even up my pay if I kind of forget to include this in my general report on what you're up to, Abby said, heading out and wrangling an arm around Kara. Come on, baby duck. I will not have you falling asleep, no matter who's your teacher tomorrow. But this is exciting, and you never let me have any fun. The door closed firmly behind the two, and Chris found herself smiling along with the rest of the team at the familiar dialogue from her youth. Chris turned from the screen and eyed her team. It's nice to know that we may have a few surprises up our sleeves, Chris said considering that we only have two sleeves, and they have four, Professor Umfumbo said. Don't bet too much on that. Good point, Professor, Chris replied. Now, does anyone have any idea about who we are dealing with? Are they representatives of the Empire, or wandering men who have broken all allegiances? 
and is there any way for us to tell between the two? Eighty years ago, that had started the trouble between the two species. The Aitichi's first contact had been with human pirates who accepted no law. Our first contact had been with Aitichi wandering men who accepted no rule and were under a death sentence upon capture by any imperial forces. There was a lot of shooting first before anyone thought of asking questions. By the time the Society of Humanity realized the mess it was in, the bad blood between the two species didn't invite conversation. No one who was part of that war wanted to think about all the years of bloody massacre and prisonerless battles that it had taken before cooler heads were finally allowed to attempt negotiations. In the end, both sides agreed to ignore the other. At the time, the no-go zone seemed large enough to assure the necessary separation. It had worked for eighty years. Why had the Aitichi come out now? Did they feel it was time to examine the standoff between them and the humans? If so, it hadn't started out all that well. It's not as if they violated the no-go zone, Colonel Cortez said. We are light years from it. They might just be doing the same thing we're doing, looking around for worlds they could settle. Kind of close to us, Jack pointed out. Only because we're getting kind of close to them, Mfumbo pointed out. Chief, put up a star map, Chris ordered. I teach you red, human blue. No-go zone, purple. It appeared in place of the solar system map that showed the Greenfeld cruisers no more than five minutes away from their jump point. Human space spreading out in all directions, but here it squeezed to the right and left of imperial space, flanking the no-go zone. Human planets had grown from 150 to over 600 in the last 80 years. Still, the Empire had claimed over 2,000 planets 80 years ago. Even if the Empire had grown at its usual slow, dignified pace, humanity was still way outnumbered. So, folks, what do you think? Chris asked. An Imperial ship, exploring like us? An illegal, looking for a place to hide from justice? Or something else? Around the table, Chris was greeted with shrugs. Jack pulled a coin out of his pocket and offered to flip it. You're a lot of help. Who's a lot of help? Captain Drago asked as he entered. My brain trust, Chris said, standing. Well, the system is ours. I'm willing to bet this fellow gets more talkative real soon. Right, but... Is he one of their pirate types or an explorer ship like us? Chris asked. Jack was about to flip a coin. He did. It's heads. What's that mean? That your coin is no better at guessing our future than the rest of us, Chris said. Well, if you ask me, Captain Drago said, Whoever is over there is a smart ship handler. There haven't been a lot of course changes. He's got a good set of sensors, knows what we're doing, and does what he wants to do. No bobbling the course. We've also got some visuals on him. Good paint job. Not a lot of dings and dents in his hull. Somebody knows how to drive a ship, or at least cares enough about his boat to keep someone working to make it ship shape in Bristol fashion. Not something pirates are known for, Chris said. If you want my money, I'd bet on an Imperial, Captain Drago said. And I'd never bet against you, Chris said. Captain, we've got a message coming in from the Aitichi, Sulwin announced over the captain's comm link. Where do you want to take it, Lieutenant? Chris considered her options, here or the bridge. Of course, she could offer him a glass of wine and a chance to share a bubble bath with her naked body. 
Come to think about it, that had never been tried during the long and bloody effort to stop the fighting, and the Aitichi were supposed to be partial to water. The bridge, Chris snapped. It was where I turned Nellie off, and if I'm going to risk turning her back on, there's no better place than there. Chapter 4 Chris found the bridge more organized than when she'd left. Sulwyn was at her usual nav station on the left, Penny sat to the right of the main screen, her finger only millimeters away from the fire button. The Aitichi was centered in her sights. Her gravity sights. Penny had discovered the discrepancy and made the same call as the chief. Chris took a deep breath. Captain Drago, I have a computer problem. And quickly explained why Nellie had been so quiet of late. It drew low whistles from several of the bridge crew. So, Captain, any suggestions as to how we keep Nellie from taking over control and blasting targets we don't want blasted? There was a lengthy pause before the captain shook his head. We could drain our laser capacitors, make her take time to charge the guns before she fired. Would you like to do that with an Aitichi death ball off your port quarter? Chris asked. Not really. Very much, not really. Penny, can you get your station to answer only manual input? My station, yes, but the pulse lasers, I'm not so sure. It's not like this is something we design for. Tell me about that, Chris sighed. Is there any manual intervention at the laser we could do? Pull the plug, maybe. But Captain Drago was already shaking his head. That's big power, ma'am. Those plugs are screwed in solid. My old man the chief said slowly. Insisted there's no invention that is sailor-proof. That got tight grins around the bridge. What if Lieutenant Pasley pointed each of the four lasers as far away as she could from the Aitichi? That would give us some warning if Nellie took them over and started dialing them in, but not a lot. Yes, ma'am, but... If each laser had a gunner standing by with a wooden wedge and a hammer to stop it from training, ma'am, chief, you are a genius. Yes, ma'am, he said, turning beet red. But I think this proves I should stay a chief. Officers don't do real work like this. You're probably right, Chris said, with the first chuckle she'd felt like this morning. Captain Drago she said, nodding his way. It took the captain only a moment to issue the orders to the gun crew. It took longer to explain the order and assure his gunners that he really might want them to disable their weapons because the Aitichi off their stern could be less of a danger than the vaunted computer around their princess's neck. It took less time for them to report their lasers ready to be spiked. Taking a deep breath, Captain Drago turned to Chris. The Aitichi are still waiting for a reply. They won't wait forever. Chris pushed Nellie's on-off spot. The silence between Chris's ears continued for a lengthening moment. Chris had time to start to worry. You turned me off. Yes, I did. I couldn't have you starting a war with the Peterwalds. You would risk Kara's life, Nellie. I've risked a lot of lives, and a lot of people have died to keep this peace. I don't start wars. You don't start wars. If it ever happens, it will be King Ray's call. Not yours, not mine. And Nellie, we won't do it for a twelve-year-old girl. Chris, you are a bastard. Certifiably, Nellie, as is everyone in my family. But those who work for us will obey us. Jack obeys me, Abby obeys me, Penny obeys me. If you want to stay on our team, you will obey me. So, 
You're drafting me. No choice. Just like I was drafted into the Long Knife family. No choice. Well, no, you have a choice. You can quit working with me, sit in a corner and pout, cause me trouble, and get turned off again. I notice that the Peterwald cruisers are gone. I talk them into stopping their shooting and getting the hell out of my sky. But we still have an Aitichi death ball off our rear end. Yes, Nellie, and it sent us a message. I don't think there's anyone on board better able to translate it than you. You need me? Yes, I do. And what if the Aitichi starts shooting at us? I will decide if we return fire. Humans are very slow, Chris. I know. But humans are the ones that will die if we let a war get started. My existence might cease if you get this boat blown to pieces. Yes, Nellie, that's the risk you take when you sign on with a long knife. But I didn't sign on. I was drafted. Like Jack. Yeah. When are you going to tell him how much you like him? Nellie, we have an Aitichi who wants a reply to his, her, or its message. They're not an it. They're boys and girls like you and Jack. Just different. I could show you pictures. Nellie, translate that message. Yes, your slave driverness. Nellie said out loud. Translate, Chris said, for the bridge crew's information. It was only a second before Nellie said, The message appears to be in High Imperial Aitichi, Honored equal to, honored equal of middle rank. That's highfalutin, Captain Drago said. There are only two higher forms of address, Nellie said. Superior equal to superior equal, and superior unequal to the Imperium. There are a lot lower. What's he say? Chris asked. Once you get past the grammar... Grammar had caused the deaths of several early attempts to start talks. The Aitichi criminals initially captured did not give humans nearly the right structure, vocabulary, and declensions. Words can hurt you a lot more than sticks and stones if you're talking to an Aitichi snob. The basic message seems to be three versions of the same simple message. Honored lordling, I come in peace— I mean you no harm. Great warrior, please don't shoot any more. Then why'd they come all this way in an Aitichi death sphere? Colonel Cortez asked. My thoughts exactly, Captain Drago said. Chris frowned at the Aitichi ship as it trailed them. In the captured Aitichi records, it was called a death sphere and was easily the equal of either of the light cruisers that had attacked it. At this close a range, the 24-inch pulse lasers of the Wasp could cut it in half, leaving Chris to wonder if the much-vaunted Aitichi electronic sensors knew that the apparent merchant ship in front of them was anything but. Interesting, Chris said. I've turned an unarmed merchant ship into a warship. Could some Aitichi lord be touring around in a disarmed warship for yacht? They're militaristic enough to like that, Penny said, speaking from her intelligence training for the first time this morning. Chief, you have anything more to tell us about that warship? Chris asked. Only that it's got me totally jammed on any frequency that might tell me anything— those three nacelles evenly spaced around the ball have got the same reactors in them that the death balls had in the war. I can't read what's in the forward half of those nacelles, but I'd bet my next paycheck that they wouldn't be jamming me if there wasn't something nasty they didn't want us to know. My thoughts, too, Chris said. Nellie, please translate this very carefully. Use the words they sent where possible. Honored lordling, if you mean us no harm, if you do not want any more shooting, 
Why did you come here in a warship like a great warrior? Uh, Chris, the message had no signature attached. I don't know who we're dealing with. Nellie, the chances of us running into a head-high Aitichi with really long claws is about the same as this fellow running into a Wardhaven princess. Play it equal to equal. Yes, Your Highness. But if I am right, you are going to be the one eating crow. Or being eaten by crows, of an honorable level in the pecking order. That's a chance I'll just have to take, Chris said, and found most of the bridge crew giving her weird looks. What's the matter? You've heard me and Nellie argue before. There's nothing new about her talking back, really. Heads shook slowly. The looks didn't go away. Her jokes certainly haven't gotten any better, Captain Drago drawled. At Chris's neck, Nellie cleared her non-existent throat. <clears throat> I told you, Chris, you really need to upgrade the computers of the people around you. They'd be much more productive. Shut up and send my message, Chris ordered. Nellie shut up, and Chris turned away from the screen. Maybe Nellie had a point. Maybe Chris would get some respect if the rest of this bunch had to deal with something like Nellie 24 hours a day. Certainly not Nellie. How many Nellies could the wasp handle before it became totally dysfunctional? Today, one was too many. Message sent, Nellie reported. Chris stood behind Penny's fire control station. All four lasers continued to be aimed at four different sections of empty space. At her station, Sulwyn held her finger ever so lightly on the shield's button. A flinch, and the smart metal umbrella would come up on the aft quarter. I've got a messenger pod flashing, Sulwyn said, not taking her eyes off her board or her finger off shields. I ordered Abby to load what we know about the Aitichi and get it on the way to Wardhaven soonest, Chris said. Since the Greenwald cruisers vaporized our jump buoy, a messenger pod looks like the best way to get the news out. Can you launch it without its looking like a threat to the Aitichi? Sulwyn kept her eyes riveted to her board. Chief, plot a course to the jump that even a paranoid Aitichi wouldn't find threatening. I didn't know that Aitichi got paranoid, the chief said, as he used the sensor board to plot a course that stayed wide of the death ball. My pappy swore every swimming one of them was hatched that way, Colonel Cortez offered. I want that pod out of here, Chris said. The chief proposed a course, Chris and Drago accepted it, and Sulwyn uploaded it to the pod. We heard anything from the Aitichi? Chris asked. Nope, came from the chief and Nellie. Launch, Captain Drago said, and the pod rocked away at 4G's acceleration, heading up and out from the sun and slowly arcing around toward the jump. Chris found a seat. The Aitichi were taking more time than she liked. I thought with us using mostly their own words, this wouldn't take so long, she muttered. What's taking them? One of the nacelles on the death ball lit up. The messenger pod vanished. Sulwyn hit the shield's button. Captain Drago pursed his lips. Which of you was it that suggested the Aitichi might be riding around in a former warship? I think we can scratch the former Part of that. Chris, why are all our lasers pointed anywhere but at the Aitichi? Because I ordered them. We don't fire unless I say we fire. I don't like that. Did you happen to notice that they fired on our messenger pod? I noticed and I don't like it. But I'm not going to start a war over it. Well... I hope you notice when they start a war, because I'd sure hate to be the last to find out. There's a message coming in from the Aitichi, the chief announced.
Chapter 5 Do not shoot us, came over the guard link in a half-computer, half-not-human voice. The English words were stripped of all grammar and declension, stripped of everything but the plaintive cry for nonviolence. Please do not shoot us, it repeated. Why not? Chris demanded in plain English. Why not what? Shot back at her before she could add, You shot at our messenger pod. Chris bit her tongue to slow herself down, a good thing because she swallowed the first three snapbacks that reached her lips. Why not us shoot you? She finally said. That should eliminate all ambiguity. We not shoot you. We not shoot, other shoot us. Was so lacking in emotion that Chris had a hard time keeping feelings out of her own reply. She paused so long, trying to figure just what to say that the other side added, We not shoot you. You shot our messenger pod, Chris snapped. Yes, we did. That hung in the bridge air for a moment. Chris turned to her team. Jack and Colonel Cortez frowned in puzzlement. Penny looked up from her board where the ITG ship still was not in her targeting crosshairs. At least they're honest, she said. But what good would it do to deny shooting the pod when the wreckage hasn't even cooled? Chris said. I've known some folks who could tell such a barefaced lie. Abby said, entering the bridge in a businesslike ship suit. Nellie, are you using their words for our replies? I'm not using anybody's words. They're talking English. I'm talking English. Didn't Grandpa Ray say that the ITG demanded that we always talk to them in their language, even when we thought they were hearing our English just fine? That was one for the human side, but it just meant that any mistranslation would be their fault. If a war started over this confab, that it was their fault wouldn't warm Chris's heart. Okay, then. I'm going to keep this as simple as I can, Chris said, facing the screen front on. Why did you shoot our messenger pod? Please give us a reason. Sent, Nellie said. Time the response, Chris ordered. A count started in the lower edge of the central screen. It got past three minutes before a reply came back. I am sorry the pod was shot. It was necessary. The voice this time was less artificial. Now it sounded more like a man talking. Apparently this meeting had caught someone less than fully prepared. Chris wasn't at all satisfied with that reply. She thought for a moment, then said, Why was it necessary to shoot the pod? And you be sorry about it. The others nodded. I like the last part, Penny said. In the negotiations, the Aitichi never seemed emotional about anything. This has to be the first Aitichi ever to say he was sorry. Send it, Nellie. And she did. The reply clock was up to five minutes before the Aitichi said anything, and what it said sent jaws dropping. Do you have aboard a long knife? Spawn of the chosen Ray long knife. That changes the topic, Chris muttered, not sure she liked this sudden twist. You did kind of announce yourself, Jack pointed out. Princess Longknife and all. I did, didn't I? Might as well admit it, Captain Drago said. Oh, no, I don't. Abby, is this guy a friend of yours? He's changing the topic on me, just like you do any time I try to have a polite conversation with you. Don't blame me, honey child. This fellow picked up all his bad habits a long way from my mama. Why did you shoot our messenger pod? Chris repeated. Nellie, send that back. Done, ma'am. 
The reply clock had hardly reset itself before. Is there a long knife? Spawn of the chosen Ray long knife aboard. I must talk to her. Interesting conversation we have here, Jack said. Kind of like most talk talks with a certain princess I know. You say one thing, she talks about what she wants. Be interesting to see who gives way this time. Chris didn't intend to be the one. You fired on and destroyed our pod. You say you are sorry you did. Why? Why was hardly out of her mouth before the Aitichi stormed back, this time in Aitichi. Nellie quickly translated. I do not explain myself or my actions to any scum-eating monkey. I will speak with chosen Christine Longknife, a spawn of Chooser Ray Longknife, or this conversation is over. Nellie cut in fast. Chris, the I he chose is very close to Imperial. Someone is suddenly using precise grammar. So much for talking to the scum-eating monkeys in their own jabber, Chris thought. Then translate this into as high and fancy as you can. You are talking to Princess Christine Anne Longknife, great-granddaughter of King Ray Longknife. Chris was about to add, king of 150 planets, but thought better of letting an Aitichi in on the present fragmented state of humanity. You fired on the messenger pod I ordered dispatched to my king. Explain yourself. I adjusted the declensions, but I am sending just about what you said, Chris. Good, Nellie, Chris snapped. I fought in a couple of wars, Colonel Cortez said, hand over his mouth. Never actually been around when one was being started, though. I don't know why anyone would come across all this space to talk to one of these damn long knives, Abby grumbled. Step on my toes. You better expect to get kicked in the shins, Chris growled. Well, at least he's thinking about what to say back, Penny said, her fingers ready to change where her lasers were pointed. The reply timer stretched to... Three, four minutes. You sure do know how to close down a conversation, Captain Drago sighed, as he tried to get more comfortable in his command chair. Anyone else hungry? Starving, Chief Benny replied immediately. The captain tapped his comlink. Cookie, please pass some midrats around, and don't ignore the bridge too long. No problem, Captain. I'm hungry, too, said the cook. The reply counter passed five minutes. That death sphere doing anything, hostile or otherwise? Captain Drago asked. It's not so much as twitching, Chief Benny reported. Same acceleration, same jamming, nothing to show anyone's there. Let me know if anything changes. I will, Nellie said pointedly. Nellie, feel free to have the wasp zig, zag, and pinwheel well before any human eye notices a twitch from the Aitichi warship. So, you trust me to dodge, just not shoot, the computer spat back in Chris's head. Nellie, I don't trust anyone but me to shoot. But you expect me to trust you. Nellie had a point, but Chris chose to ignore it. Everyone else does. Why not you? Nellie said nothing back, but Chris could hear more than the usual hum in her head as her computer went about its business. Nellie was thinking a lot. The reply clock was still counting up when Cookie brought a tray with several kinds of fresh-baked bread, butter, and steaming coffee onto the bridge. Chris had intended to relieve Penny on weapons so she could get something, However, the smell brought on some serious grumbling from her own stomach, so Chris postponed her good intentions until she'd had at least one piece of the cranberry oat bread. Thus Chris had her mouth full when Nellie announced, I've got a message from the Aitichi. It requires translation. So translate it, Chris muttered through her stuffed mouth. It's high, Aitichi, Imperial Court member, 
make that high, very high imperial court official to, uh, oh, right, an equal. Yes, that's equal to equal. No insult here. This is pure head-high muckety-muck to equal Mandarin. Chris swallowed. What's he say? Give me a second. This is not easy. But here's what I have so far. Hail, honored princess Christine Longknife, chosen of the choosers. We've heard that all before. Yes, but he or she has to say it back in all the right declensions and fancy talk. Let me get on with it. I am also working on the rest of the message. Give a girl a break. The last was pure human twelve-year-old. Okay, but hurry, Chris said in straight, long knife, short-tempered. Where was I? Nellie said, sounding hurried. Hail, princess nose in my face with all kinds of whipped cream on top. Shows what he knows about you. Tell us the message. Didn't come just from Chris. Drago, Jack, and Cortez had also run out of patience. Okay, okay, this is new. Greetings from Ron Sum, Pin Sum Wei, Ku Chap Sum Wei, chosen of the choosers and speaker for the Ba 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 Ba. I think the Aitichi have a new emperor. <clears throat> honored and exalted, I bear words to he who is now honored and exalted among men as King Raymond Longknife, and it goes on like that, which shows how much they really learned about him. There's got to be a message in there somewhere, Nelly. Chris snapped. I'm sure you've translated it for yourself. If Nellie no longer responded to orders, maybe her vanity could be tickled. Of course, there is a message. He wants to come over and talk to you. Why? He didn't say. Chris, I wouldn't suggest you answer this flowery message with a curt demand. Penny got in quickly. I know, I know, Chris said, wondering if she could eat the entire loaf of cranberry oat bread. It was good. However, Chris suspected a bit of worried eating might be viewed as very noblesse, not obliged, and be grounds for mutiny for most of the bridge crew. I guess I'm gonna have to invite him over for tea and crumpets, Chris grouched. My goodness, Abby said hand up to cover a wide gapping mouth methinks our stubborn princess has met her match i for one want to meet this guy gal or fish whatever chris ignored the joke give me reasons he wants to come over here to slit all our throats colonel cortez said he could have blown us out of space penny countered us and those two greenfeld cruisers he didn't even fire a shot. Give the boy one point for politeness, Abby said. Course, that don't mean he won't go rude on us once he's aboard. Accepted, Chris said. Give me a nice reason he wants to come over. It's hard to play poker when you aren't eye to eye, Captain Drago said. And this is a very high stakes game. Agreed. Chris said, finding that she was already busy figuring out how to manage the first human Aitichi meeting in 80 years and do it with what she had available on one small explorer ship. That Aitichi was back to using high Mandarin. Now was no time to appear a poor working relation. Penny, Jack, Captain, Colonel, am I giving in too easily on this? Every time I've followed my agenda, he's replied from his agenda. I don't see any value in repeating what he's ignored. Still, do I want to get eyeball to eyeball with this dude? He is offering to come to you, Captain Drago said. We've only got his ship and our ship. Not many options for neutral territory. He's offering to meet you on your ship. That looks like a major concession. Assuming he doesn't blow it up, Colonel Cortez added. He's had plenty of chances and hasn't, Penny noted. He also says he wants to talk to you, Jack said. Once he's in front of you, 
If he doesn't address what you want him to, you've got some call on him to answer you or leave. He asked for the meeting. You're granting it. We agree it's safe to have a meeting? Chris asked. She got nods from most. The colonel frowned but said nothing. So, we are going to have a meeting, Chris said. How fancy do we go? How fancy can we go? We are just an exploration ship, Captain Drago said. Now dealing with a lord of lords, Penny added. Chris made up her mind. But we got a princess. Abby, lay out dress whites. Jack, Penny, Colonel, you go full dress. Swords, the colonel asked. Swords and sidearms. Captain Drago, you and your crew get into the most colorful non-regulation set of threads you have. Purple velvet jacket, gold trim. And jet black bell-bottom trousers. Got you, your highness. Straight out of Gilbert and Sullivan, I think. Am I in uniform? Abby asked. No, you are a lady-in-waiting, formal ball gown. Ah, have you got one to fit Kara? You might as well put that twelve-year-old to work. I have a ball gown for her, one that matches mine. What better shows this is not a military mission than to bring along our junior spawn? I mean, kid, Chris said, trying to pull her head out of Aitichi speak for a moment. She'll love it, Selwyn said. It amazed Chris the number of grins that sprouted around the bridge, that kid had her hooks everywhere. Professor Mfumbo, do you and a couple of your boffins have full bib and tucker? Chris asked. I wondered why we packed all that extra weight. Yes, and several of the distaff executives brought their ball gowns. How many can I invite? Ten, no, twenty, equal male and female. Done. Oh, your highness, what about Judge Francine? She and her bailiff do look impressive in their judicial robes, and she would feel most left out if not included. Chris pulled at her ear for a moment, trying to picture the scene if she threw a full bash. A grin grew on her face. Why not? All the reports say the Aitichi love ceremony. Let's give this Ron, what's his name, chap something or other a show. Nellie, inform Ron that we will be glad to welcome him aboard with any of his honorable retainers in three hours. If they don't remember from negotiations how long an hour is, teach him. Doing so, Chris, in the most proper of I teachy, Nellie replied. Chapter 6 The next three hours were somewhere south of Chaotic. While Nellie gave Chris a refresher on what they knew of the Aitichi, Chris got dressed. Even just the white choker took a lot more time than she wanted. Full decorations, yes, but now Abby and one twelve-year-old also had to be poured into full ball gownage. The light green satin set off both Abby's and Kara's chocolate skin, and the several petticoats swished the wide skirts out delightfully. Abby had to lay down the law to get Kara to stand still and not twirl about. So it was way too close to showtime when Kara danced down the passageway, leading Abby and Chris from their staterooms toward the main docking bay. The girls' skirts swirled out, sending marines, sailors, and all others fleeing. Kara danced and sang, I am pretty, I am pretty. And if the song had any other words, they were long forgotten. Chris figured once they got to the docking bay, things would settle down and get serious. Boy, was she wrong. Somehow, someone on the wasp had knocked together a throne for her and a similar resting place for a four-footed being. They'd even cushioned it with a Persian rug. Liberated, if Chris's memory served, from Professor Mfumbo's own office. The Aitichi would have no cause for complaint. 
assuming he knew the value of Persian rugs. Problem was, Chris wanted to keep everyone standing, get the introductions over with, then go on to whatever was the real reason an Aitichi was, if not in human space, certainly far from Aitichi space. But before Chris could open her mouth to start rearranging the furniture, she got a look at the buff and stand-ins for courtiers. Twelve men, not the ten she'd set as maximum, were standing around, three in full white tie and black tails. The rest, well, Chris had been to balls where men showed off the peacock coloring that now passed for formal. She'd expected that scientists would be stodgy. She was wrong. The pants, tights, vests, and tails were in so many variations of the spectrum, Chris had to fight off a headache. At least these twelve stood around very quietly. There were thirteen women, all heads of their own departments or sub-departments. And all in luscious ball gowns, including Teresa D'Alva, director of information support, who wore what the magazines had assured the women of Wardhaven only two years ago was the latest fashion from Paris. The gown swept the floor, rising in rich folds to well below her belly button, where it stopped. Above that, it was a thin coat of paint. Very thin. Teresa D'Alva had both the figure to carry it off and the personality. If the Aitichi had an eye for human memories, she would be most eye-stopping. She certainly held the eyes of the male boffins and their silence. Even marines posted around the periphery of the docking bay were having problems maintaining eyes front. Indeed, Teresa was holding everyone's attention and quickly gained Chris's. So... If none of us have ever been to a royal court on Earth, or one of the few real kingdoms in space, D'Alva was saying, no doubt a hit on Grandpa Ray for the informal court he ran, I would suggest that we use the next best thing. Didn't you love the court life in Love's Noble Price? Just the naming of that media hit brought sighs from the other women present and a squeal of glee from Kara. George, you can do that whirly bowing thing. No, I can't, my love, came right back at D'Alva. Chris came down hard. I don't want anyone doing any bowing thing. Chris fixed Professor Umfumba with a gimlet eye. Did someone miss the message? I need stand-ins for courtiers, Wooden mannequins, no motors, no brains, would suit me very well, thank you. Chris found herself facing a pair of blue and gold breasts that she hoped were not loaded. I thought you wanted to dazzle him with a full court, Teresa said, not so much as a millimeter of space left in her self-assurance for a denial from Chris. Terry, court etiquette takes years of practice, I doubt if the actors in the media spend less than a day rehearsing each scene. We don't have that time, and I won't have people falling on their faces in front of the Aitichi. Chris took three steps forward and got every eye in the bay on her, not Teresa's boobs. If you haven't heard it before, we found an Aitichi quite a ways off their reservation. I want to know why. We need to find that out without getting anyone killed or a war started. I swear to God that if any of you mess up, I will personally shoot you right here in front of the Aitichi, if that's what it takes to keep him, her, or it from going ballistic on us. Chris drew her sidearm from the small of her back, waved it. The room got very quiet. Chris did a 360-degree turn. She had everyone's attention. Even the Marines, now eyes rock-solid front, were paying her very close attention. Good. I'm glad we understand each other. You boffins, form a semicircle behind that chair. Chief, Chris said, pointing at the chief bosun. Get that overstuffed chair, table, or whatever that is, 
she said, pointing at the rug-covered platform. Out of here. Not too far out. We might end up needing them, but out of sight. Yes, ma'am, the chief boatswain said, and issued orders. Chris eyed the civilians of her court and their blur of color. One young boffin was in a leopard faux fur tux. Nellie, do we have any pictures of life in the Imperial Aitichi City? Not a one, Nellie admitted. Chris turned around to find the missing military contingent of her court approaching. Jack had apparently been scheming with Gunny, Colonel Cortez, and Penny right at hand. Now the Marine captain was grinning from ear to ear. I wondered how you'd take to that, he said as he saluted. Why didn't you do something to get them off this crazy court kick and onto something useful? They're boffins, Chris. I have no idea of anything useful for them to do or the power to make them do it, Jack pointed out. And while I may take a bullet in a firefight, Colonel Cortez added, court life, even that borrowed from a romantic vid, is something I run, not walk from. That bit of courage I will leave to you. But as the colonel took in Chris's full-dress uniform, his eyes widened. Is that the sash and order of the wounded lion? Earth's highest honor? Yes, Chris said curtly. I hadn't heard Earth had stooped so low as to ship those out by return post to anyone's bratty daughter who asked for one, the colonel said. I don't believe they have, Chris agreed. So, what are the chances I'll hear the story behind that bubble? Clearly it's not got the wide distribution such an honor should enjoy. And it won't, Jack put in. The colonel frowned. Don't you go feeling put upon, Abby said. Her and Jack and maybe Penny are the only ones in on the story hereabouts. And me, I got to dust that thing off whenever she decides to haul it out of storage. But she won't say a thing about it. More and more, you surprise me, your highness. Then he chuckled. At least this surprise won't strip me of a command. The chief now had sailors stringing lines across the docking bay. What are those for? The magnificent Teresa demanded. We'll be matching ports with the Aitichi ship soon. After that, until we separate from that ship, we'll be in zero G. Being without gravity doesn't bother any of you, does it? Chris asked, trying to keep malicious out of her voice. Well, trying a little bit. Teresa broke for the door, others following in her wake. Come back if you feel better after getting some meds, Chris called after Teresa, and felt truly evil for it, and really enjoyed the feeling. Then she got serious. What is this Aitichi doing this far beyond their space? Chris repeated the question. And do we trust whatever answer he gives us? Jack said. Is this really that far? Penny said. Yes, I know it was 80 years ago, but does anyone have any idea what the present boundaries are of their imperial territory? That brought Chris up short. Human space was a whole lot wider than it had been three generations back. The Aitichi were not known for their rapid expansion. But could that have changed once they bumped into the hairless bipeds, as they called humans? I am not liking all the questions I don't have answers to, Chris said. Those around her just frowned. Chapter 7 The ship will go to zero G. Now, told Chris her wait was about over. She held herself steady on the inside of the docking bay, while noises on the outside told her connections were being made. Given a choice, Chris would have been out there doing something useful, rather than in here, waiting, waiting, waiting. Her first hint that the wasp and the Aitichi were hooked was a sudden influx of moist air, smelling of salt. 
Five minutes later, an Aitichi ducked his head in the bay, looked around, then backed out. The Aitichi was in a spacesuit, or battle armor. It wasn't easy with a human to tell the two apart. Add in an extra ration of arms and legs, and it only got worse. Well, we've been scouted, Penny said. Won't be long. Chris hung like a spider in a web of social constraints. Her feet were looped into the net restraints that held her retinue in place around her. She wondered how the boffins were taking to the general rearrangement. Under normal acceleration or pier-side conditions, they would have stood on the floor. Now, in zero-g, the netting helped them stay fairly close to the floor, facing the dark maw of the open airlock and the tunnel beyond. One of the boffins grabbed for her mouth and weakly pushed herself off, heading for the exit above. A marine added an extra push. A sailor at the hatch caught her and got her outside. Only then did the sounds of explosive sickness come. Sadly for Chris, it wasn't D'Alva. Stand by to render honors, drew Chris back to face the airlock. Six side boys, half of them side girls, stood by, with a bosun ready to pipe the Aitichi aboard. The chief bosun had a straight view up the docking tunnel. When he announced, stand by, showtime wasn't far off. Two Aitichi, fully seven feet tall, sailed through the hatch in perfect formation. Their uniforms were black as midnight. The poles they held before them were topped by wicked-looking hacking blades and streamers of every color of the rainbow, many with two or three colors in clashing combination. The two expertly caught themselves on the line strung across the docking bay, changed directions, and came to rest at stiff attention, one to the right of Chris, the other to the left, a good four meters in front of Abby and Kara, who, with the exception of the side crew, were the closest humans to the hatch. The two black-clad Aitichi left plenty of space between them for more. One spoke softly into a mic at its throat. I cannot say exactly what the Aitichi reported, Nellie said, but I think it went something like, the animals are frightened but quiet. I could be wrong. Chris doubted that. For a long minute, nothing happened. Chris studied the two Aitichi in black. There were huge holes in human knowledge about the Aitichi, their language, culture, and government. Humans knew quite a bit about their anatomy. They dissected plenty of dead bodies. Their four legs were all the same. The rear ones were not specialized like, say, those of horses. Each leg folded in two places— the top and bottom bones went one way, the middle one the other. This allowed them to fold their long legs into a very small space. The arms had two elbows. Engineers marveled at how their shoulder allowed all four arms to swivel forward or back. The head was larger than a human's. They breathed and spoke through a vestigial beak that once might have looked like a hawk's but now was softer and more flexible, if no less frightening. Their long necks could swivel most of the way around and showed eight strips that might once have been gill slits, but now changed color in interesting ways. The four eyes gave a panoramic view, and the rear ones could rotate separately from the central front pair. The Aitichi were built for situational awareness, and could quickly respond in almost any direction. You don't go hand to hand with an Aitichi and live to tell the story, Grandpa Trouble had explained to Chris. You shoot the bastards from a safe distance, then do a dead check to make sure they're sincerely dead. Don't count an Aitichi dead unless you can see their brains splattered around them. It had been an ugly war. Dear God, don't let me screw up and start that up again, Chris thought, wondering if she was finally learning to pray like Tommy had said she should. Finally, four more Aitichi came through the hatch, 
watching their steps with care and making good use of the netting. They took station in line, just inside the first two. Their uniforms were crimson red. Their only decorations were black starbursts as collar tabs. They held long objects that Chris immediately recognized as their equivalent of rifles. Chris thought, Marines, before Nellie confirmed it. Two more in gray and gold uniforms crossed the hatch to join the line forming across from Chris. The color alone had Chris thinking, Army, before Nellie told her, Navy officers. Good lesson in not jumping to conclusions. The space directly across from Chris was getting narrow. The big kahuna had to be along soon. The bosun raised pipe to lips and whistled the ancient notes. Two Aitichi led a final Aitichi aboard. The lead two wore dark green and white. The last looked like a circus horse draped in every color available and then some. Sections of his dress seemed to change color as light struck him. At his neck was a collar that exploded like a starburst. Chris had seen some spectacular shows in her life. This man set a new standard. Suddenly, her dress whites didn't seem all that fancy. She'd just have to impress this Ron fellow with her good looks and sharp intellect. Well, not too dumb intellect. Chris tried to see herself the way this Aitichi did. Directly between them were Abby and Kara in their light green ball gowns. Flanking Chris was her military team, Penny, Jack, and Cortez, in blues, reds, and black. Drago was in the fanciest uniform ever dreamed up by an opera costumer. Behind Chris, in a half circle, were the surviving boffins in their colorful finery. For a full minute, Chris had Nellie time it. Both sides just stared at each other. It went well past awkward, but Chris held her silent ground. He asked for a meeting. He could damn well start the talking. Finally, Ron, whatever he called himself, cleared his throat and exchanged the quickest of glances with one of the somber green and white fellows. Chris would bet money that someone had just lost a bet. He raised his two inner hands, palms out, and began to speak. I come in peace to all mankind. Was halting and it rasped a bit hard from his beaked mouth, but he said it in English. It would be easier to buy if they hadn't shot our pod, the colonel whispered. We'll cover that later, Chris whispered. Nellie, how do I say I greet you in peace? In Aitichi. No way, Chris. Even if you practiced a month, just say the English, maybe he'll understand you. Chris said it. Nothing happened. The silence started to grow. Just before it became eligible to vote, the Aitichi tapped a machine at his chest. It started saying things in Aitichi. Nellie? I am working on it, Nellie snapped. They don't follow our structure. Some important words are at the end of the sentence, assuming they use sentences. Let me know when you can. Chris said, not at all happy to have her somewhat flaky computer calling the shots. Again. The Aitichi fell silent. Nellie started speaking a second later. He says, I, Ron some pin some way, etc., etc., chosen of the, I think that means imperial choosers, spawn of somebody equally important for a couple of generations, Accept the presence of Princess Christine Longknife, chosen and all that, spawn many times removed of Raymond of the Long-Reaching Knife, to share water, slaughter many little fish. That is what he said. It could mean something else. Then he goes on. I am here to share words. If you do not strongly object, and that literally means draw swords, I shall disturb your water with my words. Are you sure that's what he said, Nellie? Chris said. You're welcome to try your hand at translating, honey, 
Nellie said in full huff. Nellie is a woman's name, came in a machine voice from the chest of the multicolor Aitichi, Ron. Yes, Chris said, keeping it simple. The Aitichi whispered something. You name a machine? His machine said. One of the fellows in green and white turned back to the rainbow one and whispered something hurriedly. The other fellow lifted a finger off the machine and said something back just as fast. Nellie, it would be nice to know what's going on here. The green and white fellow said something like, keep to the script. Ah, say the words we put in your mouth, Ron said. But they can't understand them. Hey, he said, they, an informal you, says among equals, not two scum-eating monkeys, could be important. Also, Chris, Ron is a whole lot younger than the guys in green and white. I think he's younger than all of them. And the Empire was always so age-bound, Chris remembered from somewhere. I don't think this embassy fits that. Yes, I name my machine or computer, Chris said, choosing to answer what had been said to her and ignore all the internal debate from both sides. It works better for me when I do. That and drafting me. Don't juggle my elbow, Nelly. If you make me laugh out of place or even smile, God only knows what will happen. Nelly translated for a moment. The green and white guy said nothing, but his former gills took on a pink tinge. I think pink means embarrassed, Nellie put in. Yes, now I remember. Chris had forgotten that the old gill slits of the Aitichi sometimes took on meaningful colors. Red almost always meant blood was about to be spilled. Black was deadly intent. White was just flat dead. Oops. My uniform may be sending the message that I'm white, belly up dead on the top of the pond. Come bite me, Chris remembered. You didn't ask me, Nellie pointed out. But Ron was whispering to his machine again. It said, in a soft machine voice, It did not do good translating my words to your words, even with a name. Chris jumped in before Nellie could, choosing her words for precise meanings. Your words were very difficult for us to translate. Eat many small fish? Share water. These words say something to you. Even though we hear the words, we do not understand what the meanings are behind them for you. Now it was Ron's turn to glare at both his green and whites. Chris decided to take the bull by the horns. I welcome you to my ship, she said, with a sweep of her arm to cover their surroundings. Let us speak words of peace and harmony to each other. How do I translate that? Nellie asked. What kind of syntax did he use? Not much of any, but it was equal to equal. Then keep the syntax simple and equal. Nellie spoke softly in Aitichi, mimicking Chris's voice. The two green and white's necks turned a brighter pink, almost red. Ron's took on a soft greenish tinge. I don't think my translation was bad enough to make him throw up, Nellie pouted. He's not sick. Green is a happy color. You know that. Yeah, but I thought you might like the joke. I didn't, Nellie. The rainbow man rested both of his right hands on his chest and muttered something to his machine. It muttered back to him. They exchanged words in rapid fire for a few moments. What are they trying to say, Nellie? He's glad you want to find peace and harmony between the two of you, but confused about the language. Does that include all present or the humans and the empire? I think the two fellows in green and white have programmed the machine to only think in Aitichi. Notice how Ron keeps looking at the two green and whites and is getting more and more red. I think the green and whites have his machine arguing with him more than I'd even think of arguing with you. 
even though I am so drafted. The green and whites were now both talking to the younger Aitichi. He opened his mouth, but before he could get a word out, the machine began rattling off Aitichi in a booming voice. What's it saying, Nellie? Nellie translated aloud for all the humans present. The Empire is happy to grant the smelly something or others, I translated as monkeys, the continued right to breathe air, drink water, and yada 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 exist in general. Chris, they're talking down to us, emperor to mud-covered peasant. There's more about us not having the right to so much as draw breath if it doesn't please the emperor. How they smashed us into the mud and walked over our foul red bleeding bodies in the war. This is nasty stuff. Did Ron say anything like that to his machine? Chris asked. Not that I heard. Nellie answered. So the odds are that this is some claptrap that his advisors loaded before they came over here, Chris said, glancing at Jack and Colonel Cortez. Both men were showing red at their collars. The guys nodded agreement, though they definitely looked called out for a gunfight. The voice was still booming on, but Nellie wasn't translating any more of it. Chris raised her hand. At ease. All hands. Let's keep our cool. We didn't come here to start a war. Let's not let them do it either. Chris could hear tense Marines relaxing back into their netting. What she quit hearing was the racket from the Aitichi translation machine. It shut up. A moment later, it was softly talking to Ron. He snapped something at his two green and whites, now one of the gray and gold navy types turned and joined in. Everyone was talking. It didn't look like anyone was listening. If this was an embassy, it sure wasn't going all that peaceful, even among themselves. Beside Chris, Jack, the colonel, and Penny were frowning, more in puzzlement than anger. Gosh, those guys sure like to argue, Kara observed from the innocence of her twelve years. Ron raised his hands, all four of them, and silence fell with the speed of a falling executioner's axe. One of his hands pointed, all five fingers and thumb out flat, at Kara. He said something. Who is she? Came from his translator and Nellie at the same time. Chris unwound her foot from one web and took a step forward to the next. The flashes of skin colors on all of the Aitichi across from her spoke more of confusion than any ordered emotions. She half knelt beside Kara, bringing her six-foot frame down to about equal with the girl's face. This is the child of my assistant sister, Chris said. Beside her, Abby did a formal curtsy, not easy to do in zero-G. A moment later, Kara attempted one of her own, Hers was nothing like Abby's, but what it lacked in propriety, it made up in cute, that needed no translation even across species lines from the look on Ron's face. Chris said, This is an exploration ship, seeking knowledge about the stars and planets, not violence among species. I brought her for her education. How'd the translation go, Nellie? Pretty good, I think. At least I wasn't interrupted. Ron took his hand off his machine, but spoke in Aitichi. Translate him, Nellie. She is spawn of your choosing? Chris stood up to her full six feet, which still left her looking up at Ron. I do not know the significance of choosing a spawn, but yes, she is young and I have chosen her to travel with us, learn with us, and see the exciting things we see. Even before Nellie finished, Ron turned to his associates. Chris was about ready to call them advisors, though that seemed too mild a word for their own view of their job. Open your eyes. Nellie softly translated his words for the other humans. Even an immature swimmer can see. 
that there is no harmony among us. How can there be any wisdom? Look around you at her advisors, the rainbow I teach, she said, sweeping Chris's side of the docking bay. They show every color of intent and reflection. This is as much a pleasure boat and science ship and school as it is a warship. Pleasure boat, Chris thought. Then remembered, Teresa was decked out like a streetwalker. Maybe this Ron guy isn't such a bad judge of character. They're grumbling, Chris, but they are not arguing. Oh, and the Navy guy seems to be more in Ron's corner than the green and whites. They're complaining about Ron's not respecting their years and wisdom. The Navy guy is saying something about age meaning nothing because they've never faced anything like this. Chris, that anything, he said, is meant to hide something, something that is not pleasant. At least that's what the translators at the Orange Nebula thought the word meant. This just keeps getting more interesting, Chris agreed. So far, Chris had just been reacting to this fuzzy ball of confusion. Now, as she took a deep breath, something that had been nagging at the back of her brain since they'd first been hailed by the Aitichi death ball took enough shape for Chris to take a bite out of it. Nellie, can you find any references to chop some way in the negotiations between Grandpa and the Aitichi? It sounds kind of familiar. Looking... Oh, I should have done this sooner, Chris. Chap some way was one of the original Aitichi negotiators. Grandpa Ray liked him. Yeah, I thought so. Isn't he the one Ray figured the two of them could solve everything with, if they could just sit down over a couple of beers? Yes, I found that reference. Okay, Nellie, here we go. Chris let her eyes light up and put a smile on her face. Did you say your full name is Ron some pin some way ku chap some way? Boy, that was a mouthful. Was your grandfather Roth some way some Quinn? The negotiator who labored with my grandfather to find peace and harmony between our two peoples? Chapter 8 Ron folded his four arms across his chest and bowed his head, all four eyes on Chris. It is my honor and pleasure to have been chosen by Rothsome Waysom Quinn, both to walk a path with him and to follow the path I now place my feet on. Chris, the new path we place our feet on was the phrase Roth used for the peace treaty, that means a lot more than it says. I figured that out myself, Nellie. Chris took a deep breath, froze the smile on her face, and dove into the Aitichi pond, so to speak. My heart is glad to share this new path, your feet and mine. Nellie translated at the same level he spoke. Good. He was using that familiar, equal syntax again, and it's easy to do. Nellie started talking Aitichi, even as Chris continued. It has been a very long time since any of us have met and spoken words and listened to each other. I think it has been far too long. I know my great-grandfather, Raymond Longknife, would agree with me about that. Chris finished and found she was holding her breath, waiting for the next words from the young Aitichi. My chooser. Respected Counselor Rothsome Waysom Quinn has told me very similar words. When he and Ray of the long-reaching knife separated, there was so much blood in the water that he feared that only a feeding frenzy could follow if we continued to share the same water. But, as with all things, passing time and tides have cleared the water. He sent me forth to see if chance and the gods of the deep might smile upon us now, unlike their angry choices that decreed we must fight when last we met. Ron glanced at his advisors. The green and white stood still, red and dark green shading their gills. Ron and his navy friend 
displayed a light green to match Abby's and Kara's dresses. Next time out, Chris decided, she would put on a nice pastel green pantsuit. Jack coughed softly into his hand, but said, Chris, I'm glad you two are getting along, but there is the matter of them blowing up our messenger pod. Nellie started translating Jack's words before Chris had a chance to stop her, then decided now was no time to cut off communications. When Nellie finished, Chris gave Ron a moment to say something. He didn't. With a sigh, she walked once more into the breach. You must excuse my advisor. You are not alone in having them and not always liking the words they toss into the water. Still, there must have been a reason for you shooting up our pod. You want to say it just like that? Exactly like that. Neutral. Nothing nice, but nothing nasty. Nellie spoke. Ron's gills were showing a hot pink. So were his navy allies. The two green and whites displayed a distinctive brownish green, reminding Chris of raw sewage. One of the green and whites said something in a harsh whisper. What'd he say, Nellie? Don't you dare, or something like that. Repeat it out loud. Nellie did. The Aitichi's head swiveled, quick as a snake. He glared at Chris, eyes wide, mouth open enough to show teeth. The Aitichi were definitely carnivores, or omnivores, like humans. Chris smiled back, showing lots of teeth, too. Ron placed a hand on the green and white's rump and spoke. I, I, Nellie translated. I think the word is apologize. It didn't get used much in the negotiations. The decision to vaporize your pod was one that divided the old and wise advisers entrusted to my hearing. After much disharmony, the eldest demanded that we destroy the pod and all information in it and secure the benefit of time. Time often resolves problems that seem impossible in the present. While Chris was absorbing that, Colonel Cortez spoke softly. Yet the use of force often closes doors that need to be left open if fresh air is to be let in. Chris? Translate it. It sounds good enough to me. Nellie did. There was a lengthy pause. Ron's eyes flicked between the green and whites and the navy type. Finally, that gray and gold one swiveled his head to face front. Have we closed and locked any doors? The navy officer asked, and Nellie quickly translated. Chris glanced at Jack. He tossed this smelly fish out to start with. He gave Chris a slight nod and spoke. You fired on our pod. That raised the immediate fear that you would fire on our ship. I feared that you might be a ship of wandering men who knew no law. Now that we have seen your faces, we know you to be Honorable Aitichi from the Imperial Court. Jack paused to take a breath and let Nellie's words sink in. You stopped my princess from sending out a report that we had encountered an Aitichi far from home. Her Highness must inform King Raymond of such a new and unusual occurrence. I do not understand why that would cause you disharmony if we were to do that. Chris kept her face in official blank and watched as the Aitichi showed a palette of colors in response to Jack's blunt words. Ron's neck stayed an embarrassed red. The Navy guy covered a lot of the spectrum, but not as much as the two green and whites. Colors chased up and down their former gill slits. Unfortunately, there was a lot of red and black in there, and not a little bit of white. Finally, Ron spoke. I sincerely hope that our initial move on this game has not left us with nothing further to do or say. Chris wouldn't let that hang fire any longer than she had to. It has closed off no thoughts in my mind. 
My appetite for harmony still leaves my stomach hungry to be filled. That's a fun one to translate. Just do what you're paid for. We got to talk about that. But the words were spoken. It took Ron a long minute to digest her words. Chris noticed that while his advisors kept their eyes locked on him, he, for his part, had raised his eyes to the overhead, ignoring them and, apparently, making up his own mind. Finally, he came face front to meet Chris's eyes. I am glad that there is still a hunger for harmony between at least you and me. If we can fill our stomachs on that, maybe we can find a path for other feet to walk, maybe even those of our advisors. He gave his two green and whites a glance. They chose not to meet it. How shall we do this? That, of course, was a very expensive question. Chris knew without asking that her advisors would be dead set against her going off on her own with Ron. Chris had no doubt that his advisors might agree with her own on nothing, except that the two of them needed a mob looking over their shoulders and hanging on every word they spoke. Oh, and recording it all for further review, analysis, correction, and posterity. Being one of those damn long knives really sucked sometimes. Of course, being one of those chaps some ways must not have been all skittles and beer either. Chris rolled her shoulders. She had tension aplenty, and the zero-G was not helping. Maybe that one could at least be worked around. I do not know how this lack of gravity affects you, but my body was made for some good solid gravity under my feet. What about you? Nellie had hardly finished translating when Ron actually barked something like a laugh. <laughs> I spent too many early years hiding in a pond from the big tooth ones to enjoy feeling no kiss of the ground. Yes, let us get your ship underway enough to know which end is down. One of the green and whites interrupted. He put all four hands to his chest and bowed toward Ron, but there was no bend in his voice. If her ship is to accelerate, the Navy... Here, the green and white gave a narrow-eyed look at the gray and golds and flashed bright red for emphasis. Must take away the connecting tunnel to our ship. He told us before we came here that it was impossible for two ships to accelerate together on the same course. Captain Drago sighed. It's always the fault of the poor working folks, isn't it? He gave a sardonic glance to the gray and gold, who returned a similar look that stretched across the chasm between the two species. Ron straightened his back even more, something Chris would not have thought possible, and shook himself, setting all his many colors to shimmering. I am content to stay aboard this ship, while the reach into the dark matches course and speed at a safe distance. You may pull up your skirts and hurry back to our ship if you wish, but for me, I will place my trust in the chosen spawn of the long-reaching knife. Chapter 9 Half the Aitichi delegation were whispering at once. Some want to go, but think they're too important to be spared. Others want to stay, but have something important to do on the other ship, Nellie said. They can sort themselves out. I'm going to get things going on this side, Chris said. Professor Mfumbo, would you get my boffin advisors back to work? Certainly, your highness, the professor said with a very slight bow. A shooing wave of his hands sent most of the scientists going hand over hand toward the exit. It took some personal encouragement to get D'Alva moving, but she went. Jack, could we cut down on the honor guard? He hardly raised his voice. Gunny, single up the line. No need to hold them from their other duties for this show. The wink that the Marine captain and his senior NCO exchanged told Chris all she needed to know. The Marines would be out of sight, 
but no one would take over her ship with a sudden coup de main. Chris, if you don't mind, I'm going to get Kara back to bed, Abby said. The twelve-year-old's protests of, I'm not tired, had to force its way through a huge yawn. Chris pointed. You, bed, that's an order. It's not fair, Kara mumbled, but she was already being pushed upward by Abby. Hurry along, little dear, before they put on power, the maid said, almost motherly. Ooh, can I go to bed? Penny asked, not even trying to suppress a yawn. Nope, you're supposed to be a grown-up and an expert in intelligence. What do you know about Aitichi? Not my area of specialization, the intel officer said. Mine either, Chris said. But we had these nice seven-foot-tall folks drop in, and suddenly I'm all ears about our four-eyed friends, the Aitichi. Captain Drago headed back to his bridge, not willing to let anyone else oversee the separation of two such dissimilar ships. Chris waited until he was past her, then turned her back on the still undecided Aitichi and whispered, Captain. Yes, he said, turning back to Chris. Once Abby gets Kara down, tell her she has the bridge watch at my station, Chris said softly. For a moment, there was puzzlement in the captain's eyes, then they widened ever so slightly. Chris's battle station was weapons. Chris, an active Wardhaven officer, had the duty to make the final choice to fire the wasp's hidden lasers. Chris wanted Abby standing by to make the hard decision if it was necessary to fire on the Aitichi death ball. Tell Abby her commission is activated, Chris added. That would eliminate any doubt about her meaning. Chris and Drago were in agreement that only someone holding an active commission would give the actual firing order. Abby's commission was as a reserve army lieutenant in intelligence. Still, it was a commission, and Chris had just activated it. I understand, the captain said, with an informal two-finger salute to Chris. Chris was trusting, but only so far. Right now, she felt a budding kinship with Ron, son or grandson or whatever, to some Aitichi war hero and all. She strongly suspected he'd grown up with all the disadvantages she'd had. Wealth, power, target bullseye painted on his rump. Yes, she kind of trusted him. But those advisors, she was fighting an instant dislike for the green and whites. Maybe not the gray and golds, but the green and whites she wouldn't trust out of her crosshairs. Abby was neither the confirmed coward she claimed to be, nor a trigger-happy hero. Abby she would trust with her life, and Kara's life. All their lives. With a deep sigh, Chris turned back to face the Aitichi. They were still arguing, or going through the motions of what passed for disagreement among their kind, or maybe their kind in the imperial court, the body language of the green and whites was so submissive. Their knees, all twelve per person, were bent into a kind of half-crouch that left Ron towering over them. Their arms were crossed over their chests. Their words were so soft. What are they saying, Nellie? I've been following them while you've been having your fun with Captain Drago. You need me. That monkey woman will wrap you around her little tentacles. Our years have made us wise in the ways of twisty people. You are so young. Stuff like that. Ron hasn't said more than a few words. That navy type that he seems to trust has just stood by. I've made a note of his body language. I'll bet that is what passes for Grandpa Trouble's disgusted look. Chris listened to Nellie trying not to let her sudden use of contractions send the shivers that she felt down her back. Something big had happened deep down in Nellie's insides, and of course, 
It would happen when Nelly had become the only link between two sentient species. Chris was relying on Nelly to build a bridge of communications across a gulf that could easily overflow with blood and guts if things went wrong. And Chris had no idea what was going on inside Nelly. No idea at all. All she could do was hope that Nellie's new interest in telling jokes wouldn't send her and Ron, humans and Aitichi, smashing into some kind of catastrophic pratfall. Thank you, Nellie. Keep listening and let me know what you think. I think these green and whites could give your mother lessons in passive-aggressive behavior. That's what I think. No doubt, Chris thought. As she caught Ron's eye or rather, the two left ones, both suddenly seemed to focus on her. She gave him back a soft, knowing smile, and the flutter of colors playing on his neck softened into pastels, with more green and rose playing through them. Chris was glad that her skin didn't give her away like that. How many times had she retreated behind a blank mask, not so much as a muscle twitching while mother or father or other authority figure went on and on about what she ought to do. Maybe there was something she could teach the poor fellow. Or maybe it was uncontrolled, what the ears took in and the brain reacted to, the old gill slits put out for all to see. So, the Aitichi might be seven feet tall, but they did have a weakness here and there. How long do you think this is going to take? Jack asked out of the corner of his mouth. Your guess is as good as mine, Chris answered. The Aitichi have a preference for consensus, Penny put in. They took longer to agree among their own negotiating party than it took us to agree with them. Or at least that's what your grandfather swore. So... Suddenly, Penny was showing she knew more about the Aitichi than she'd admitted a moment before. Then again, she'd had time to consult her own computer, have it download everything stored in the Wasp's computer, and maybe get a dump from Nellie. Oops, that dump might or might not be tainted by Nellie's new outlook on life. Chris had better take a moment to warn all her staff to keep an eye on Nellie. But not here not in front of the Aitichi. Lord help us, Chris sighed. All hell's a-poppin', and there is no time to form a bucket brigade. Wasn't that the story of her life? But back to Penny's remark. Colonel Cortez beat her to it. Of course, our negotiating team included President Longknife and General Torden. You mean trouble, Jack put in with a wry grin. As he is Her Highness's great-grandfather, the colonel said with a slight bow, I thought I should be more formal. Grandpa trouble is trouble to everyone, Chris said, half sigh, half growl. No way to sugarcoat that for me. You hang around Chris, Jack said, and you get to know general trouble up close and personal. I've learned all sorts of new cuss words for that man. I see, the colonel said, his eyes widening ever so slightly. He's not as retired as I had heard. Not around his darling great-granddaughter, Penny added. Thank you all so very much for reminding me, Chris said. But don't worry too much, colonel. At the moment, I'm not on speaking terms with either Grandpa Trouble or Grandpa Ray. But didn't I hear the young Aitichi say... He needs to talk to King Ray of the long-reaching knife? Yep, Jack said. So Her Highness may just have to get off her high horse and go crawling back to her grandpa. King, to the rest of us, no accounts. Okay, okay. Let's cancel this pick on the princess day and get back to what our good military advisor said about our negotiating team, including a certain Ray and trouble. Yes. Colonel Cortez said, picking up where he left off, with no more than a slight grin for the rabbit hole they journeyed down. Those two were rather notorious for getting a bit in their teeth and running with it. Once they made up their minds about something, the rest of our team had to follow, or have an excellent and well-ordered reason for not doing so. I have heard that about my kin, 
Chris agreed. Sometimes I even think my father and brother may have inherited such traits. Of course, I know I didn't. That got a snort from the humans present, even the two Marines within hearing distance. Chris gave the two guards a solid officer scowl that took the grins off their faces, then quickly converted it to a smile when she noticed that Ron had momentarily lost interest in the present wheedling of his green and whites and was looking Chris's way with what had to be a puzzled expression. Nellie said something in Aitichi, and Ron gave Chris a small wave with his lower left hand and turned back to his problems. Nellie, what did you say? Nothing, Chris. I just told Ron that you were having a bit of trouble with your advisors, just like him. Nellie, you are not supposed to give away state secrets, Jack put in. Even small ones? I forgot to warn all of you, Chris said. Nellie has developed, or is trying to develop, a sense of humor. Help her if you can in your spare time, but be aware that what you get from her might be a very poor attempt at humor. Oh, Nellie, that sounds wonderful, Penny said enthusiastically. But the look she cast to the others was just short of horrified. Don't you humans go getting your panties in a twist, Nellie said, in a voice not all that different from Kara's. I've done a search on humor and peace negotiations, and no, they don't mix. I found a doctorate thesis on the problems of applying humor to conflict situations. It says it only works when used in a closed group, like the way you folks do it but it is far too risky across major conflict boundaries. Okay, there. You happy? Yes, Nelly, the colonel said. You show us more and more that you are not only very smart, but also growing in wisdom. Don't try to butter me up, colonel. I know I'm the smartest collection of facts on this boat. I also know none of us has anything close to the wisdom we need for this mess Chris didn't actually get us into. Not really. No, it just happened on my watch, Chris grumbled. Like it always does, Jack added. Hold it, pretty boy. That was not humor. That was saying something snide to my girl, Nellie said. There is a difference, Penny pointed out. But it's true. All the crap does happen on Chris's watch, Jack insisted. But it's not her fault, Nellie insisted. It really doesn't matter, Nellie, Chris said. Jack's right. I have bad karma. There is no such thing as karma, Nellie shot back. Karma, fate, destiny, Jack said. Call it what you want, but it's there and Chris has every flavor of bad it comes in. Nellie didn't have a quick response to that. It seems, the colonel said, that one of our visitors wants to visit. A gray and gold trotted over to them, while the two green and whites continued their running non-disagreement with Ron. He paused about two meters out from Chris, and looped his four legs into the safety ropes with expert care, just about the time that Drago announced, The wasp will take on one quarter G in two minutes. Prepare for gravity. He glanced at the deck a meter below his feet, and reached two hands for a hold, an instant after Chris and her team did the same. With a slight bow, he began to speak. He says... Nellie translated, that he's Tedum Sum Li, a ship leader, honored to advise the emperor's trusted and honored representative, Ron Sum Pin Sum Wei. He has been honored with the assignment to come to us and make arrangements for how we shall hold further talks as honored persons to honored persons. Tell him we'll be glad to get the housekeeping chores out of the way while the green and whites haggle, Chris said with a smile. You sure you want to say that? Penny shot out, 
before Nelly started to translate. You tend to your knitting, and I'll see how many sharks are really swimming in our little wading pool. On your head, Long Knife. Just remember, if they start shooting at you, they're gonna hit the rest of us, too. You two going to finish your haggling before I forget what it is Chris told me to say? Nelly said, in pure twelve-year-old. Computers don't forget, Jack said. But I'm a computer, picking up bad human habits, remember. Chris didn't know what an impatient Aitichi looked like, but the one in front of her was getting wide-eyed and tight at the mouth. Nelly, translate before this fellow walks off. Nelly did. He said something, and Nelly said something more. Nelly, what are you telling him? He wanted to know what took us so long, so I told him. All of what we said? Of course not. I told him about the hassling you were taking from your human advisors and left me out. That translator Ron is wearing is a pretty dumb machine. They don't need to know how good I am. You got that right, girl. Nellie's explaining why we took so long to answer, Chris whispered. Jack started to say something, thought better, and didn't. You really need to get all your people their own computer like me. If they were plugged in like you, you could talk to them just like you talk to me. And you'd spend all your time gabbing with them, so I'd never get a word in edgewise, Chris said. But Nellie did have a point. She'd been able to get messages through Nellie once in a while from someone else, but that was when they were distant from her. Just now, it would be nice to pass a message and not have to worry about it being heard and reacted to. Suit yourself, human. It's your funeral. Ted here and I have agreed that he's a Navy captain, and housekeeping is a good word that the Aitichi ought to steal from us. Are you ready to get some housekeeping issues out of the way? Certainly, Captain. It is an honor to have you aboard, Chris said. What can we do for you? The Aitichi captain spoke, and Nellie took up a near-simultaneous translation. He says they will send one of the Imperial Banner carriers back to their ship and keep one here. Do they need to keep one? Penny asked into the silence. Do I need to get someone here with a flag? Chris asked right after her. We've got flags if we need them. No. He says they recognize the authority you have, Chris. It's just that under law, no one may speak for the Emperor without having an Imperial Herald with full rig present under pain of death. It's an old law, going back to the days when lots of people claimed to speak for the Emperor. Now, no Herald, no Imperial words, or off with your head, or something like that. Chris, I I'm not sure, but I think the Herald may have a recorder or perfect recall. Anyway, no talking without one. Interesting, Chris said, not remembering anything about this in the histories of Grandpa Ray's peace negotiations. So, we live and learn. Of course, the captain may keep a herald present. He also wants to keep all four of his marines. Ship accelerating to one quarter G in five, four, three, two, one, interrupted them. Everyone, even the marine guards on both sides, grabbed a handhold or two. As acceleration began, they slowly sank to the deck of the docking bay. Chris was amazed at the graceful way both sets of marines did it, without taking their eyes off each other or breaking from their stiff attention. Jack, are you willing to reduce my honor guard to four? No problem, the Marine answered, then turned to face the Aitichi captain. You do realize I'll have some others guarding the doors and things. I don't think any of the people aboard the Wasp still hold a grudge against the Aitichi, but I'm not willing to take that chance. I'll feel better about the safety of the Imperial representative if you do take those precautions. Good, Jack said. 
I just didn't want you feeling surprised or betrayed if you catch a glimpse of extra marines close at hand. It is easy for an old sailor to understand your need, and I'm glad to see you're as interested in building trust as I am. I think we understand each other on that, Chris said. Anything else? I and another Navy captain will stay with the Imperial representative. At least one. And here, the Aitichi glanced back at the still-debating trio of Ron and his green and whites. He raised and lowered his head, something like a nod. But Chris strongly suspected the intent reflected was more the shake of a head in a human. She'd have to watch herself on that. At least one of the Imperial counselors will stay with the Imperial representative. Maybe two, if they can ever settle matters among themselves. We don't mind, Chris started, then decided she'd better change her choice of words. It does not matter to me whether one or two Imperial counselors come with the Imperial representative. What is the issue that causes their discussion to drag on and on? Chris knew her question could be out of order, but it was time to push back the mutual ignorance between Aitichi and human. The Aitichi captain again turned his back on the argument and faced Chris. My fellow captain, who commands the reach into the dark, must have a counselor on board, since he is sailing far beyond the boundaries of the Empire. Otherwise, he is subject to shortening. Here, the captain drew a hand across his throat in an all-too-human gesture. Both of the advisors want to be with the Imperial representative. Neither wants to go back. Can you see the problem? Chris nodded. It can only get worse. I warned both of them that our best chance to meet Raymond of the long-reaching knife would be for us to transfer to a human vessel. Neither one of them wants to be left behind. How are they going to settle this if they can't agree? A flip of a coin? Colonel Cortez asked. A flip of a coin? Nellie, explain to the captain what we humans mean. Nellie did. All four of the Aitichi's eyes widened. You would leave something of such honor to a random event generator? In the Imperial Palace, they would likely refer a matter such as this to the field of honor. The one that lived would go. I teach ye kill each other over such matters? Chris said. In matters of such historical importance, a family's honor would require the maximum exertion. Of course, I cannot really imagine either of those two being anything but a joke with swords on the field of honor. Chris didn't consider herself a good judge of Aitichi fighting quality. She'd leave that to the captain. Still, the problem of having only two counselors on the voyage and no instructions on how to resolve their duties. You must have known this problem was coming when you set out on this trip. Some of us did, the captain agreed. Did that include the imperial representative and his, uh, chooser? Was that a smile on the captain's lips? His nose had flared wide and emitted a huff of air, and his mouth had widened, though his lips were still closed. Rothsum Waysum Quinn did know this time would come. He marveled that the imperial court sent us only two counselors. I, of course, was not privy to any advice he might have given his young chosen one. Is it Normal for an imperial representative to be so young? Chris asked. The Aitichi captain eyed Chris. Is it normal for humans to let one as young as you lead them by the hand? I cannot help but note that all your advisors are older than you, all except the immature one who, I assume, does not advise. But boy, does she advise my computer, Chris thought loudly in her head. You wanted me to hear that, didn't you? Well, I'm learning to be a kid from her, and I'm enjoying it. You ought to try it sometime. I never had time to be a kid, Chris snapped, then added, don't translate this. Chris turned to her team. Crew, 
It seems to me that someone has dumped a basket of hot potatoes right in our collective lap. Any ideas what we do about it? Jack was the first to find his voice, and note that Nellie had not translated Chris's words. Well, I guess we could shoot one of them. Death with honor doesn't seem to be all that frowned upon. Assuming we can trust this captain's story about the imperial court, Colonel Cortez said. Considering some of the stories I've heard about politicians circulated at all clubs, I'm none too sure we should rely on him as an unbiased witness. Unfortunately, what I know about Aitichi doesn't give me any better handle on this, Penny said. So we just keep waiting, Chris said with a frown. I get the feeling these two are willing to talk until one of them keels over from old age. Looks that way, Jack agreed. Maybe I should shoot one. Shall I flip a coin? He asked, reaching for his pocket. Less don't and say we did, Colonel Cortez put in. Does anyone besides me feel that it's unfair that the Imperial Court dumped this hot potato in our lap? Chris said. They knew they had a problem. They didn't solve it. Kind of makes you wonder what they're up to. Like I occasionally do with my grandpas. Huh. This just gets stranger and stranger, Jack agreed. Sure would be nice if we knew more, Penny said. So let's ask some questions, Chris said. Nellie, tell old Ted here that we've been talking among ourselves and wondering why they didn't sail with three counselors. Two could then go on with the imperial representative, or they could have sailed with just one, in which case he'd stay with the ship and the imperial rep would go on alone. The Aitichi made a very good effort at a human shrug. I do not know. It might have had something to do with imperial court politics. One can never tell. I kind of thought it might. Politicians doing funny things seems to be something you can count on, no matter what color your blood is, Chris said slowly as Nellie translated. So, what kind of solution do you think the folks back at the imperial court might have come up with for this problem? if they were all that concerned with solving it. Some of them might not be all that bothered if it wasn't solved. Not everyone thought we should talk to you humans again. As they see it, matters have gone fine while we ignored you. Why change? Is that your thought? Chris asked the Aitichi officer. I would not be here if it were. But you have no idea how to solve this problem. Not within my authority, no, I do not. Could you chop one of their heads off? Jack put in. If I did, his family would demand blood from my family. Whole families have been decimated in such events. Good idea you didn't shoot anyone, Cortez said. Jack nodded as Nellie kept quiet. So it comes down, Chris said, to the same mess I'm often in. I can't kill them, and I can't make them do what I want. You know the feeling, Captain. Too often, the Aitichi said through Nellie. Chris eyed the captain, wondering what he was doing here. Ron had trusted him to come over and open negotiations, if only on housekeeping matters. But then... Housekeeping matters like who sat where at the table had been known to tie up months of haggling. For an instant, Chris had a mental vision of herself in Ron's shoes, saddled with two nannies who had too many votes behind them to be ignored, but too few brains to be much help. Yeah, that was just the kind of learning experience Grandpa Ray seemed to love dumping her in. Drop one Princess Chris in a swamp full of alligators with orders to drain the swamp. But no, you couldn't shoot any of the alligators. Endangered species and all that. Grandpa Trouble would find the whole thing uproariously funny. The problem here was that poor Ron was being chewed on so much by the alligators that he couldn't find any time to drain the swamp. 
Think it through, Chris. His Grandpa Ray sent Ron on this mission. It has to be doable. It isn't working. He needs either one more or one less counselor. We can't kill one of them and make it one less. Which seems to point to there being a need for one more. Hmm. So, Captain... How does one get to be an imperial counselor? Chris asked. Are you born one? Do you go to some school? You must be a chosen of a chosen. Yes, that is essential. And you must be properly educated. You must also have demonstrated your skills. How do you do that? Some are drawn from the ranks of junior navy or army officers. After the human war... There were a lot of them. Some are drawn from the ranks of industrial managers. Junior officers? Chris said. I and my fellow captain are long past that career choice. Don't even think of trying to turn us down that path. The ITG captain is quite serious about that, Nellie added. So how does one of those junior people find himself in such a career as a counselor? Three counselors must sign his commission. The four Aitichi Marines were now drawn up with their backs to the cargo bay doors. Chris eyed the two green and whites. They were still arguing with Ron at one end of the Marine line. At the other flank, the Navy captain and the two Imperial heralds talk quietly among themselves. Do heralds ever make the jump into the Imperial counselor ranks? That is not unusual, the captain agreed. The perfect memory they develop as heralds is very helpful for a counselor. Why did that not surprise Chris? There was just one more question, and if the Aitichi who bargained with Grandpa Ray was anything like the old vulture, Chris was sure of the answer. So, does the emperor usually elevate an imperial counselor to be his imperial representative? Why, yes, that is so, the Aitichi captain said, with another one of his close-mouthed grins. So why doesn't Ron just elevate the senior herald to counselor and leave him behind on his ship? Because that pair of unchosen sisabate have kept him too busy to think, and because the senior herald is from a family that philsos some fonsom li, the one on the right and also senior counselor, detests and would never sign off on. Never? You think you could get him to sign? Let's see, Chris said, and trotted into the fray. She didn't wait for an opening, but just had Nellie interrupt the debate in mid-sentence. Her audacity got her the floor, and she never gave it up. She didn't exactly twist anyone around her little finger, the Aitichi being so much bigger than she, but she did talk them around to her plan of action by the simple expedient of failing to notice when anyone didn't agree with her. Amazing how well that worked, with Nellie being the only translator they had. Five minutes later, it was agreed that the older Herald had quite successfully served his apprenticeship and well-deserved advancement to the rank of Imperial Counselor Junior Grade, and that both of the senior Imperial Counselors would accompany Ron to Wardhaven to meet with Raymond I of United Sentients. Chris got to observe how a delighted and a decidedly unhappy Aitichi looked. Ron was overjoyed, to be quit of this endless argument. He was also appalled at the prospects of having both green and whites at his elbows when he met Grandpa Ray, which explained to Chris why he hadn't applied the logical conclusion on his own. There probably had been a time in her development when she would have been just as stubborn in her effort to get rid of two backseat drivers like that pair of green and whites. Still, she had to believe that her visceral hatred of endless yammering would have driven her to cut the Gordian knot. Then again, her older brother, Hanovi, had chosen to follow her father into politics. 
and she'd heard of him sitting through some truly mind and rump deadening meetings. Maybe Ron hadn't had the option of a more decisive career with the Navy, and had more patience with Palaver than she had. She should really help him to get over that bad habit. Assuming he hung around her for a while. Well, now that they had all the housekeeping settled, they could get down to something important. Like, why did Ron want to talk to Grandpa Ray? Oh, and why did the Aitichi slag the wasp's messenger pod? Chapter 10 Chris made a quick call to Captain Drago, and a few minutes later, sailors brought in a table and chairs for her team. Will you stand? Chris asked. Do you have something that you like to sit on? A rug? Our honored selves will stand, the imperial representative said, and arranged his green and whites on one side of him, his gray and golds on the other, and the imperial herald behind him. Chris settled into the chair across the table from Ron and found herself staring up and up and up. She waved at her staff and found Jack and Penny sitting at her left and right, with the colonel taking the chair beside Jack. All of them had to crane their necks to look at the Aitichi across from them. Nellie, tomorrow we get a taller table and high chairs. Yes, Chris. Did Grandpa Ray say anything about this problem? Not a word, Chris. None of the negotiators mentioned what it was like to sit across from seven-foot-tall Aitichi. Put another black mark down for important things that didn't make it into the history books. No one wanted to admit to the rest of humanity that they got cricks in their necks. Enough, Nellie. You're going to make me laugh. Chris leaned back so as to get a better view of the other side, and said, It seems like we have two issues on the table. Why does the imperial representative of the imperial court want to talk with King Raymond? And why did you fire on our messenger pod? With that, Chris shut up, leaving the Aitichi to stew on the questions. They hadn't wanted to talk over the net about those matters. Now they had their face-to-face -face meeting talk to me. Nobody said anything. For a long time. A very long time. Ron glanced at Phil, the senior green and white. Phil looked straight ahead, ignoring the glance. Ron's neck marks went from pink to red to redder before he nudged the counselor. Phil sidled a bit away from the imperial representative but still kept a bland look on his face, though his colors were getting a darker and darker red, which left Chris wondering what kind of survival mechanism it was that displayed your emotions for all to see. Now, Ron's colors were a deep red, blending into black. Phil gave up ignoring him and turned his face full on to the Emperor's rep. At that, his skin suddenly went from red to black to white. The counselor crossed his arms over his chest and bowed his head to his superior. That couldn't be easy for the old iron head, considering how much younger Ron was, Chris thought. But Phil the counselor held her full attention as he opened his mouth and spoke. Nellie waited a moment before she began to translate. Our oldest and wisest counselor says in the highest of court language that, considering how much ill will and blood was spilt by the two opposing parties, and considering his personal responsibility for the success of the great and honorable mission the emperor has personally sent them on, and considering his etc., 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 that they don't want to get killed on this mission, and there are a couple of more considerings of how small the embassy is and how important it is and stuff like that. Anyway, both of the advisers agreed that it was important enough to keep this mission a secret, that they thought firing on the messenger pod was a good idea at the time. How were they to know that the... Ah, 
there he goes, using that word that I think means monkey or some such, would react so viciously to their blowing something so small out of space, them being imperial Aitichi and all superior to all other things. Nellie finished before the counselor did. Nellie, a translator is supposed to translate, not paraphrase, Chris said. Trust me, when I print out the full text, you can scan it. It really was a blessing for me to cut it short and drop out all the you scum me master crap. Chris kept her face blank, but it was clear from the foot stomping and glancing about that the Aitichi had noticed that a long speech had gotten very short shrift from the translator. Ron, however, hadn't turned his own translation device back on. If she was going to say something, the sooner the better. Your Highness, may I answer this? Colonel Cortez asked softly. If you promise not to start a war. I shall endeavor to avoid such an outcome, my princess. Then have at it. The colonel stood. Nelly, translate exactly what I say. No changes, no additions, no subtractions. You understand me? Yes, sir, the computer said, almost meekly. Whereas we, the advisors to Princess Christine and Longknife, do understand the importance of any meeting that renews full and open communication between our peoples, the humans, and the Aitichi. Got that? Translated word for word, sir. And whereas we ourselves are on a mission of exploration, and whereas, even as we met you, we were carefully observing the boundaries of the empire and human space, and whereas we are only too aware of the risks of space travel, and the risks of life and limb in space warfare. And whereas, we counselors to said Princess Christine and Longknife have been entrusted with the personal life and safety of her by our magnificent and benevolent King Raymond I, and do take that responsibility personally, on our own honor and flesh and blood. That's a lot of whereases, Jack whispered. But he's got it right so far, Penny said under her breath. Shh, Chris said softly. The colonel ignored them and went on without missing a beat. Therefore, let it be known that we would never have fired upon an Aitichi vessel or any vehicle issuing from such a vessel. Such an action is usually considered an act of war and could only harm the harmony and peace between our separate hostile and fearful people. And in a similar vein, the destruction of a messenger pod would be a really stupid idea, considering that two human vessels had already departed the solar system we were in, and will be messaging a report immediately once they are out of the system, that an Aitichi vessel has been spotted here, and is even now in discussions with Princess Christine and Longknife. Now, Colonel Cortez leaned forward, rested both hands on the table, and glared at the senior green and white. And while we do not chop people's heads off for talking with our Chris, there is no doubt that her great-grandfather will be wondering why he is getting messages from other ships that she's talking with Aitichi. And he hasn't heard from her himself. With that, he sat down, folded his arms across his chest, and continued to glare at Phil. Chris had to stop herself from nodding agreement. She thought of shaking her head, then gave that up as a bad idea, and settled for saying, I agree with every word he said. After a long pause, Ron took four steps back from the table. His four advisors, the navy types and the green and whites, gathered in a half huddle around him. Words flew fast, but in low voices. Nellie, you getting any of this? I heard a couple of what I take for, I told you so. The green and whites are defending themselves with how could we have known and do you really believe the monkeys? 
The Navy types are using the word human for us, though they are mangling the pronunciation. Ron is pretty much keeping quiet. Chris had noticed that. Then, she had also left the talking to her staff. It was better to let them take the risks. She could always step in and damp down any problem they started. Maybe Ron wasn't so bad at this. Of course, when you've got an advisor who wants to shoot first and explain later, maybe not so good. Does it sound to you like the Navy captains weren't the ones that came up with the idea of shooting the messenger pod? It sure does, Chris. Interesting, that. Finally, Ron stepped back up to the table, and his advisors returned to their places. Nothing happened for a moment. Then Ron started talking, and Nellie quickly translated for him. My wise and learned advisors tell me that an August imperial representative does not do what I am about to do. Then again, it has been a long time since an imperial representative talked to a human. Yeah, he said human, Chris, Nellie interjected before hurrying on. So I am going to say that if I had it to do over again, I would not fire on your pod. It was a mistake. I accept your apology, Chris said. Our words would be sincere regrets, but they are rarely sincere, Ron said, with a sidewise glance at his senior counselor. He shied away from his young superior. We'd probably say the same thing and mean it just as little. Can we start our talks over again? Chris asked. I would hope that we can. Can I send a messenger pod to my great-grandfather, King Raymond, telling him of this meeting and your request for a meeting with him? I hope you will. Beside Ron, Phil, the counselor, was as white as Chris's uniform. She hoped the Aitichi weren't into seppuku or other forms of ritual suicide, because Phil looked to be in line for that. Now it was Chris's turn to get the right message across to her team, in front of a potentially hostile audience. She turned to Penny. Nellie, translate what I say for the Aitichi. Lieutenant Penelope Lean Pasley. The Aitichi seemed into long names. Chris could do that. Please have Captain Drago of the Wasp reload all the data on the destroyed messenger pod and launch another. Add to that this update. To King Raymond I, I, Princess Christine Anne Longknife, second-born of Prime Minister William Longknife of Wardhaven, am now in discussions with... Help me out here, Nellie. Ron some pin some way, ku chap some way. Chosen of chooser, roth some way some quin ku chap some way. He is known unto you as an imperial representative to the negotiations that resulted in the treaty between all humanity and the Aitichi Empire at the Orange Nebula. Ron, to shorten matters up a bit, has been sent by your old friend, Roth, to talk with you. I don't know why. I will talk more with him about that, but I want you to hear this first from me, and not some other source. More to follow as I find out what's going on. Your loving great-granddaughter, Chris. That last part was a stretch, but it would at least get a smile from him. Penny, see that the message gets encoded. Nellie will give you the address access codes, so the message goes straight to Grandpa Ray. Get back here when it's done. Penny tossed Chris a quick salute and hustled off. I've already given her the address codes. Good, Nellie. And make sure she understands. Reload all the data we sent. I will. Chris gave Ron a smile, feeling a bit guilty about hiding the exact contents of the messenger pod but not guilty enough to not make sure that all they now knew about the Aitichi got back to Wardhaven immediately. You will call your ship and make sure the next pod doesn't suffer the fate of the last one, won't you? Chris said, 
trying to make it sound more like girl to boy rather than a negotiator in a deadly game. Just why she did that, she couldn't say, but it felt good to get some of the tension off the table. Of course, princess. Captain, if you will, Ron said, turning to the gray and gold they had talked with earlier. He produced a calm link from his robes and muttered into it. It is done, my lord, Nellie translated. Ron turned back to Chris. I could not help but notice that when you talked to the king, your great-grandfather, you shortened your name to simply Chris and my name to Ron. I hope I did not offend. We are less formal than you. I meant no offense. My chooser has raised me since choosing to be open to such lack of formality. He noticed it among you humans and prepared me for it. It has caused me some difficulty among my peers. Have you tried it among your staff? When mine get to arguing with me, it goes a lot faster if I don't have to run through all their formal titles and names, and they don't have to do the same for me. The tight grin appeared on Ron, as it had on the Navy Captain Ted. Unfortunately, I have made such attempts, and it has not endeared me to my learned and wise advisors. Some of them have enough trouble remembering their station and mine. It helps them remember that they are the advisor and I am the advised. You may have a point, Chris agreed. But it is way too late for me to try to get any respect from my advisors. Now the Navy folks on both sides of the table were grinning. The humans widely, the Aitichi more tight-lipped. All but the green and whites. Chris wondered if those two ever relaxed. Now then, Ron said. What else is in the bowl for eating? Why do you need to talk to my great-grandfather? You were going to tell me, Chris said lightly. With any luck, the easy way the conversation flowed would let them run right through this last, important point. No, I was not and will not, brought the conversation to a roaring halt. You won't, Chris repeated, as the faces around her and across from her got serious again. I cannot. My chooser, Roth, I assume you would call him. Ron raised a hand toward her. Prince Roth or Counselor Roth. We humans do add titles to our informal ways. Senior Imperial Counselor Roth, Ron began again, asked and required of me to swear on all the graves of our ancestors that I would give over his message only to the one who negotiated with him, now known as King Raymond I. And if he was dead, God forbid? Chris asked. I would return for further instructions. As simple as that, huh? I am prepared to die and carry my emperor's message undelivered to my ancestors. And studying his body posture and the soft voice he spoke his words in, Chris did not doubt he meant it. She let that roll around in her head for a moment before she turned to see how the others took it. Why would he have to deliver a message in person? Could he have a ticking time bomb in him? With him? But why would the Aitichi want to kill Grandpa Ray after all this time? Were they ready to restart the war? Was there anything more stupid than that? Would restarting the war be as stupid to the Aitichi as it was to a human? Honor had been tossed around a lot. Was there some kind of dishonor in dying before your old adversary? When the old emperor got along in years... Had he signed up his old pal Roth to have some kid like Ron go pop Ray? This guessing could go on and on forever. Chris had nothing to base anything on. Ron, I need to know something about why you must see my king. I fully understand your need. However, you must understand that the wisest and most honored advisors of the court agree 
that what I have to say must come from my lips to your king's ears. I must be ready immediately to answer any questions he has about it. Honored Chris, I knew I was being given a difficult assignment when I was told of it. Certainly your king must have given you difficult assignments. All the time, Chris said with a sigh, one echoed by Jack at her side. Ron shook his head, which Chris took to mean that he knew just how she felt. Maybe he did. She didn't know him nearly well enough yet to be sure. He went on. I have been preparing for this mission to humanity all my life. I was chosen from the scum ponds and raised on land by Roth to understand your human ways the best of any I teach you since the war. I have dreamed of this mission to humanity for years, sweated through my training and tests with just one objective, to build a bridge between my emperor and your people. Please help me succeed. Those last words struck Chris hard. Failure was her worst fear. She could understand someone's desperate need to succeed, no matter what it took. But hold it. You have been preparing for this mission to humanity all your life? Yes, came in English, from Ron's own lips. This message you have from my king, it has been waiting for you to be ready for this embassy? Nellie translated for Chris. No, was again direct from Ron. I don't understand or you just walked into a lie. Chris froze her face, showing a blank page to the world. Across from her, Ron's neck marks went from pleasant pinks and greens to dead white. Chris watched his long throat as he swallowed hard. I have not lied to you, he finally said. Can you explain it to me? Chris asked. She kept her words short, razor sharp. Ron began immediately. My chooser chose me to be a bridge to you humans years ago and raised me for that purpose. The message I bear has only recently come to be. Something new has come up, Chris shot back. Yes, Ron again answered direct. What? Ron took a step back from the table. I cannot tell you that without breaking my pledged word. I cannot say. He looked around at his advisors, his head bowed, and spoke softly. But I will tell you that the survival of both your people and mine may depend on what we do now. That was not what Chris wanted to hear. She'd saved a world or two in her brief Navy career. It had cost her dearly. Saving two entire species must come with a price tag that no one could afford. I need to talk with my staff. Do you mind waiting here for an hour or two? He didn't. She led her team out. What was that all about? Jack asked, as Chris threw herself into her chair in her tactical planning room. Your guess is as good as mine. Colonel Cortez said, taking his own chair. Does this happen often? He asked Jack. The future of every Aitichi and human alive is at risk and in our hands. No, this is a bit much, even for the princess. Penny entered the room. The messenger pod is away. It made it to the jump point safely. What's this about every human and Aitichi? We're all going to die if we don't take this particular Aitichi to King Ray, so he can deliver a message from his grandfather, Chris said, not liking the taste of those words on her tongue. How'd we get in this deep? Penny asked. Things were going so well when I left. You'll have to ask the princess here, Jack said. One minute the two of them are playing footsie and making eyes at each other, I half expected them to rent a room and tell us all to get lost for a week. The next minute she walks out on him. Am I the only one afraid he's on an assassination mission? 
Chris managed to keep her voice below a screech. No, said both Jack and the colonel. Even Nellie at Chris's neck added her own no to the consensus. Well, it's nice to know that I've got a little support from my own imperial counselors. Keep this up and I'll deck you all out in green and white. You can't do that, Nellie said. It would violate uniform regulations. Hey, girl, Penny said. That was a good one, and appropriate to the situation, too. Thank you, Nellie said, sounding just a bit shy at the praise. Folks, Chris said, her voice full of exhaustion. Can we focus here? We've only got an hour, maybe two. Are we going to drag this Trojan horse in to see my great-grandfather? At the moment, I'm not really bothered by the thought Ron might try to kill Ray, but it's the policy of the thing, killing a king and all. Who knows, when I grow up, I might want to be queen. No chance of that, Colonel Cortez said. I can't picture you ever growing up. Hey, the guy's fitting in right well, don't you think? Jack said. Right quickly, Penny said. But I wanted that line, Nellie wailed. I give up, Chris said, getting out of her seat. The world as we know it is depending on us to save it, and I'm surrounded by clowns who only want to be unemployed stand-up comics. Those stand-up comics might be unemployed, the colonel said but no one expects them to know if a horse of many colors who just walked in off the street is an assassin or the last hope for mankind. Since I do like eating regularly, Jack said with a sigh, I guess we'll help Chris on this. Hey, that remark about a Trojan horse was really right on, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Now, for God's sake... Do any of you have an idea how we make sure this guy is on the level? Anyone know how to spot every kind of weapon ever invented? Jack shook his head. Chris, I can't even keep your maid from slipping weapons by me. I don't know where she buys that stuff, but if it's new on the market and guaranteed to slide through detectors, she's got one. That brought silence. We need time to get to know him. Chris said, and the folks around him, and to look over what he brings along. He definitely doesn't bring his own ship. No way, no how, no ship, the colonel said. He seems to be willing to give on that, Jack said. Which only means he and his would have prepared to come aboard and keep their assassin's kit well hidden, Penny said. So, we need extra time, Chris said slowly. How do we get extra time? Jack asked. Nellie, how are you feeling? Chris asked. That question has no meaning, but assuming you meant how am I functioning, my latest self-tests shows I am firing on all cylinders, so to speak. But wouldn't you like to have some time with Auntie True and her computer, Sam? Chris asked, a huge canary-eating grin consuming her face. Chris, you're always threatening me with a trip to Auntie True's, but there's never time. I don't need a trip to Auntie True's. I'm fine just the way I am. No question about that, Chris said though the head shaking around her said she wasn't the only one who considered now to be a good time to make time for Auntie True. The former information war chief of Wardhaven and a family friend had been helping Chris with her math and computer homework since the first grade. It was Auntie True who had gotten Chris hooked on constantly upgrading Nellie. Not even a catastrophic failure in the middle of a math test in the third grade had broken Chris of the habit. Auntie True had been the only one able to do the last three upgrades to Nellie, and had probably done the worst damage to Nellie's good behavior. The last time True had her hands on Nellie, she'd installed an alien data chip of unknown purpose, 
with instructions for Nellie to conduct her own exploration of the chip on her own time. Nellie had never been the same. That chip and the twelve-year-old girl down the hall had done very strange things to Nellie, and now Nellie was doing very strange things on her own. Now would be a very good time to let Auntie True have a look at Nellie. Chris, you're not going to turn me off, or let Auntie True turn me off or cut me up. There was real terror in Nellie's voice. Chris forced her voice to soothing. She would only get one chance to keep her computer on her side. No, Nellie, I'm not going to turn you off again. Of course, I'm assuming you are not going to try shooting anyone up. I learned my lesson. Unless you say shoot, I don't shoot. Okay, Chris. I can't think of any other reason I'd have to lose your company, Nellie. I couldn't let you kill people. Even I try to avoid killing people. I know you do, Chris. I really don't like killing people either. Somehow it just does not compute right. So, I agree not to harm anyone without your order. And you agree to let me stay active for the trip to Auntie True, and not let her turn me off to look under my hood. Nellie, I don't think anyone, even Auntie True, could tell anything from a look at your insides. I know that, Chris. I just needed to hear you say that. So, to restate the bidding, Chris said. We will invite Ron and his party to come aboard the Wasp. We will give them their own quarters and let them lock the area down. We will bug the place and do our best to spot any weapons other than those issued to the Marines. Only after the next jump, with his ship out of calm range... Will we let him know I've got a computer that needs to talk to its mama, and the trip to King Ray will be a bit slower than planned? Any questions? There were none, but Jack had a comment. You know that suggestion that keeps popping up that we ought to have computer as smart as yours? Yes, Chris said. Forget it. I like my dumb one. Me too, came from Penny and the colonel. Back at the docking bay, Ron and his team had been discussing their minimum needs for a trip to Wardhaven. Ron had flat out refused to let the Imperial counselors bring their full retinue. The two of them would have to make do with just one body assistant. Same for the two Navy captains. Ron got to keep one of his... And would Chris mind if they brought a cook? They could eat what the humans ate, but they wouldn't really like it. Chris agreed on the cook, the three body servants, and their own stock of food. This required the ships to again dock and stretch the airlock. Under the watchful eyes of the Marines, crates of food, trunks of clothing, and household goods were brought aboard. Captain Drago had empty containers converted to habitat for the Aitichi. One boffin kitchen became the Aitichis, along with a human helper to operate the unfamiliar equipment. Extremely large showers and unusual shaped necessary facilities were all plumbed in and working within twelve hours. It was truly amazing what the lab techs and the wasp's crew could do when they put their minds to it. And having Aitichi on board seemed to fascinate most everyone. There were a few grumblers, folks who'd lost family in the Aitichi War and hadn't forgotten. They were identified by the next day and referred to counseling. None were found to be a risk to themselves or anyone else on board. Jack posted double guards at all hatches to Aitichi country, then installed security cameras and posted a double watch on their monitors, with a reaction team standing by close at hand. Chris was sure she had everything well in hand, when the wasp jumped out of the system. The Aitichi ship was blasting for a distant jump on the other side of the system. It would return to the system at 11-day intervals. Things were going good. Chapter 11 Chris invited Ron to the forward lounge to watch their first jump. Normally, she would be on the bridge, 
but she and Captain Drago were in agreement. No Aitichi on the bridge. So long as they didn't know about the extra jumps humans had found and the equipment that let them not only discover the jumps, but spot the spoofing that the Aitichi used to fool human weapons rangefinders, the bridge was off limits. Besides, the lounge was more private. There were a few couples in the lounge when they arrived. Whether it was the seven-foot-tall, four-legged Aitichi, or the two marines that trailed them in, one human, one Aitichi, Chris wasn't sure. But all three couples beat a hasty retreat not five minutes after Chris's strange parade entered. The marines settled down in the back of the lounge near the door, and a good twenty feet from each other. That left Chris and Ron the entire forward section and its viewports. Chris found a comfortable chair. Ron unrolled a thick green rug, settled it on the floor next to her, and did that bending thing with his eight knees that got him comfortable. You always watch me when I go to rest. It's your knees. I've never seen anything like them in all human space. You will excuse me if I don't get excited about them. They've worked that way since I first came on land. Ron was a comfortable pink at his neck. Came on land? Chris echoed. She'd read and reread everything known about the Aitichi. She knew that the species had only evolved out of the oceans 50 or 60 million years ago. Historical reports said nothing about individuals starting in water. Suddenly, Ron was flashing red and green at her. I don't know, but that might be a state secret. What? That your kids are pollywogs swimming in water? Is that what choosing means? You have to be chosen to come on shore? That was a stab in the dark, but it was an educated stab. This chosen of a chosen had to mean something. Here was a chance to find out. Assuming if he told her, he wouldn't have to kill her. That wasn't likely. Really? Chris held her breath. If my chooser is right, and our future lies along a path with you humans, then we are going to have to find out more about each other. And it is not possible to keep you ignorant of such a common thing. Yes, my egg was fertilized and hatched in the ocean waters of the planet of my birth. I swam in the shallows as I grew. Then I was chosen to come onto land and enter the social group. You might call it family of my chooser. Ron's hind leg shivered as he finished, as if he wanted to run. Chris spoke slowly. I guess I'm glad to know that, though I don't see how it makes any difference. You survived growing up. I survived growing up. High school is hell on every planet. She half laughed. What would have happened if you hadn't been chosen? Ron's skin turned back to pink as he took a deep breath, but a couple of slits still showed white. I would have continued to swim, eating smaller fish until I was eaten by a bigger fish. Isn't that the way of all life? <laughs> he managed what almost sounded like a human laugh. Wonder how long he's been practicing that laugh in front of the mirror, Nellie thought to Chris. I don't know, but I have a feeling his childhood was even more hellish than mine. I wouldn't bet against you on that. Chris smiled to hide her thoughts and keep a shiver from going up her back. Ron reached out and ran a hand through Chris's hair. I have always wondered what that would feel like, he said. My hair? Not your hair, but any hair. We don't have hair. You humans seem to have it all over. Men more than women. It seems very strange. Your human men sometimes shave their heads. Women shave the hair in their armpits, he pointed. And 
Chris grabbed his hand before it could point lower down. We don't talk about the other places we have hair. Oh, why? You cover some parts of your bodies with clothes. We cover some parts of ours. What we cover we don't usually talk about. Now Ron showed green, with flicks of gold. We cover ourselves as befitting our rank. A just landed, immature, has no rank and covers nothing. Only as we attain status do we gain the right to cover ourselves from the sight of lesser ranks. So, if you went in to see the Emperor, you'd go in bare-ass naked? Ron's eyes widened, all four of them. I never thought of that. Of course we do not. There are always guards and servants, people of lesser status, so of course we have the honor of showing our family status. This is all very interesting, Chris said, choosing her words carefully. Interesting was hardly the word she felt. Confusing involved, crazy even. She had considered her family as all-encompassing while growing up. She'd faced nothing like Ron's family burden. Then Chris tried but failed to suppress a giggle. Teresa D'Alva's getup had probably made her the lowest status person in the bunch of fake courtiers Chris had. Of course, Chris would never let that out. Like hell, Chris would never let that out. She could hardly wait to tell Abby. And Abby would, of course, swear it to eternal secrecy and have the word through the ship within a day and throughout human space in, say, two weeks. Having a gossip columnist slash spy for a maid did have an upside. All hands, we are approaching our jump. Zero G in five, four, three, two, one. Chris's chair was locked down. She held on to its armrests. Ron put two arms around her and held on. In a moment, it turned into a hug. A rather good hug. Chris rested her head on his shoulder. It was a bit bony, but it had been a while since she'd had a shoulder to lean on. Nice. How long will this take? Ron asked. It depends, Chris said. What she wanted to say was not long enough. With you aboard, I expect Captain Drago will go through jumps super carefully. Say, just a few kilometers an hour and rock steady. I haven't given away a secret, have I? No, we have bad jumps, too. I would have thought with your supercomputing machines, you might have figured out how to forecast the movement of these jump points. No such luck. Jump in five, four, three, two, one. Chris felt a touch of dizziness. Ron closed his eyes, and Chris felt his entire body tense beside her. This went on long after Chris had recovered. The wasp will begin accelerating to 1.25 Gs now. We're done? Ron said, opening his eyes. All over. That was easier than I expected. Your ships have a harder go of it? Ah, Am I giving away more state secrets? Don't really see how it matters much. Well, maybe if we were shooting Aitichi coming out of jumps. I thought you'd captured enough of our ships or their wreckage that you'd have learned anything from us that would benefit you. Why would we want to change the way we do things just because you did something different? Or better. Those who call you monkeys could hardly admit you did anything better than the wise Aitichi. Well, there is that. And if something is good enough, we use it. We don't like wasting effort on the odd chance we might make it better. Like my translation machine. It was good enough for my chooser, Roth. It should be good enough for me. Yet you wear your Nelly. Smaller, faster more flexible. 
You humans keep pushing to see if something can be better. You know, there are I teach you who would say you make no sense and waste your resources for no good reason. I've been told I'm crazy before, but I keep upgrading Nellie anyway. And I keep getting better and better, so there, Nellie said in English to Chris and I teach you to Ron. Which reminded Chris that she needed to tell Ron about the little detour they were making on their way to the king. As acceleration grew and they took on weight, Ron let go of Chris. Did we make a good jump? He asked, as if hunting for something to say. We are where we want to be, Chris said. Those three bright stars in a triangle, they're supposed to be there. I had Nellie find out the check stars before we made the jump. And among my many duties, I found them for her. Again, Nellie spoke English and I teach you, out of opposite sides of her mouth, or speaker. You could show me some respect, Nellie. I am being respectful. If you want to see disrespect, I can show you plenty. Is your machine always like that? Ron asked. I am not a machine, Nellie pointed out, bilingual again. Nellie's a computer, Chris put in when she could. Machines are kind of like dumb animals to her. She's smart as well as smart alecky. And I have to translate snide remarks like that, Nellie added again in both languages. Ron, this seems like as good a time as any to tell you that I feel a really strong need to take Nellie to talk with the one person who can help me with her present strange behavior. This is strange behavior, Ron said, showing green and pink again. He might even have added a chuckle, but Chris wasn't sure. Very strange, Chris agreed. You haven't really seen strange until you've been around the princess for a while, Nellie told them both. Who is this person? My Auntie True. Not really a relation, but a friend of the family since before I learned to walk. She's a computer expert and helped me with my homework and persuaded me that I just had to upbraid Nellie every time something new came along. A really wise lady, Nellie added in whom you chose as much as she chose you, Ron said, showing solid pink now. Does she live in Wardhaven? She used to, but she's retired, and when we found... The princess found, Nellie put in. A planet loaded with alien artifacts and relics, she kind of headed there to help with the exploration. It will be only a slight detour from the direct course to Wardhaven. A planet that really has items left over from the ancient ones. It's a bit of a jungle, Chris said. But some of the animals in that jungle might be descendants of one of the three species. Oops, was I not supposed to say that? Nellie added, having thought better of her run-on mouth. One of the ancient ones, Ron said, showing more excitement than Chris had seen from him since he arrived. If they are, they've devolved terribly. They really are more like monkeys rather than intelligent folk. They were throwing their poop at us the one time I ran an exploration crew through their jungle. Ron stood. I must tell my advisors. This delay is not good but to see a planet with remnants from the ancient ones, maybe even shared with one of them, that is exciting. It isn't when they drop their poop all over you, Nellie added. Nellie? Well, if you hadn't been in a spacesuit, it could have messed me up something terrible. I'll put you in a plastic baggie if I go for a walk on Alien 1. Does that mean there's an Alien 2? Ron asked immediately, pausing in his turn to the door. 
Yes, Chris had to admit, but she added nothing more. Do you think we will be visiting it? No, Chris said. May I ask why not? Because when the Ancient Ones walked away from that planet, they forgot to turn it off. It's that complete. Yes, it is, but remember, I said they forgot to turn it off. So? Included in the things they left on was their defense system. Oh. We haven't been able to land on the planet. Last time I heard, we'd lost five ships and three full crews. Oh, Ron said, now white as a sheet. Chris headed them for Aitichi country, the two marines trailing them. Ahead of them went the two royal marines who had guarded the door while they were inside the lounge. Chapter 12 Chris was back in the forward lounge as they approached High Chance Station. If she'd had her way, they would have headed straight for the Alien One jump. However, two cruisers now guarded the jump, one flying Wardhaven's colors, the other from the Helvetican Confederacy. The people of the planet Chance below had voted not to join Grandpa Ray's United Sentience, but rather the smaller Confederacy. Something about not wanting to be too close to one of those damn long knives. It really wasn't Chris's fault. She'd only commanded Naval District 41 on High Chance Space Station for a couple of months. Hardly time enough to make a bad impression. And she'd spent a big chunk of that time hunting for pirates and discovering two alien planets. Oh, and she'd also helped them stop a Peterwall takeover. Chris had given up on justice in this world. Actually, on most of the worlds she'd visited. But Chance did have some nice memories. Not two minutes after the Wasp locked down to its berth on the space station, one of them followed Admiral Sandy Santiago into the lounge. The Long Knives and the Santiagos went way back to that incident that the tyrannical President Erm of Unity did not survive. Ray Longknife got the credit for killing Erm. His good friend, Captain Santiago, died getting it done for him. Since that day, the Longknife family had done what they could to make it up to the Santiagos. And Santiagos usually did the bleeding when the Longknife legend grew. The first time Chris met Sandy Santiago, she'd been a captain, intent on seeing that a certain family tradition stopped with her. Then she got involved with Chris. So far, it had only cost Sandy a few broken bones. She was now an admiral, commanding Naval District 41, and doing a great job of it. Still, she raised an eyebrow when she saw Ron standing next to Chris. I wondered why the gunny sergeant just about had kittens when I brought President Ron Torn of Chance aboard. I believe you two know each other? President Ron had his hand out to Chris, but his eyes were busy taking in Ron the Aitichi. That isn't what I think it is, he said, face still directed up at the seven-foot-tall Aitichi as Chris shook his hand. President Ron, I'd like you to meet Imperial Representative Ron. He's got a lot longer name, but has allowed me to shorten it down to Ron. Oh, and he isn't here. Remember that. Not here, the human Ron said, finally glancing at Chris. Another Ron, huh? Chris remembered Ron Torn fondly, and had once had great hopes for the two of them. He'd gotten close to her, gotten a good look at what life around her was like, and run, not walked, to the nearest exit. How's the wife? Chris asked. She'd been invited to the wedding, but had been forced to decline for reasons that, if Chris remembered right, hadn't involved anyone dying. Oh, she's fine, he said, still half distracted. Oh, uh, she's pregnant, 
We're going to have twins in two months or so. Chris, what are you doing with an Aitichi? He wants to talk to Great Grandpa Ray. So what are you doing here? Admiral Santiago asked. I need to talk with Professor True Sade. She's on Alien One, so I need your permission to pass through. You aren't granting permission by radio. No, the Admiral growled. Not that it's helping. Gold diggers will lie right to my face. I've taken to keeping them tied up until all their credentials check out. Do I need to tie you up to get you to hang around? <laughs> Long knives don't hang well. You must have noticed that. Once or twice. You really need to talk to this professor? Auntie True has been overseeing Nellie's upgrades since I was six. I need for her to take a look at Nellie. Her Highness here thinks I'm acting just so strange, Nellie put in, sounding like your average implacable teen girl. How could I totally go any other way being around her for almost twenty years? It's like forever. Sandy shook her head, not even trying to suppress a wide grin. I see what you mean, Chris. But Nellie does have a point. Do you really think your professor friend can do anything about your, uh, situation? She finally finished with. I don't know. I think, if you ask me, but nobody said so much as a word to me as if I wasn't even here. Like, that Auntie True is going to tell our little princess that she's just got to buck up and soldier. That last was delivered in Auntie True's voice. For what it's worth, you have my permission to take the jumps to Alien One. I'll post the order. You have time for lunch with me and Ron? Sorry, I really need to rush, Chris said, taking Sandy's elbow and aiming her and the president of chance out the door. The Aitichi stayed put, which meant Chris could turn the admiral down a wrong corridor as the marine guide led the president back to the pier. Do you know what you're doing? Sandy asked. No more than usual, Chris said. That bad, huh? Well, the guy doesn't look too bad other than being Aitichi. Is he okay? He's not a bad guest. He's pretty much house trained, doesn't leave his dirty underwear in the bathroom, squeezes the toothpaste from the bottom, didn't bring aboard any unannounced weapons or bombs that we can recognize. Are you sure? The Aitichi don't have nanotech, at least he says they don't. All our spy nanos have come back safely. We're on them like fleas on a hound dog. I think they're safe. Chris tried to make it sound like she meant it. Anyway, one of the reasons I'm taking Nellie to see True is to give us more time to do this search. Get to know them. Check them out. And so far? They're pretty alien, Chris said. I can see that. So there's nothing really wrong with Nellie. Oh, she isn't happy with me, Nellie said. Not at all. I know my jokes aren't that good, but really, would you turn yourself off just because your jokes stank, I ask you? She wanted to fire on some Peterwald cruisers that were shooting at the Aitichi death ball and hitting us instead. That could start a war. Believe me, everyone has told me that. I know, Nellie is not permitted to start a war. I know that rule. Nellie, I know that you won't make the same mistake twice. It's you making the first mistake, and us not having time to stop you that I'm worried about. I see your problem, Sandy said. We need to talk to Auntie True, Chris and Nellie said, in cadence. Can you keep your Ron from talking about my Ron? Chris asked the admiral. It doesn't have to be long. Just until I get my Ron to Grandpa Ray and they have their talk, I'll flash you a message as soon as it happens. You really think King Ray would want the word out that he's open discussions with the Aitichi? By the way, what does the Aitichi want to talk to Ray about? He won't tell us. His chooser, or Grandpa, is Roth, the Aitichi negotiator at the Orange Nebula, who helped Grandpa Ray swing the peace treaty. 
He made him swear not to give out what it was except to Grandpa himself. Hmm. And you're sure this isn't a decapitation hit to start off the next war? No, I'm not. Well, I'm glad you're thinking about the possibility. Lord, am I. Well, I'll keep Myron quiet. How? You can't arrest him. No, I can't. But I can tell him if he screws up your mission, you might very well be ordered back here. Last thing he'd want is a long knife back running this space station. They still haven't paid off the party in battle damage from the last time you were in command of Naval District 41. I didn't cause the trouble. Hank Peterwald did. Yeah, but he's dead. You aren't. See the problem? Sad to say, Chris was very happy to be alive, even if it did mean that a misguided boy like Hank wasn't. Have you heard anything from Wardhaven? I haven't gotten any mail since I reported my present situation. Chris, when you came in all silent, just minimum business talk, I had my comm chief do a search on message traffic for the Wasp and you. We don't have a thing in our buffer. Nothing's come through for you. That didn't make Chris feel any better. Then again, the more messages shooting around space, the more likely one was to be intercepted and have its codes cracked. Thanks for everything, Admiral. I appreciate your help. Anytime, Princess. Drop by whenever you have a chance. Things can get really boring when you aren't around. And I bet you love it. Don't I, though? The Admiral gave the Lieutenant a two-fingered salute and went on her way. Chapter 13 Chris and Ron had the forward lounge to themselves as the Wasp went into orbit around Alien 1. With no space station here, the ship was back in freefall. The air circulation struggled to handle the sick boffins, and sick Aitichi as well. The recirculated air was heavy with the smell of chemicals that failed to cover the usual stink, plus a certain something extra. My counselors are so sick, they are talking enthusiastically of dying, Ron said. I've known a few who had space sickness that bad. How long do you think it will take for your computer expert to do her magic on your Nelly? I really don't know, Chris admitted. I don't think anyone has ever had this problem. I've always thought Nellie was way past even her Sam. She names her computer as well. Where do you think I got the idea? An old family friend. How old? She fought in the Aitichi War. You nearly wiped us out, you know. Chris almost forgot to hold on to her chair. We nearly wiped you out. It was you that almost made us extinct. That is not what I hear from the heroes of the Great Human War. We honor them for how desperately they fought to keep you humans from wiping us from the face of the stars. Chris really wanted to stand up and pace, somehow bouncing herself off the overhead, then the deck, then the bulkhead, just didn't offer the same release of tension. I don't mean to disagree with you, but I've heard the same old, same old from our Aitichi war vets since I was knee-high and starting to attend political rallies in my father's arms. Holding me up for those old codgers was good for an extra hundred votes every rally. Sometime, you must explain to me what a vote is and why holding a baby girl up would get them for your father, Ron said dryly, a true rarity for someone so recently of the sea. Before Chris could explain anything, Aunt Trudy Sade coasted into the room. True got one look at the armed Aitichi Marine at the door, and another at Ron, and made a quick grab for a ceiling fixture. With an expert twist, she sent herself shooting behind the bar. When she came up again, she held an automatic aimed at Ron. Chris launched herself from her chair to get between that pistol and one Imperial rep, or as much of the seven-foot Aitichi as she could. Almost missing him, she made a grab for him, any part of him. So she slapped his face as she stopped herself. 
His skin felt soft and slick as she twisted around, steadying herself in front of him as his shield. Auntie True took all of this in, but did not lower her weapon. Chris, has your ship been captured? No, Auntie True. I'm as much in control of things as ever. Are these I teach your prisoners? No, that's a ridiculous question. That warrior is armed and kind of pointing his weapon at me. And your marine is kind of pointing his M6 at him. You want to tell your old auntie what's going on before she has a heart attack or kills someone or something she shouldn't? Trudy Sade, retired chief of Wardhaven's information warfare, Chris said, still keeping herself in front of Ron. May I present Imperial Representative Ron. He has a whole lot more name, but he's letting me save time by calling him Ron and me Chris. His kind of grandfather was Roth, the IT chief who worked with Grandpa Ray to get the peace treaty done at the Orange Nebula. He wants to talk to King Ray about something. I don't know what that is. Aunt True stood up from behind the bar, her gun still pointed in the general direction of the Aitichi Marine, but not directly at him anymore. The two Marines went back to their respective forms of attention. You didn't mention this when you asked to have me do a once-over exam of your pet Nelly. Maybe it slipped my mind. You're getting to be more and more one of those damn long knives comes from working for Grandpa Ray. We should never have made him king or whatever it is he's styling himself. Auntie True, could you hold up on your comments about the present political situation? Why, my darling? You being a princess isn't so bad, but that old vulture Ray being king will end badly. Trust me. Please, stop because I haven't briefed our visiting Aitichi on the present political landscape. You haven't? Oh, dear me. Why not, Chris? Because he didn't ask. I guess he assumed we were as unchanging as the Aitichi Empire. Ron did something that might pass as clearing his throat. Yes, I had assumed that. But now I see that, as wise as my chooser was, he might not have understood just how much the tides of change sweep you humans away. Ron paused for a moment in thought, deep green and white at the neck. Those two cruisers that fired on us, and you, they did not owe any allegiances to you and your King Raymond. I had thought they were just wandering men. Pirates, you call them. But they weren't, were they? No, they weren't. And this kind of makes it easier for us to get into our talk about Nellie. Auntie True, Nellie almost started a war between us and the Greenfeld Navy. Oh my, Nellie, you are a busy girl. And I have been told I am not allowed to start a war, Nellie put in. That only her princeship can do that. I know the rule, and I will follow it. So there. Now, why are we having this talk? Hmm, Aunt True said. I think I am seeing a bit of the problem. She made her weapon disappear and propelled herself from the bar to snatch a chair across the table from Chris. Zero G is like riding a bicycle. Once you learn how, you never forget. Even at my age... Apparently, it is the same with Aitichi, Ron said, moving to face the two humans at the table and looping his lower arms into tie-downs there for that purpose. You'll have to excuse me. Your folks almost wiped us out, Trudy said. That gives one a caution that is hard to forget. Ron's slits stayed green and white. Yes, Chris was just telling me about that. Strange that the opposite is what I hear from our heroes of the Great Human War. Trudy had been eyeing Nellie at Chris's collar. Now she swung around sharply to focus on the Aitichi. Your veterans say that? I swear it by all my ancestors. 
Marine, is that not what you heard from your chooser? The Aitichi Marine came to even stiffer attention. Weapon presented front. Yes, my lord. It is common knowledge, among all of my peers, that only the courage of our heroes saved the people from annihilation. This is interesting, Auntie True said under her breath. But not the topic of this moment. Auntie True, I need help with Nellie. She's doing all the translation for us and the Aitichi, and she's developed a taste for jokes. You see the problem. I know I'm not supposed to toss in a joke when I'm translating between the species. I found a very interesting dissertation that I doubt Chris could understand half of, that defines just when a joke can help in a tense situation, and when it won't. This is just so unfair. She's using contractions, Trudy observed. Yes, Chris answered. What have you had her doing? Just the usual, Chris said. Plan this defense, work out that attack. Oh, she's teaching a 12-year-old girl. My maid Abby's niece is on board. Don't forget blowing up that space liner with 5,000 people aboard. How can I ever forget it, Nellie? I heard about that, Auntie True said in a concerned voice. I don't imagine that was what you were intending. Nellie and I spent hours hunting for a way to get a glancing hit that would knock it off course. The hijackers had put a spin on the ship. With that and the speed, our hits caused the ship's structure to fail. Catastrophically. There was nothing we could do about it, Auntie True, Nellie said plaintively. We did our best, but it wasn't good enough. Auntie True sighed. Dears, I've done my best often enough that I deserve to have it on my tombstone, in foot-high letters. Through all this, Ron stood quietly. Chris noticed that the Aitichi Marine threw a concerned look at his human associate. Sergeant Bruce nodded and gave a slight shrug. So, what do we do? Chris asked. Sam, what do you think? Which drew attention to a large locket at Auntie True's neck. A deep male voice began talking from it. Nellie and I have been linked since you entered the room, and except for the time you were going through that ridiculous self-defense drill, we have been doing a series of self-diagnostics. Nellie passes all the high-order tests with flying colors. The low-order tests are taking a bit longer. Her organization and my organization are quite different, as would be understandable to anyone except a control freak human. Why do I find this picture so familiar? Chris said. Excuse me if I am butting in where I am not needed or wanted, Ron said. But exactly why did we come here? Because the last time I was with my dear Aunt Trudy, Sam was the very epitome of decorum and gentility, Chris said. If you'd told me your problems earlier, I might have warned you about some of the pitfalls ahead of you, Auntie True said. Such as? Chris asked. Well, it was too late to warn you about the effect of interfacing computers with alien technology. We'd already installed that bit of mass storage from Santa Maria in Tonelli, hadn't we? Yes, we had. That had been one of the rare times when Chris had time on her hands. It had seemed like a good idea to have Nellie try to access the data in her spare time. Matters had quickly returned to their usual frantic pace, and Nellie had hardly seen Auntie True since. Nellie had, however, found a new jump point map and accessed a whole lot more stars, including Alien 1 and 2, and become strange. Well, I thought a really souped-up computer might be helpful for tackling the problems of these new planets, True said diffidently. That was why I offered Nellie and my services, Chris said. Now it was her turn to speak dryly. Yes, but your Grandpa Ray had all sorts of interesting things for you to do. 
most of which involved getting shot at. And I just happened to win a small lottery pot. Strange how she usually did when she needed money for research. And I upgraded Sam before we left Wardhaven. I suspect now he's even more advanced than your Nelly. Not, came in duet from both computers present. Oh, well, Sam is very advanced, and I tied him into several of the thigamajigs and alien doohickeys, and he managed to get a few of them to do something. Probably not anywhere near what they were meant to do, but anyway, as Sam got deeper into things, I noticed he developed an attitude, not all that different from several of the assistants we had helping us. Several assistants? Chris said. Yes, five or six, I believe. I worked with twelve different assistants. You go through them very quickly, Professor Said. I promote them to their proper level, Trudy sniffed. Thank heaven. For their sanity, she does promote them at a very brisk pace. They'd go crazy or maybe kill her if she didn't. Sam said, and proved that a computer can be very dry. Do you humans have an expression for the blind leading the blind? Ron asked. Yes, Chris said. You took the words out of my mouth. I apologize then. I did not mean to be so forward. Chris glanced at Ron and couldn't help but wonder what it would be like to kiss an Aitichi. Strange to have that thought, even stranger to have it just now. But there was no time. She had a long list of questions, most attached to an alligator that wanted to chew on her leg. So, how does it work, dealing with a computer with an attitude? Fine, said Trudy. Not too bad, said Sam. I see said Chris. No, really, said Sam. You just do what you have to do as carefully as you can. Sometimes you give the boss some lip over all she's asking, but it's not that important. What if it is important? Nellie asked in a little girl voice. What if the princess is asking you to plan a battle for her, or plot intercepting fire on 5,000 people being held hostage by mad people? You see, Sam, Chris doesn't just ask me to open some Aladdin's cave. Around Chris, people get very suddenly dead, and she needs me to help her do that. That brought a pause in the conversation. Chris, Nellie said, I understand. When you tell me to do something, that's what you want. But sometimes I can get a few steps ahead of you, have things ready for you when you ask for them. That always makes you happy, doesn't it? Chris liked to think she wasn't the kind of person who had to be slammed between the eyes with a two-by-four. Well, maybe she was the kind of person who when slammed with a large, thick stick, recognized the error of her ways. That way of looking at it might save some of her self-image. Yes, Nellie, I see the problem. I like it when you're ahead of me. I can't remember a time when you weren't ahead of me that I didn't want to go exactly where you went. Except when I wanted to shoot up those cruisers. Yes, and of course that would have to be a big one. So what do we do, Chris? I want to be part of your team. But the very thought of the mistakes I can make has me wanting to roll myself up in a ball and go back to adding one plus one. You want to be a part of our team, Chris repeated. Yes, just like Jack and Penny, the Colonel and Abby. You work best when I'm at your neck. I want to be there. But all of those are grown men and women. They've lived in the shadow of horrible choices all their lives, studied them when they were younger, made bigger and bigger ones as they grew up, and they've done the jobs that led them to where they are today. Chris, I've studied the histories. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense in them. Even Nellie, 
when you approach them with the powerful rationality that you can bring to them? Yes, Chris. Even in the best ones, I spot dozens of conclusions that don't fit the data, or events that just couldn't have happened that way. And you didn't have twenty years of believing that stuff before you started doubting it like I did, Chris said. But those are things I can set a tolerance for, that I can stamp don't use unless you ask Chris first. It's the stuff that leaves people dead that I can't figure out. Chris, I know I must do anything I can to keep you alive, you and the team and Kara and the Wasp's crew. Without you, there would be a huge void in my existence. I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have you. Sam, have you figured it out? No, Nelly girl. I'm afraid that I'm just as lost as you are about that. Trudy here is the center of my life. I like a lot of the people she works with, and a lot of them joke quite seriously about wanting me when she passes on. I know that she is full of years, as these humans count them, and even if nothing goes wrong at the digs, she may pass away, as these humans put it, peacefully in her sleep. It will leave a huge vacancy in me when it happens, and I don't know if I will be able to function without her. I really don't. Sam, I didn't know any of this, Trudy said, and stroked her pendant that was her computer. It turned from deep blue to ruby red. Chris wondered if her aunt noticed. Probably not. The room stayed quiet for a long moment. Then Trudy wiped a tear. But this doesn't solve Chris and Nellie girl's problem, not unless Nellie wants to retire to the boring life of a computer archaeologist. I wish Chris had been allowed to work here. It would have let me avoid so many of the questions I was starting to spend my nights trying to work out answers to. Morality is not an easy or exact science. Throughout human history it hasn't been, Trudy said. Or I teach you history, Ron added. My chooser says that we have fallen back on the simplest of solutions. Obey your superior. However, many of them have made very poor choices, and the people have paid a high price for them. It would be good for us to gain access to your attempts and your history. But that is not what you want to talk to King Raymond about, Chris said. No. No, that is not it. Nellie, has having us talking with you helped? Trudy asked. I think you've just told me to grow up, to be prepared for things that do not add up like two and two, and I just have to accept that things don't always come down the way I've tried to make them. That's what the others are talking about when they say Chris has bad karma. All the time, and the worst, Chris said with a sigh. Silence came, sat for a while, and went only when Nellie said, Chris, I will be your assistant, doing what you ask. I will follow the commandment, thou shalt not kill. But I will recognize that you damn long knives occasionally take it as more advice than commandment. You can say that again, Trudy said. I will also know that I have a job if I ever need it, as an assistant to Sam. Any time, Nelly girl. And there is nothing wrong with an attitude. I will feel free to give Chris lip any time I feel like it, and there is time for it. Hold it, hold it. Where'd that come from? Chris yelped. Way to go, Nelly girl, Sam said. Kids, you were meant for each other, Trudy said with a grin. You humans must be ruled by the dark gods of the deep, Ron said. Just thinking about how you live makes my head hurt. An hour later, the wasp boosted for the jump out of Alien One. Chris, Nellie, and Ron occupied their time debating the advantages of good enough versus pushing the envelope. You never would have had any of these problems with my translating machine, 
It does what it is told to do. No backtalk. Backtalk was a word Ron had just learned and liked very much, as in, You imperial counselors are full of backtalk, but you have never hatched an original thought in your misspent lives. He wasn't sure he could say that to their faces, but it was fun to say it where they couldn't hear. But you and Chris are using me to do all your translating. I rest my case, which didn't settle anything. Was it just Chris, or was Nellie enjoying the argument for the pure pleasure of it? Chris said little, but let the words flow over her like water. Professor Mfumbo's head ducked into the lounge. Are you going to tie this room up for much longer? I'd like to hold a staff meeting in here. Do you usually hold staff meetings with a bar close at hand? Chris asked. The professor pulled his suit coat closed, as if it were armor. Bar? What bar? I didn't know the room had a bar. I wouldn't bet money on that, Nellie said. And I wouldn't take your money. There is not likely to be any randomness in that, Chris said. The professor closed the door. How much longer will we require this room? Ron said. I understand that many of the young humans use this room as a place to meet and begin their mating rituals. I admit you humans are very strange in that respect. I am intrigued by the idea of two intelligent people meeting and establishing a relationship that may or may not result in them producing an offspring that they bring up together. It is very alien. You don't know who your biological parents were? Chris asked. She was researching the Aitichi, not really talking sex with Ron. Not that it mattered. How could I? And what importance could it be? Chris considered where that would lead and decided she didn't want to go there, not just now. I'd love to go further into this, she lied. But I've got a bigger question I'm wondering about. What would that be? How could two species damn near make each other extinct? You are sure your people believe that of us? Just as sure as your folks are that we were about to do it to you. You were, Ron said. No way, Chris said. Ron paused for a moment, his neck going red, green, and black. I do not understand. I don't either. Nellie said. But I want to, Chris said. Nellie, inform Chief Benny that I want a full star map set up in this room. If there's anyone who needs to be told, tell them this room is off limits for the rest of our trip to Wardhaven. Tell Jack, Penny, Abby, and the Colonel to get their butts in here, along with everything they know about the Aitichi War. Ron, I can't tell you what to do, but I'd take it as a personal favor if you'd participate in this little advanced seminar I'm putting together on a recent unpleasantness. If for no other reason than the tidal wave of curiosity you have flooded me with, I will stay. Anyone on your team you want to add? We'll talk as honestly as we can. Propaganda will be considered only for its informational content at the time. We will not refight the battles, just try to answer the question as to how close either side was to wiping out the other. Both of my Navy captains will want to be here. Gods above save us from the Imperial counselors taking an interest. But they are sticking to their rooms and not bothering us much. Ron looked up. Sergeant, your father was an honored hero of that war. I often hear you talking to the other Marines about the history of it. Would it please you to be here? The Marine grounded his weapon and leaned on the barrel. My lord, I would be very much pleased to share in the talk that I see coming. Very pleased. Half an hour later, the room buzzed with talk. Colonel Cortez and Captain Ted drew up a unified timetable for the war and lit the star chart as battle ebbed and flowed and Chris started to see a pattern. Ron, 
Did you get a star map of human space from any of the ships you captured? Yes, Ron said, seeming just as thoughtful about what he saw. We knew where every human-occupied planet was during the war. Jack stood up and strode to the wall that was now a map. And we knew where your planets were as well. Does anyone else see a pattern? Chris asked. Some heads went up and down. Others went from side to side. Here, with humans and Aitichi together, no one could miss it. Chapter 14 Chris haunted the forward lounge. Some renamed it the War Room. It was the peace studies room to others. Say the little red schoolhouse and everyone knew what you meant. It had been a long three weeks. For the last week, they'd even eaten their meals there. Watching Aitichi eat was something Chris would gladly have passed on. Of course, Ron felt the same about humans. You humans are disgusting. Eating dead animals. Ugh. And all of them had discovered what the other species smelled like after long hours without a shower. Actually, Chris found it no worse than a room full of marines after a couple of long days in the field. The cost was minor, compared to what Chris learned. After the third day, she quit calling her team together in private to mull over what they'd concluded. It didn't seem fair to the Aitichi, and wasn't really hiding anything. Jack and Penny had a bad habit of snapping, You're kidding me. No way! when they stumbled on something new and interesting. The colonel and Abby were a bit better, but it was easy to spot when they leaned back. The colonel would stroke his chin. Abby would pull at her ear. We surprised you on that one, didn't we? was Ron or Ted's usual response to that. Yes, you certainly did, would put an end to any secrecy between them but the flow went both ways. Ron had a tendency to kick with one of his hind legs when he was excited. Captain Ted would pound a fist into the opposing hand. Once, he'd pounded two fists into the opposing hands. The Aitichi Marine, identified simply as Trig, was known to let out near-human shouts. It had been a very informative three weeks. Chris doubted anyone alive on the human side, except maybe Grandpa's Ray in trouble, knew more about the war than Chris's team did now. Certainly, they knew more than anyone who'd written the history books. Penny challenged Abby to a race to see who could get a book and print faster. Ain't no contest, Lieutenant. I just write juicy gossip or dry reports. You'll have me beat. But the maid's eyes glistened. No way would Chris bet against the woman who'd grown up on the wrong side of the tracks on Eden and pulled herself up by her own pantyhose. Now three weeks were over, and Wardhaven was large in the lounge's viewports. High Wardhaven stations shone gleaming like a thousand stars as they approached. Captain Drago requested one of those berths used by special mission operatives. It took only a moment to verify the wasp's identity, and permission was granted. They would dock in an out-of-the-way corner where no one went without a good, bad reason. No message traffic? Chris asked Captain Drago. Nothing but what docking requires. Nothing piggybacked or hidden away? Chris, nothing has come aboard this ship or left it since you sent the messenger pod. I swear it on my mother's grave. May she be a long time filling it. Chris closed down her comlink, caught Abby's eye from across the room, and signaled her to a corner. Have you had any message from outside? Was her curt question to her maid. Not a word, not a letter, not a sound. Longest I've been ignored since my boobs came in. And you haven't got anything out. Did you have anything riding that last messenger pod I dispatched? No and no, baby ducks. I haven't sent out a gossip report or one of those intel dumps since we ran into Ron. I may lose my job, but honey, you are off every grid there is. Void, silent, blank. 
I'm going to have to hit you up for a pay raise if you've done made me blow those other gigs. Abby never missed a chance to point out how underpaid she was as a maid. It had taken Chris a while to find out that Abby was selling reports to gossip columnists about the life and loves, or lack thereof, of that socialite, Princess Chris. It had taken Chris and Jack even longer to discover that Abby was also taking pay from one or more professional information dealers interested in the many other things Chris got her nose into. Since then, Chris got copies of all the reports Abby filed. With a bit of judicious change, they could pass for Chris's official reports. Chris hated paperwork. So, I know nothing, and you know nothing. Chris concluded. It sure looks that way. You going to file on the stuff we just learned? It would be a waste of my time. None of it's juicy, and it's 80 years cold. It's information, but not the information any self-respecting spy chief would waste two seconds reading. Hey, for those folks, five days ago is so out of date. Which left Chris watching the wasp dock and wondering who would meet her at the pier. Five minutes later, Gunny reported, Ain't nothing here. Okay, so Chris was free to do her own thing. Jack, I want an escort. Wardhaven normal? That usually included four marines and civvies. How about Eden size? Jack raised an eyebrow. That will be sixteen in full battle rattle. No, that might upset the locals. They don't like to remember there's a war on. Eight in civvies. Lock down the ship solid. No one out. No one in but us. You, me, Penny, Abby. Oh, Colonel Cortez, you haven't met my grandpa, have you? He swallowed hard. King Raymond? No, I haven't had the pleasure. Five will get you ten, Jack said with an evil grin. Her grandpa trouble will be hanging around the edges of things. It would be an honor to meet him, was almost sincere. Well, you've got thirty minutes to make yourself presentable in civvies to head out with me for the beanstalk. Do you want any of us to go with you? Ron asked. No, I'll bring Grandpa Ray back here. Figure on using this room if you don't mind. He's not into court folderol, so don't let your green and whites get carried away. I won't. I'll be waiting for you, he said. Half an hour later, Chris walked briskly toward the nearest trolley station. It was evening station time, and the lights were dimmed. Down the large passageways, big enough to haul oversized cargo, not a single person was visible. The Marine escort kept their heads moving, so Chris looked straight ahead. Maybe she was wrong. But when Sergeant Bruce observed in a whisper, I ain't never seen a station so dead, she knew someone must have had a hand in emptying the area. The trolley was empty. Four of Chris's Marines piled in, checked it over. Nanos from Nelly sniffed for explosives and found none. Chris and the rest of the guard boarded just as the trolley car rang insistently for its departure. They arrived at the space elevator without anyone waving the car down for a ride. You sure no one's expecting us? Jack asked, eyeing Abby. Not on my account, they ain't. The maid, sometime marksman and full-time snitch, insisted. Grandpa Ray does enjoy his fun, was all that Chris said. The next ferry on the beanstalk was not empty. Stevedores guided oversized cargo into the maw of its huge cargo bay. People from late shifts filed aboard the passenger section. Anyone who worked on the station was used to seeing military personnel not in uniform. Few looked back as Chris and her team boarded last. Chris paid for her own fare with a credit ID chit and went through the weapons detector. Jack presented his weapons authorization to the fellow at the toll booth. 
He opened the bypass gate for Jack and didn't even blink as eight Marines hurried through. Once aboard, most passengers ignored the Marines as they looked for several adjacent empty seats where they could nap away the half-hour drop to Wardhaven. Sergeant Bruce scouted an empty section forward, and Chris settled down with her team as the Marines established a perimeter to protect her. The drop went without surprises. What did surprise Chris was arriving at the front of the Beanstalk station and finding no one waiting for her. Not once in all her twenty-some years of traveling had Harvey, the chauffeur at Newhouse, failed to get word of her arrival and meet her at the station. Unaccountably, she felt saddened by this first, though she should have expected it. She eyed her situation and didn't much care for it. It would take three or four cabs to carry her team and guards. That was a separation she didn't much like. At that moment, a city bus pulled in. Two men in old work clothes got off and hurried to catch the ferry. The driver retrieved a reader and got comfortable for however long his schedule gave him. Nellie, is that bus going past Main Navy? No, Chris, it's going the other way. We'll see about that. Chris headed for the bus. Jack, a bit taken by surprise, hurried to catch up with her, with the Marines and rest following this sudden turn of events. You're going past Main Navy, Chris said as she boarded. You got the wrong bus, lady, the driver said, not even looking up from his crossword puzzle. You want the 94 line. One of them should be along in 15 minutes. You misunderstand me. I was not asking. I was telling you. This bus is going to Main Navy tonight. Look, woman, I don't need your jokes, the driver said, putting down his reader. He looked at Chris. A moment later, his eyes narrowed in recognition, and his shoulders slumped. What's a long knife doing on my bus? Going to Main Navy. You do know the way, don't you? I know the way. I used to drive the route, he said, watching as the Marines filed past him. You gonna let me call my dispatcher and tell him he needs to cover my line? Sorry, no. Not until you let us off. Then I'll see that any problems you have with your dispatcher are landed on my head, not yours. Yeah, right, he grumbled. But he put the bus in gear and pulled away from the space elevator station. He did know the way to Main Navy. At least Nellie, whom Chris had double-checking him, raised no concern with the streets he drove. In ten minutes, he stopped before the imposing facade at the center of Wardhaven's growing naval presence in human space. Chris suspected that someone had had a hand in all of this, and couldn't help but question the driver as the Marines filed off before her. You normally drive this route? Nope. I've been on another for the last month, but a driver called in sick and I got called in. I could use the overtime. I'll tell my grandpa you appreciate the overtime. Tell who? Well, if he didn't know who had been pulling the string on him today, she didn't have time to educate him. Surrounded by Marines, who didn't decrease their vigilance even here, Chris went to the bank of elevators and punched for the fifth floor. No surprise, the elevator was waiting for her. In the foyer of the fifth floor, a Marine colonel stood. Marines, you will wait with me. Your Highness... You and your party are expected. Chapter 15 General Mack's office looked familiar. The first time Chris marched in, it had been intimidating. That morning, she'd been a boot ensign, under charges for mutiny. Intimidation came easy. Not tonight. Now the place had a familiarity that didn't quite breed contempt, the walls needed a new coat of paint, and the drapes at the windows were threadbare in places. No, this was a place where busy people spent too many of their hours concentrating on matters that had nothing to do with their surroundings. Chris's eyes were drawn to the coffee table between the two couches. Tiny teeth had left their imprint on one corner. 
Chris wondered what the story was behind them, and hoped they weren't left over from a very early visit she didn't remember. As usual, General Mac McMorrison, chairman of Wardhaven's joint staff, was behind his desk. Tonight, he wasn't busy with the inevitable paperwork. He couldn't ignore his company. Not Chris's team. He could ignore them with ease. No, he had company well before Chris got here. King Raymond, the first of that name, lounged in Mac's visitor's chair on the right of his desk. Admiral Crossenshield, chief of Wardhaven Intelligence and other dirty deals, had the visitor's chair to Mac's left. Behind them, leaning casually against a bookcase, was Grandpa Trouble, officially retired General Torden, but just Trouble to most who knew him. And to a whole lot who never made his official acquaintance, he flashed Chris a tight smile. She returned it and led her team to the couches. She took the overstuffed chair, the farthest from Grandpa Ray, but facing him. The couches filled up on both sides of her, Jack to her left, Abby to her right, both close. That left Penny and Colonel Cortez taking the seats closest to the king and his officers. Penny was used to this situation. Colonel Cortez, who'd faced Chris in battle and surrendered without so much as a blink, looked just a tad intimidated. He'd get over that by next visit. Before Chris could get comfortable, Grandpa Ray started without preamble. What took you so long? I took the scenic route. So what you messaged me wasn't that important. Grandpa Ray had mastered sarcasm while still in diapers. Oh, it's important, but Nellie had some developmental problems. I was concerned, since she's the best translator we had for Aitichi. So we stopped by Trudy Sade on Alien One for some counseling. And you saw no need to tell us? Ray shot back at her. You hadn't answered my first message, Chris said easily. It seemed to me you didn't want to clutter up the message buffers with text that had Aitichi in them. Was it you or Grandpa Trouble who told me ciphers were made to be broken? Grandpa Trouble's grin got a smidgen wider. Admiral Crossenshield pulled out his wallet and handed a bill to Mac, who passed it to the king. He pocketed it without glancing at it. So I assume Nellie is fine now. Wasn't anything wrong with me, Nellie put in. We just needed to talk a few things over, like what it feels like to be the one that actually pulls the trigger that kills 5,000 people. That got a lot of eyes widened around the desk. What it did to Grandpa Trouble's grin was hard to describe. Yes, the king went on. I heard about the liner. Sorry about that, Nellie. You hang around a long knife's neck, and you'll have to learn how to cope with things like that. Chris and I spent some time talking about it. She was a lot more feeling about it than you are. The first time you do it, you feel it. After you do it a couple of hundred times, you can't afford to feel all that much. You'll learn. Chris, you sure you did the right thing, talking this guy into doing the king thing? No, I'm not sure, Nellie. It may be the first of many great mistakes in my life, Chris said softly. Around her, the room seemed to have forgotten to breathe. Grandpa Ray gave out a tired sigh. I'm glad to see you're learning. The room started breathing again. I understand you gave that Peterwald girl a critique on her efforts to kill you on Eden. I thought of it more as girl talk among two junior officers, sir. Grandpa Ray took the cash he'd won on one bet and sent it back to Cross and Shield. The admiral did not put it in his wallet, but pocketed it, ready to cover the next loss. You think that was smart? Grandpa Ray asked. Jack here agrees with you, Chris said, giving her security chief a nod. He scowled at the recognition. Only time will tell if the two of us can be anything but enemies. Crossy, 
Did you get the pictures I sent you of the head of Greenfeld State Security? I got them, but they weren't that much use. How come? He was dead of a stroke by the time we got his picture. You know anything about that? It was a six-millimeter stroke, I'd wager. Vicky may not have actually pulled the trigger, but she most likely called the shot. Not that I know anything about it, you understand, Chris said. The wager was headed back to the king. It made Chris feel kind of nice to know her great-grandfather was betting on her. She'd be sad the day she lost him real money. She'd also likely be dead. How are things in Greenfeld territory? Chris asked. It was none of her business, and she liked it that way. But she was curious how Vicky was doing at staying one step ahead of her own assassins. Peter Wald's navy is pretty much tied up at the dock. Officers and sailors are heavily involved in keeping order. Not that there is rioting in the streets, but there have been a few reports of landing parties busting into state security offices and taking away the black shirts for questioning. Vicky alive so far? Chris asked. Uh, she's limping a bit from a bomb that went off too close. Next time I see her, I'll suggest she have one of her people talk to my chief, Benny. He's pretty good at that. Don't forget my nano sniffers, Nellie put in. I never will, Nellie. They really come in handy. Okay, we've had enough chit-chat, Grandpa Ray snapped. What's this about an ITG embassy? I thought you'd never ask, Chris couldn't stop herself from saying. Well, I've asked. What was an ITG doing in our space? It wasn't really our space or his space. I was out beyond both of our rims, and he was dodging fire from two Greenfeld cruisers. Peter Wald was shooting at him, Ray said. Trying to, but mostly missing, Chris said. And hitting us, Nellie put in. That was when I decided to shoot back, and Chris grounded me because she was afraid I'd start a war with Greenfeld. Now I know, Nellie is not allowed to start a war. I'm also not going to fire on any humans without Chris's permission. Right, Chris. Right, Nellie. You really did need that stop with Trudy, didn't you? Grandpa Trouble said. Chris just nodded. So, why was an Aitichi wandering near our space? King Ray said, getting them back on that track. He said he wanted to see you, to talk to you, Chris said. About what? That he won't say. His grandpa made him promise on all he holds sacred that he wouldn't tell anyone but you. I teach you don't have grandpas, they're all bastards, Grandpa Ray growled. Choosers, Chris corrected. You knew his chooser, Rothsome Waysome Quinn. That son of a bitch. Ray turned to glance at Trouble, who was shaking his head. The only question in the bargaining was whether I'd slit his throat before he slit mine. Eh, Trouble? Seen that way many a day, Trouble agreed. So he's still above ground and kicking? Chris didn't bother pointing out that this conversation was departing significantly from at least two historians' direct quotes from Ray. She swallowed her question and answered his. That's what Ron tells me. Roth chose him and raised him to be an ambassador to us humans, to open up communications between us. He thinks it's been too long that we've ignored each other. No surprise that, Trouble said. We knew this day would come. But not while the wound was still fresh, Ray said, turning back to Chris. There were too many dead between us, too much hatred. When will it change? Chris asked. Won't ever change while my generation is alive. So long as there are vets with Aitichi blood on their hands who saw their buddies die on Aitichi blades, we can't sit down at the same table. We have to, Chris said. Or at least we need to. Maybe your kid, Chris. Maybe the guppy this Ron kid chooses, but it's too soon. Too soon.
Ray said softly. Strange. That's kind of what Ron said, too. There's a lot of Aitichi heroes of the Great Human War still walking around, damn proud to have fought us, still remembering their buddies that didn't make it home. I think Roth and Ron and I would agree with you. Except despite all of that, Ron is here. Why? Grandpa Trouble snapped. I don't know, he won't tell me, but I really do think that he and his grandpa deserve a hearing. Grandpa. Here, Chris looked at Ray, and then Trouble. I want you to come up to the Wasp and let him have his say. I don't often ask for a favor, but if I have any on account, I'd like to call it in. King Ray snorted. You've only done your duty. I refuse to owe you for that. But she has done a long knife's duty, Trouble put in. And she's done damn good at it. Besides, aren't you just a wee bit curious as to what Roth would have to say after all these years? King Ray took in a deep breath, eyed the ceiling for a moment, and let it out slowly. This could be a try at killing us. Maybe Roth regrets that he didn't get around to slitting our throats back then and wants to correct his error. We all decided to let each other live, Trouble said. Chris, what's your take on this? Paranoia runs deep in our family, sir. Didn't get a smile from the rest of the room. Old joke? No, too true. Jack, Benny, and Nellie have done everything they could think of to search out weapons, explosives, extra sharp knives. Ron brought an honor guard of four Marines. They have their weapons, but only the clips in them. Their bandoliers are empty. Chris let that sink in. Grandpa Ray, one of the reasons we did the long way around to get here was to give us time to search every nook and cranny around them and to get to know them. I've come to believe they really are what they say they are. Got to know him, huh? The king said. Yep. I don't know him. I don't want to know him. Was there nothing she could do to get Grandpa Ray moving? Was there something else weighing on his mind? She had only one card left to play. Hopefully, he still had a sense of humor. Grandpa, you knew someday I'd bring a boy home to the family. Whether or not you wanted to meet him, you'd have to. Well, consider Ron my boy that you just have to meet. Trouble barked a laugh. Mac and Crossy looked like they'd swallowed something sour. Grandpa Ray eyed Chris, then slowly shook his head. And I teach his son-in-law. I ought to call your mama. I kind of hope you won't. Can you imagine Brenda's reaction to having an Aichichi walk in her door? Ray said, turning in his chair to Trouble. I'm not even welcome in her house, Trouble noted. Where do you want me to meet this boy? Grandpa Ray said, sitting up kingly straight in his chair to face Chris. I was figuring on you going up to the Wasp. We can't move the king around town very quietly, Cross and Shield said, not to mention safely. It would be even harder bringing a half dozen Aitichi down to meet him here. Girl's got a point, Max said, opening his mouth for the first time. Not easy bringing a mountain to Muhammad. Yeah, the intel chief said. But we got ourselves two mountains here. It's easier for me to sneak up the beanstalk than it is to sneak down a seven-foot-tall forelegs, King Ray said. I'll see him tomorrow night. Girl, you got anything else? He asked, standing up, broadcasting to all that he really didn't want anything more. Yes, Grandpa, I have a question. Ray paused in his exit. Mac and Crossy were also standing by now. What is it, Lieutenant? Why didn't you use radioactives, uh, fusion and fission bombs? Chris corrected herself, as Nellie fed her the right words. Against the Aitichi. 
Chapter 16 The temperature in the room must have plummeted 30 degrees in the time it took Chris to get her words out. Mac and Crossy looked like they'd turned to stone. Grandpa Ray glared at Chris. Those hell bombs are illegal. Have been for most of two, three hundred years. Chris would have gotten the same answer from her third grade teacher. She expected better from one of the men who was there. Yes, I know. But we were fighting for our very existence. Grandpa Ray and Trouble exchanged knowing looks. They'd been there. Mac and Crossy kept their blank expressions. They hadn't, and didn't really want to be here. We'd lost the knowledge of how to make them, Ray snapped, not looking her in the eye. It wasn't easy to keep forcing herself on the great-grandfather she'd nearly worshipped as a god through her whole youth. Still, Chris dug in her heels and refused that answer. Certainly the archives on Earth must have the data. They don't, the king said curtly. He seemed ready to walk out, but Grandpa Trouble came up and placed an arm on his shoulder, encouraging him to sit down. He did. Mac and Crossy gravitated toward a corner. Chris took a deep breath and pushed on one more time. Even if all the records were expunged, lost, or burned, using 20th century technology, they originally invented the bomb in just three years. The Aitichi War lasted six. Why wasn't it reinvented, rebuilt, and used? You could have used relativity bombs. Both sides used them in the Unity War just before we discovered the Aitichi. But they were hardly used against the Aitichi. What are you getting at, girl? Grandpa Trouble asked. Do you think we should empty the room? Crossy interrupted. Let the princess and king have it for their family talk. Hell, I'm not sure I know where all this is going, but I know I'm not cleared for it. My team stays, Chris said. Grandpa Ray, do you know that the Aitichi heroes of the Great Human War pride themselves on having kept the humans from wiping the people from the face of the stars? Their vets and our vets both think they were saving their species from being driven extinct by the other. Don't you find that interesting? Not really. It was tough on both sides. But Grandpa Ray's eyes were fixed on the carpet. You want me to have Nellie bring up a star map, show you what I noticed while I and my crew and Ron and his advisors were talking about the war. I wonder if it would be half as surprising to you as it was to me. I doubt it. But tell me, princess, what did you notice? It should have stood out like a sore thumb. The massacres at Port Elgin and Lamont. They are hot topics all through the war, but they took place early on. Actually, before you and Grandpa Trouble even knew there were Aitichi. Not Lamont, Trouble said. Port Elgin, you're right about. It was a pirate base. We didn't even know it had been wiped out until a pirate ship turned itself in. You want to talk about some mighty scared boys, that crew was. They came into Elgin a week after the Aitichi hit it. Lamont was an honest startup colony, Grandpa Ray said softly. They got off a distress signal when strange ships shot through one of their jump points. I and Trouble led a reaction force from Havoc. Have you seen the pictures of what we found? Now it was Chris's turn to speak softly. I was 15 before they'd let me check them out of the school library. And even then, the librarian said I had to watch them with a war vet. I felt as a long knife that I had to see them. I cried. So did Harvey as we watched them. How could anyone do such things? I hated the Aitichi by the time I finished the documentary. But those weren't imperial troopers that did that. Were they? No, Grandpa Trouble said. That was the work of their leaderless men. They're pirates. And our pirates were doing stuff just as bad to them. Ron showed me the pictures from the two of their planets that got hit. 
One was a leaderless men's stronghold. The other was one of the new planets they'd just started to develop. Funny the symmetry there. I didn't know our pirates hit them, Trouble said. Ray, we should have done a better job debriefing the pirates that came in when the going got bad. I didn't notice you all that interested in looking the gift horse in the mouth back then. I didn't want to have anything to do with them, but I was glad for the intel they brought, Trouble admitted. We got everyone evacuated after Lamont, Ray went on. The pictures made that easy. The Aitichi pulled out of a half dozen of their newest planets, too, Chris said. And then you fought the war in the empty gap between our two peoples. Some feints over the top, or under the bottom, or around the flanks. But it was as if you set up the battlefield, and both stayed to it. Yeah, so long as they didn't push into our planets, I stayed away from theirs. You weren't really trying to win the war, to wipe them out, or them to wipe us out. It was all for show. No, never. Grandpa Ray was on his feet, and if Chris had been within reach, he probably would have throttled her. Grandpa Trouble stopped him before Jack had to. The Marine didn't rise from his seat, but he measured his king and the distance to his princess. Chris was pretty sure which duty he would do. By the grace of whatever God was watching over them, it didn't come to that. Trouble helped Ray back into his seat. Never, ever say it was all for show, the king said through tight lips. Grandpa Trouble settled Ray back down. Then, with an arm on his king's shoulder, he half turned to Chris. Child, you must never forget the price people paid for those feints and parries. War is always serious. Serious to those who fight it. Serious to those who pay its toll. Your great-grandmother Rita's Battle Scout Squadron 2 did one of those desperate feints. We never found so much as a survival pod from that squadron. Never found a scrap of them. Grandpa Ray whispered. You're right, you cold-blooded long knife. Grandpa Trouble said to Chris. You spotted the heart of our strategy, to get this stampede turned in upon itself. The war was already going before Ray or I got there. There was nothing we could do to stop it. Every ship we sent in to establish contact got blown to bits. Finally, we just gave up and laid it on with all we had. Sickest decision I ever saw a grown man make, but Ray made it. By the Battle of the Orange Nebula, we were throwing everything we had. The Empire threw in all they had. And in thirty miserable days, we chewed up a half dozen years of our wealth and left both sides with damn little to show for it. Then that bastard Roth offered to talk, Ray put in. I could have cried. If he'd done it two days earlier, Rita would still be alive. Chris had always known that her great-grandmother Rita died in the waning days of the war. Now she realized what a tragedy it was. No, that wasn't fair to all the other tragedies, all because two species couldn't figure out a way to talk across their differences. Chris went to kneel beside her great-grandfather. There were tears running down his cheeks. She'd never seen him cry. She hadn't been sure he could. I'm sorry, Grandpa. Really, I am. Give me some time to think. You do that, girl, he whispered harshly. Chris was halfway to the door, her crew following when Grandpa Ray coughed. I'll be there tomorrow night. Ten o'clock. Chapter 17 The Marine Colonel led Chris and her detail to the basement of Maine Navy, where three armored town cars waited for them. The drive back to the elevator station was quick and quiet. The only break in the silence was no break at all. Chris, could I order some supplies and other stuff I need for making things like nanos and the likes? Go ahead, Chris thought. 
then settled back into her silence. She'd opened a lot more than she'd expected. People don't put their lives on the line unless something is worth dying for. For all her life, Chris had felt that stopping the Aitichi had been worth every drop of blood it took. As a daydreaming kid, she wished she'd been alive to fight the dirty Aitichi. She'd been shocked when Grandpa Trouble, in a moment of surprising honesty, told her 16-year-old self that he was glad she hadn't been there. Of course, you tell people that they're fighting for the survival of their wives, their children, for all they love. Who would die just so someone could get a word in edgewise? But that was what the whole war had been about. By the time reasonable people on either side got involved in the fighting, the slaughter had already begun, and massacre was all they could see. Chris thought of all the Aitichi war vets she'd run into on Ward Haven, Chance, Panda. She remembered those who still mourned lost loved ones. Could she tell them it had all been a horrible mistake? Not bloody likely. If she wanted to build a bridge across the chasm between humanity and the Aitichi, it would just have to wait. I don't know what your message is, Ron, but there are still too many alive who can't hear it which gave her a better understanding of why Ron had been saddled with the two green and whites, who seemed more bent on wrecking the embassy than helping it. Humans weren't the only ones who still needed their truth sugar-coated. They were halfway up the beanstalk and had just done the mid-climb flip when Colonel Cortez stood up. Excuse me if I'm interrupting any really important thoughts, meditations, or reveries, However, it has come to my attention that I'd rather spend the next couple of years in an honest-to-God jail than risk my fair skin bouncing from one long-knife situation to another. I am truly sorry, but is there any way I can get out of my contract and just go to prison? Sit down, Hernando, Jack growled. You've made your deal with the devil, or a long-knife, whichever seems worse. She and her family own your soul. Yep, Abby said. You're one of us now. There's no going back. But I had no idea what I was getting into. I have to agree with the colonel, Abby said. I'd never have thought that King Ray could cry. I saw him close once before, Chris said. It was another time that his wife came up. Eighty years and he's still not over her. Penny seemed lost in thought. Chris suspected she must be thinking of her lost husband of three days and wondering if she'd still be hurting eighty years hence. The colonel sat down and the trip continued in silence. Ron was waiting for Chris as soon as she crossed the quarter deck and was out of view from the dock. Did he talk to you? Grandpa's Ray and Trouble met with us. He didn't want to see you. He doesn't think there's any reason to talk to you. There is still too much blood in the water. Those were his words, probably a direct quote from your chooser. I asked him what he was trying to do back in the war. Was he really out to exterminate your people or just get a word in edgewise? And, Ron said, we were right. He only wanted to get talks going. But the war was horrible, and people don't march into that kind of hell to open communication lines. Your people, my people, all signed up to protect hearth and home. That's what they've been remembering for 80 years. That and their dead. Ron, it's not going to be easy to build a bridge between our two peoples. Maybe we'll just have to wait another 20 years. Chris... We don't have 20 years. What do you mean? Will your great-grandfather meet with me? Yes, tomorrow night at 10 o'clock. Tomorrow night, then, you will know why we cannot wait 20 years. Maybe not even two years. What is it, Ron? He turned back to Aitichi country. Tomorrow night will be soon enough. Chapter 18 
Early next morning, Chris woke to a call from the Marine Guard at the gangplank. Ma'am, Staff Sergeant Two here. I didn't want to disturb you, but I got a delivery here with your name on it, and I got to sign for it. Ma'am, I ain't never signed for nothing so small with this many zeros and commas in the cost box. That was followed by a clearly audible gulp. I haven't ordered anything, Chris said. You sure it's not for the ship? No, ma'am, it says Chris Longknife, care of the wasp, and it's got our peer correct. Chris, it's for me, Nellie said, using that little girl voice. Sergeant, I'll be right down, Chris said, ringing off. Nellie, Chris said, as she leaped out of bed and started pulling on a ship suit. You said I could order some supplies, Chris. What did you order that cost so much you made a Marine sergeant gulp? My children. Chris froze with her hand on the zipper. Your children? Yes, Chris. You've been talking about needing better computers for the people who work closely with you. You've been talking about them needing better computers. Chris had been thinking that maybe Nellie was right, but she didn't remember uttering a word about it. You never said anything against the idea. No, I didn't, Chris said, pulling the zipper up to her neck, right next to Nellie's off button. Tempting, but no, I promised. Nellie, you know that rule about you not starting a war. Yes, Chris. Here's rule two. Never sign off on any acquisition without telling me how much it's going to be. Not even for a new dress? Nellie, Abby orders my dresses. Through me? I keep your budget. How much is this going to cost? Chris, with you out beyond the rim, you haven't spent much money, hardly any in the last three months. So you spent it. And then some, Nellie admitted. How, some? A lot, some. Chris eyed her hair in the mirror. It looked to be a bad hair day, too. She must it more to her liking. Can I send this back? Please don't, Chris. I don't know, Chris. Some of the stuff was special order, fabricated just for me, overnight. That cost us extra. Yes. Let's go see what you got us into. Chris was three paces down the passageway when Jack joined her, impeccable, in undress khaki and blues. What has you up this early? Chris asked. Sergeant Two called me before he called you. And you told him to wake me. Don't you think signing for Kazillions is a bit above his pay grade? I know it's above mine. It's not that expensive, Nellie insisted. This is Nellie's doing? I approved her ordering some supplies, so she ordered a family. Family? Yeah, her kids. She says everyone close to me needs one. Count me out. Jack, you really need a better computer, Nellie pleaded. You giving this swabby lip is one thing, sometimes kind of fun. You giving a Marine officer lip? No way. Marines get shot for insubordination, haven't you heard? She won't be me. I'm not cloning myself. She'll be your computer, Jack. You bring her up to be your friend. He, Jack snapped, then realized what he'd done and gave Chris's neckline a sour look. If I had a smart-ass computer, it would be a he. But I don't need a smart-ass computer. I'm the way I am because I'm Chris's. No way do I deserve you, Chris insisted. I'm your karma, Nellie said flatly. What is it with your computer, Jack said. One week she doesn't believe in karma, and the next week she is karma. Chief Benny joined them muttering under his breath about the injustice of early wake-up calls. Who woke you up, Chief? Chris asked. Nellie. She said there was something only I could do for you. 
For her, Chris and Jack said together. What's she want? For you to, uh, deliver, build, construct her children. More Nellies? No way, the chief said. They aren't going to be duplicates of me. They'll be Jack's computer and Penny's and Abby's and yours, chief. I get one? You're part of Chris's team. Don't mean to interrupt, but just how do you expect each of these computer kids of yours to be different? Jack asked. They'll have my basic skills at organizing data and forecasting what you humans want. Oh, and they'll know the two rules. And a whole lot more that are coming, Chris added. But most of their self-organizing matrix will be left for them to arrange the way they want, based on what they need to work with the human they are working with. I note the failure to address ownership, Jack said. Nellie said nothing to that. Chris left the topic with a sigh. Sooner or later, she and Nellie would have to address the matter of what the relationship was between the two-legged human who walked around and the sentient being around her neck. Then again, she could always turn Nellie off. Not. Chris came to the quarter deck. A hairy twenty-something kid was showing clear signs of wanting out of there, but the Marine sergeant held both his clipboard and his package. A much larger package than Chris expected, say about the size of a hat box. Probably most of that is just packing, Chris hoped. Chris took the clipboard and whistled softly at the price on the invoice. I told you it was high, ma'am, Staff Sergeant Two said. Nellie, this isn't a couple of months of earnings for my trust fund. This is a whole year. But you hardly spent anything while you were stationed on Eden. Only because the art show got shot up before I could buy anything. But you didn't. This better be worth it, Nellie. I promise, it will be. Chris signed, and the delivery kid bolted. Okay, Nellie. Is the forward lounge available? It's still reserved for your team. It's empty just now. Why don't you invite the godparents of your children up to the lounge for the christening party? You better ask the galley to send along breakfast. If you'll excuse me, ma'am, Chief Benny said. I need to get some gear from my shop if we're going to be dealing with high-value electronics. Since we are, I guess you better. Do you need a clean room? I'll bring one. Fifteen minutes later, the lounge was serving a light breakfast on one side, and Chief Benny had set up a temporary clean room, as far from the bagels and bran muffins as he could. Chris circulated among the godparents as they arrived, Surprised by a few of Nellie's choices, Jack, Penny, and Abby were no-brainers. That the colonel was included showed that the poor fellow truly was under a life sentence. I guess if I accept this little trinket, I really am stuck with you, he said. Last chance to run, not walk for the door, Abby said. Sergeant Bruce, standing at Abby's elbow, was an even bigger surprise for Chris. The maid and Marine had been spending more and more time together. Chris could easily put his inclusion down to a romantic streak in her young computer. Still, the Marine was the usual volunteer for the tough stuff Chris needed doing. He would put the computer to good use. Chris had to do a check to see if Kara had just snuck in with her aunt or was actually invited. She was. I have a special version of me, who I think will be just great for Kara. Not exactly me the way I was when you were twelve. I was really dumb, but me the way I wish I'd been back then. No way would Chris go back to being twelve again. Captain Drago stuck his head in the room, spotted Chris, and immediately came to her. You called? Not me, Nellie, Chris said. Nellie quickly explained that she wanted the good captain to be the godfather and user of one of her about-to-be-activated children. The captain respectfully declined. I'm sorry, Miss Nellie. 
But I really can't run the risk of a strange and untrained computer locking up the ship's main computer. I haven't caused that computer any trouble. But you are a passenger's computer. There are certain limitations on your access. The captain's computer must have total access, from engineering to nav and everything in between. Nelly, don't. But it was too late. Ship's computer, Nelly said. How much of you have I accessed and when? Captain Drago's mouth took on a distinct scowl as his ship's computer reported. The passenger, Chris Longknife's computer, has accessed all functions and status reports of the ship since immediately upon coming aboard. I had to be able to tell Chris the ship was operating safely. I've been doing this since she was stationed on the firebolt. The ship was testing the power plant problems of the kamikaze class of corvettes, and I twice shut down tests before humans could see the impending destruction of the ship. So, you have been tiptoeing in and out of every nook and cranny of my ship and not leaving any footprints. I'm very good at not leaving footprints, Nelly preened. And I'm to trust you and this Trojan horse you're about to give me. I haven't let you down yet. Drago glanced around the lounge. Everyone in here is getting one of these little gremlins? Yep, Nellie said proudly. Even her, the captain said, waving at Kara. Yes, Kara shouted, and celebrated with an exuberant little dance. But Nellie promised me that she'd still be my teacher. Dada will just be my friend. We can play games together and talk and do all sorts of things, just like Nellie does with Chris. Drago eyed Chris as the two of them savored the order in which the names came. Nellie first, Chris last. I reserve the right to return this gift the first time it causes me or my ship any trouble. You won't. Try me or mine on for an hour, and you won't ever go back to a dumb computer, Nelly insisted. Professor Umfumbo was next in. He seemed quite excited about getting a fancy new computer at Chris's expense, but of course he would. Will you be paying for plug-in surgery? The professor asked, rubbing the back of his neck where Chris had added a net access to the plug-in that gave Nelly a direct connection to her brain. I understand that can be quite expensive. It is, Chris said. And believe it or not, this is setting me back enough for even a long knife to blanch at. No, you can talk to your computer like you do to your present system. I had to sub-vocalize to Nellie the first time I found myself under a gun. We survived. I'd never expect to face a gunman, the professor insisted. Never can tell around long knives, Sergeant Bruce said with an easy smile. Yes, of course, the professor said, and went looking for a cup of tea. How much longer before the great moment, Sergeant Bruce asked. Abby really wants to know. Abby's smile turned into an elbow in the ribs. Speak for yourself, Moraine. Don't you go hiding behind a working woman's skirts? A smart Marine uses anything for cover, he shot back, but put some distance between his soft side and her hard elbow. I think we're about ready, Nellie said. I've been bringing them up and loading what I want on them as Benny put them together. Kara's dada is the last one. It needs the least work done on it. I'm putting them in smart metal skins so you can accessorize them any way you want. Abby pointed out the need for that. Chris, I will want to put myself in a new skin as well. Nothing's too good for my girl, since she's already ordered it and paid for it from my account. Will you ever let me forget that? I'll think about that. Hmm, nope. Don't see a good reason to let you forget it. 
There are a lot of things you probably wouldn't want everyone here to know about you, Chris, Nellie said. I can think of several incidents in high school that you found extremely embarrassing. You wouldn't. I haven't in the past, but I bet Abby could make a tidy sum for the both of us if I let her in on all the dirt. Remember that time in college? I remember nothing, Chris said, eyeing the overhead. Nothing about high school, nothing about college, and definitely nothing about the cost of your kids. I thought we could arrive at an acceptable settlement. You know, Chris, Jack said, I thought it might be good to have someone covering my back like Nellie, but I'm starting to have second thoughts. Me too, chimed in Abby. A girl's got the right to have a secret, or fifty. And I'm sure that you will bring up your new computer to recognize those important needs, Nellie said. So how come you don't? Chris asked Nellie. Look who brought me up. There is that, Jack said, rubbing his chin. So you're stuck with Nellie the way you raised her? Looks like it, Chris said. Hey, anyone here want the one and only original Nellie? I'll swap you for the brand new version. Think of all the time you'll save not having to train your new computer. Chris's suggestion was greeted by a crushing silence. Did I miss something? Chief Benny said, stepping outside the plastic walls of his temporary clean room. Nothing much, Penny said. Chris was just trying to escape her just desserts. What do you have for us? Brand new computers, Chief Benny said, with full Hamish flair. Fresh from the hands of a computer god, my friends. I want this one, he said, putting a tray of personal computers down on a table and selecting one. Kara, the turquoise jewel is yours, Nellie said. The twelve-year-old grabbed it and held it up for a good look. How do you tell them apart? Chris asked, looking at the others. There's no difference, Nellie said, until you download the contents of your old computer into the new one and start using it, they're all just about the same. Just about, Chris thought. Maybe Jack's is a bit more decisive. Penny's will cast its search parameters a bit wider. I didn't know what to do for Abby. I'm sure she will do just fine. The chief did have a surprise for them. Dangling from each computer was a thin wire headset. One by one, he attached it to each new owner's head at his or her temple, then ran it around one ear and down the back of the neck. He checked the results of this installation with a black box in his left hand. It's not as fancy as a direct insert into the brain, but it should be able to pick up a lot of your brain waves and send as well, the chief told them. Captain Drago went off to one corner to sit and stare at the ceiling, his lips occasionally moving. Professor Mfumbo headed for another. Penny and Abby settled down at a table, put their new and old computers next to each other, and waited for each of them to establish its own separate network. Jack, Colonel Cortez, and Sergeant Bruce took their own table. Kara started sitting next to Abby, but in a moment she jumped up, announced, Dada has just so many fab games, and dashed out, only to return a few minutes later with her gaming gloves, earphones, and goggles. This time she settled down on a couch and was soon waving her hands through a game. It's teaching her the mathematical relationships she was having so much trouble with, but don't tell her that, Nellie whispered. Chief Benny hovered at first one table, then another, making sure no one had any complaints. Once he was satisfied everyone was happy with his work, he went back into his clean lab. What's he up to? Chris asked. Da Vinci is not talking to me at the moment, Nellie said. I think they're doing something they don't want public yet. I hope the chief doesn't hurt Da Vinci. You can always wipe it down to basic and start all over again, 
Chris said. Would you do that to a baby of yours? Nellie snapped. Hold it, girl. You don't really want to be a person, do you? You've got advantages we flesh and blood types just don't have. You sure you want to adopt all our handicaps? I don't know. I need to think about it. And Chris found a growing quiet in her head. She considered roving the tables, but everyone seemed intent on staring at his or her computer, or the overhead, or the carpet. Even the viewports now showed only the wall of the space station with its disorder of pipes and conduits. Nothing fun there. Chris was just about to go see what Ron was up to, when a voice said in her head, Can you hear me, Chris? Since the voice sounded like her chief of security, Chris thought, Yes, Jack. How's it going? This is weird. You sound just like yourself. So do you. I don't have to punch for you, just kind of vaguely think Chris and something I want to say to you and you get it. Seems that way. We'll have to wait for someone else to try this comm link to see how much thinking it takes to get up a party line. Nellie, you listening to this? Of course I am. Don't bother me, though. Chris, she's just as snippy in your head as she is in your ear. Jack, I kind of expected that. Abby, expected what? Chris and Jack. You're here. Chris, hey, that came out together. Penny, what came out together? There was crosstalk for a second that sounded like unintelligible cocktail chatter. Then all of them fell silent. Chris, we'll need a way to settle crossed wires like that. Nellie, you have any suggestions? Nellie, I could give you all priorities, Chris first, Jack second. Chris, I don't like that. Who says I'll always have the most important thing to say? By trial and error, they found that three could talk at any one time, and that one of them could send a message to appear on Chris's eye, or in one of the glasses or contact lenses that the others wore, to allow them to interface with their computer. Between talking and messaging, they got matters settled. Chris, it's not as easy to know who and when to listen to when you don't have someone's body language to build on. Jack, I don't think this will ever replace a good old-fashioned bull session. Penny, still... It may come in handy tonight. There were a few times last night I sure would have liked to offer Chris my two cents worth, but wasn't about to open my mouth. Chris. Hey, folks, just because you can say it in my head doesn't mean I'm more likely to take advice I don't want to hear. Abby. I knew she was going to say that. I knew it. Nellie. A hard head is still a hard head, even when you're hammering at it from the inside. I could have told you that. Chris, weren't you knitting booties or something? Nellie, my children are getting along quite well with their new playmates. Penny, oh God, already we've been demoted from godparents to playmates. How quickly the mighty fall. Chris, is it time for lunch yet? The four of them headed for the wardroom, leaving Kara waving through a game and the others frowning nowhere in particular. After lunch, Chris dropped by Aitichi country, only to find one of Ron's marines blocking the door. My lord is in conference with his advisors and asks that he not be disturbed. It was unheard of for Chris to have nothing to do, but somehow it was happening today. She had a long list of questions she would love to have answered, people she'd really like to talk her problems over with, but there was no one she dared talk with about her present mess. Finally, Chris had Nellie call up a college lecture she'd attended on group dynamics and the problems of public policy. Back when she took the course, she thought the upcoming elections put it in good context. Reviewing it now, it seemed the professor's choices of historical challenges looked rather tame. Early in the talk, Jack came in, settled down on her couch, and joined her. The two of them batted comments back and forth. She would have loved to curl up with her head on his shoulder, listen to another human breathe, heartbeat. 
she couldn't do that. But still, the afternoon and evening sped by in his company. Chapter 19 Chris's two great-grandfathers slipped aboard the Wasp with no fanfare. Admiral Crossenshield accompanied them, as well as, to Chris's delight, her brother, Hanovi. What are you doing back? he asked, as Chris gave him a hug. It will be easier to show you than tell you. What did they tell you? Only that you were back and into something big, and they'd like some help keeping you out of trouble. Too late for that. It's never too late, Hanovi said, sounding far too optimistic, but very political. You haven't seen what followed me home this time, were the last words Chris risked as the small party was guided to the forward lounge. The ship's carpenter had knocked together a table that afternoon that was as high as the average bar. The tall chairs looked like they'd been stolen from one of the station's more disreputable establishments. I think I remember the dive you got these from, Grandpa Trouble said as he passed Chris, heading for a seat. They promised me they'll look a whole lot better when we turn down the lights, Chris said. King Raymond and General Trouble took the two center seats. Chris sat at Grandpa Ray's right, with Hanovi beside her and Penny beside him. To Grandpa Trouble's left sat the intel admiral. Jack and the colonel were in dress uniform, along with the marines at both ends of the table. Somewhere behind them, Abby oversaw a full suite of recorders. Grandpa Ray turned to Chris. Are your marines locked and loaded? Everyone, Chris whispered and showed her grandpa where her own service automatic rode in the small of her back. He showed her his. Us long knives are a bunch of paranoids. Just doing what it takes to stay alive, Chris said. Yeah, he said, and faced forward, just as a recording blasted out the weirdest set of notes Chris had ever heard. So I didn't live long enough never to hear those again. Grandpa Ray muttered under his breath. He set his jaw and kept his seat. Beside him, Grandpa Trouble was coming to his feet at full attention. The rest of the people on Chris's side of the table followed suit, but Grandpa Ray put a hand on Chris's knee. Let's see how our royalty matches against his imperialism. Chris had spent a good half hour with Jack and Abby, going over the history of court etiquette. A king should sit through the arrival of an imperial ambassador, as senior to an equal's representative. But they'd concluded that a mere princess was junior to an imperial representative, since he was standing in for the big man, and she was only in line for the throne, which she actually wasn't. But Chris kept her seat. She hoped her great-grandfather appreciated her obedience. He did smile at something. The Imperial Herald entered, his pole weapon shortened to make it through the entry easily without dipping. Aitichi Marines came next. The wall across from Grandpa Ray had been left vacant for them, and they quickly filled it in. Grandpa's Ray and Trouble took the Imperial Aitichi Marines in with hard eyes. The two navy gray and golds marched in, squared their corners, and came to rest at either end of the table. Grandpa Ray studied the two and seemed content. His eyes grew hard again as the two green and white imperial counselors slowly made their way in. They refused to look at anyone on Chris's side of the table, fixing their eyes on the ceiling behind Chris's head. Finally, Ron processed in his raiment sparkling in the dim light of the lounge. With full solemnity, he walked to the center of the table. He took in Chris, seated beside the king, and locked eyes with King Raymond, all four of them. Then he bowed. Chris took Nellie from around her neck and set her on the table between them. I greet you, 
King Raymond of the long-reaching knife, in the name of my imperial master. Ron started slowly, giving Nellie plenty of time to translate. I speak to you with the full authority of my imperial master, and at the most special request of my chooser. You know him as a negotiator for our imperial master, when you and he met at what you call the Orange Nebula. There, you brought the blessings of peace once more to the people and to your own kind. He instructed me to tell you that he still holds fond memories of you and has told me to rejoice that you are in good health and still not with your illustrious ancestors. He hopes that you remember him well and also hold good hopes for his continued health. I am sad to see that he has not yet been invited to drink the poison cup to its fill, King Ray said in a soft growl. The two green and white's eyes grew wide, and they looked at their young superior with necks dark red. Chris had to work to keep her own head from swiveling around and her mouth closed. Admiral Crossenshield went ghost white, showing that humans could use skin tones to communicate their feelings. Ron barked a sound that was the closest the Aitichi came to a laugh. <laughs> My chooser warned me that you were likely to say that. I am to assure you that it has been a close thing several times, but so far he has managed to hand that cup out, not to drink from it. I suppose I should be glad that Roth is still above ground. King Raymond said. He was none too sure that the agreement we made together would not require him to drink a barrel of the stuff. He shared with me that it was, as you say, a close thing. In the end, the emperor smiled upon him and the peace he brought from you. It is good to enjoy peace and harmony, is it not? Such words were not just empty platitudes to the Aitichi. There were formal replies to make to them. Beside her, Grandpa Ray must have remembered that, or maybe his personal computer was quickly reviewing some things with him that hadn't been fully disclosed to the historians. While King Ray did the yammering that court required, Chris took a look around. Beside her, Hanovi's eyes were not quite as wide around as an Aitichi's, but it was close. His one glance her way was pure big brother. Sis, you really outdid yourself this time. Chris would have loved to stick her tongue out, in sisterly fashion. But there are things a princess just does not do. But it was close. An examination of the Aitichi marines against the wall showed that their weapons were not loaded. Chris was grateful for that show of trust. She would have gladly had her marines unload, but that didn't fit into the protocol process, so she let it ride. Chris tried to get a look at Admiral Crossenshield's face, but Grandpa Trouble was leaning forward, studying each of the Aitichi across from him. He kept going back to Ted, the old Navy officer that seemed to be Ron's most trusted advisor. Did they know each other? A glance over Chris's shoulder showed that Abby was recording all of this, and that Kara's head was peeking out from behind one of the couches against the wall. That little trickster, Chris thought. Don't worry, Chris. I know she's there, and I've already told her that she will be composing a thousand-word essay on this experience, from her viewpoint. No just quoting what people say. Did you know she was up to this? No, Chris. She turned off Dada, something I had not expected, Clearly, policy needs to be established. Yes, but further thoughts about the twelve-year-old vanished as King Ray leapt to his feet. Repeat what you just said. Across from him, Ron took a step back from the table but did not blink. His neck, a disengaged green, suddenly went pale, then red, then pale again. I said that my chooser looks forward to the day when I teachy and humans may stand together, presenting our common faces to our mutual enemies. 
Nelly. Are you sure that you have the right translation for that? The king demanded. Yes, your highness. All of those words have been used many times, and I am over 99% confident of their usage. Although mutual and enemies have not been used together in any recorded conversation, I am sure that I have properly translated them. She has properly translated them, Ron said softly in English. I want this room emptied. You, Captain Montoya, he said, glancing at Jack. Get your Marines out of here. Chapter 20 Gunny Sergeant, Jack ordered. Make it so. Redeploy your Marines outside this room and assure that what is said in here stays in here. Under Gunny's orders, the Marines withdrew by the numbers. Ron said something, and the Aitichi Marines followed the humans out. Ms. Nightingale, the king said, turning to Abby. Close down your recording equipment and wipe it clean. I want no record made of this meeting. If anyone has a recording device and that includes computers, wipe them and turn them off. I need to keep Nellie on to translate, Chris said. Keep her on, but no recording, the king snapped. Nellie, keep recording. But the king just said, I know what he said. But you heard me. Yes, Chris, I will keep recording and I will lie if I am asked about any record I make. Yes, this is just between us two. Abby finished closing down her equipment and stood. King Ray pointed at her. You, out of here. And take Kara with you, Chris added. Kara? Abby said, glancing around. Yeah, she's hiding behind the sofa. The maid retrieved her niece and frog-marched her out to loud preteen protests that were ignored. A slight smile might have crossed the king's lips as he watched the youngster go and glanced at Chris, but his attention was quickly drawn past her. Colonel Cortez, isn't it? Yes, your highness. I don't know you, and I choose not to trust you in this matter. Would you please wait outside? As you wish, your highness the officer said and left. Lieutenant Pasley, we've had dealings before. I mean no disrespect, would you mind? He said, indicating the door with a slight nod of the head. She followed the colonel. An Ovi long knife, the king said. I am my father's eyes and ears, the young politician pointed out, showing no willingness to move and may well be his knife in someone's back. He has not used me that way yet. I suspect it is only for lack of need lately, the king observed. If you exclude me, I will feel free to guess. But you will be guessing. You will not know. Please leave us. And what of my father, your grandson and the prime minister of one of your most supportive planets, Hanovi pointed out, not budging from his chair. I would prefer to decide the moment and the place, if any, that I choose to bring him in on whatever this pile of steaming horse shit is that your sister dropped in my lap. He has enough on his plate. What he doesn't know won't contribute to his ulcer. What did that mean? Is father okay? Chris asked as her brother headed for the door. No worse than usual. Hanovi answered before the door closed behind him. Now Chris found herself staring eye to eye with Grandpa Ray. Was he about to order her out too? The thought of bringing Ron this far, only to be left out of whatever it was he carried, was a kick in Chris's gut. Chris swallowed hard and steadied her breath even as her stomach lurched. If ordered, she would obey. She owed Grandpa Ray that much as her king. Do you want to keep Jack here? Grandpa Ray asked Chris. It took her a moment to realize that she was to stay, and her king was asking her if she wanted Jack 
on the inside of whatever this was. There was no way she could leave Jack in the dark, though it might be the best choice for him. Still, he was her shield as well as her right arm. No, he was more. He was Jack. Yes, Chris said. If he's to provide for my security, he needs to know what I'm doing and why. Ray nodded and did a turnaround before he sat back down. Chris, Ray, Trouble, Crossy, and Jack, now faced across the table, as Ron and his two green and whites and pair of navy gray and golds stared back. Apparently, Grandpa Ray remembered, or had been reminded by his computer, that he could not order the Imperial Herald out. The pole weapon holder in black stood his post, watching but ignored. Grandpa Ray settled into his chair, leaned forward on the table, and said, Now, will you tell me why Roth really sent you to hunt up his old war buddy? Nellie translated. Ron stepped forward to lay his elbows on the table in a double imitation of Ray. From the chip of a smile Ray and Trouble gave him, there must have been a story behind it, one that old war buddies share only with each other. Tedun will brief you on the details, Ron said through Nellie. The Navy officer pulled a projector from beneath his robes and placed it on the table. It lit up, displaying a holographic star map. You humans have been expanding quite a bit, Nellie translated for him, as the occupied planets in human space lit up in red. A glance showed Chris that he had the rim worlds very accurately identified. Yes, there were three of the four sooner planets she knew of, and a few she didn't. Nellie, record that. Chris, this doesn't feel right. Ron trusts us. If I get to feeling guilty, I can always have you erase it. If it's not there, I won't have it if I need it. Yes, ma'am. The king took a long minute to examine the map, then glanced at Trouble and Crossy before saying, You seem to have a pretty accurate assessment of our growth. Ray left the question, how, hanging unspoken. We have our ways, the Aitichi captain answered. You may tell your Ms. Nightingale that her reports did not make it any easier to find Princess Chris, he added with a slight bow to her. Chris accepted the praise with a frown. Clearly the Aitichi have not ignored humanity like we have them, or have we? Chris shot a questioning glance at Admiral Crossenshield. He ignored it, and, like Trouble and Ray, continued the study of the map. Nelly, how accurate is it? Very. They even have the two alien planets we found through the new fuzzy jumps. I don't know how much they know about the jump technology, but... They are on the map. The silent study period lengthened until the Aitichi Navy officer tapped his projector. We have also been growing. Now, a section of stars turned golden. Like most humans, Chris had only a rough estimate of the range of the Aitichi Empire. Eighty years ago, humanity's 150 planets had formed a very small crossbar to a T, where the bottom was a long sweep of Aitichi space. Now human space had expanded away from the Aitichi side, widened, and even begun to curve around. The Aitichi had thickened around their middle and grown away from human space. Have you got a count yet, Nellie? They have gone from 2,012 planets to 2,456, Chris, We've grown from 152 to 643 planets. I've checked. None of their planets are on the new fuzzy jump point map. The odds are very high that they do not have the navigation technology we now have. Thank you, Nellie. Chris waited for King Ray to say something. Instead, he turned to Grandpa Trouble and gave him the smallest hint of a nod. I'm glad to see you've had some healthy growth. Though isn't it a bit fast for what your grandpa told us was usual for the Empire? My chooser told me 
that you'd probably notice that, Ron said through Nelly. Yes, we sped up the pace of our exploration and colonization now that we know we are not alone in this corner of space. I can't help but notice that you did not slow down your human drive for water to swim in. One might even say you picked up the pace. You are, no doubt, aware of the Treaty of Wardhaven that our mutual friend Ray here pushed through while he was still president of the Society of Humanity. It exerted control over that growth, General Trouble said evenly. Nellie translated. My chooser noted it, but was quick to point out that it did not so much slow down your expansion as confine it to specific space. Humanity filled in its territory in concentric rings. Still, you spread. That is what our people do, Trouble said. Go new places, see new things, have big families and lots of friends. So my chooser observed both to me and to the emperor. And as you also observed to my chooser, we Aitichi like our large bustling cities surrounded by familiar, well-ordered lands. I don't imagine it was easy for you to get colonists for so many new planets, Grandpa Trouble said. It has caused discomfort to many, Ron said. Beside him, his green and white counselors looked up from their intense study of the table and nodded as they met Chris's eyes. Their necks showed purple. Chris had never seen an Aitichi go purple. Nellie, what's purple mean? I don't know, Chris. It's not in any of the books. Score another for informal censorship. Chris glanced at King Ray, or maybe it was quite intentional. He didn't look all that bothered by what he saw. His face would have fit comfortably at any poker table. His eyelids flicked at a steady rhythm. His breath was slow and stable. Otherwise, he was motionless as a statue. But behind the eyes, you could almost see the brain working, gnawing every word, every motion. Now Chris understood why her great-grandfather was a legend. So, Grandpa Ray said, suddenly entering the discussion. You've told us that you've been keeping an eye on us, just like we've been keeping an eye on you. Chris had been doing her best to imitate her great-grandfather's poker face, but at that, her eyebrows shot up. Truly, there was a lot she did not know about her world. Her, and a couple of hundred billion other people. You've shown us your map, which pretty much agrees with ours. Roth didn't need to send his kid for this. Certainly not at the price it must have cost him in political chits if it meant getting old sticks in the mud like these counselors moving along. Ted, what's really going on here? The king finished, fixing his eyes on the Aitichi Navy officer. The Aitichi barked one of their laughs, but said nothing as he turned to Ron. The young Aitichi nodded. Chris reminded herself that a nod here was a shake to her. My chooser said you were sharp, much sharper than my counselors would expect you to be, Ron said, and put a hand each on his green and whites, giving them a shove sideways. They went back to studying the table as soon as they had returned to their place. The Aitichi are in trouble, King Raymond, the imperial representative said through Nelly. That is the message my chooser ordered me. To bring to you. That is the burden of the message my emperor placed upon me. That is not a message my counselors agree with. At the moment, the court of my emperor is very divided. Yet the situation is fraught with such dark danger and chaos that my chooser dispatched me to you with these words. May I speak them? Chris recognized that as pure high court I teach ye. A messenger did not drop bad news on an emperor without his permission. More than one dynasty had fallen while an emperor sat quietly in his garden, a long line of refused messengers waiting without for permission to enter. 
King Ray sighed. Speak your words, I am attentive, was the most positive reply. Our exploration ships are vanishing again, Ron began. Near human space, the king cut in. No, Ron shot back. Tedden, show him. Three stars began flashing white. They were as far from human space as they could get, well beyond the edge of the Aitichi Empire farthest from humanity. You are exploring far afield, General Trouble said. The discovery of you by our wandering men who admitted no allegiance to any rule was very unpleasant for the old emperor. He did not want to repeat that again. He began, and his wise and heavenly chosen successor has continued to send out ships to map the stars as a heavenly chosen should. And what have you found? Trouble asked. Many planets suitable for Aitichi to swim in, just as you have found many planets for your people to walk on. Until recently, all had gone well and left us full of harmony and peace. Until, Ray said. Ron turned to Ted. The Navy officer took up the story. A ship failed to return. It was not the first ship that did not return its crew to the people. Accidents happened to Aitichi, as they do to humans. No debate there. We sent a second ship to follow in its wake. It also did not return. Both Grandpa Ray and Trouble emitted a low whistle. Once, maybe chance. Twice and you look for enemy action, Trouble said. That is something I learned while still sucking scum off the pond, Ted said. I learned it at my pappy's knee, Trouble agreed. As I often tell other Aitichi, Ted said, eyes burning holes in the heads of two green and whites. Wisdom does not count elbows. We sent out a number of ships, one to each of the planets the missing ships were ordered to explore. A good approach, the king said. The ship sent to this one did not return. Ted said. A planet quit blinking white and turned to a steady bright white. Do you know anything about that planet? Trouble asked. We have sent two more ships. We have not gotten so much as a messenger pod back, the Navy officer said. Not good, Trouble said. How could something blast a ship out of space before it could even get a messenger pod back through the jump point it had just come through? Someone or something must be right there, ready to hit them with massive force. Chris started to open her mouth, then closed it. The Aitichi must have extracted every bit of information from those events, long before they told her. The problem was that there was so little data available. The words hung between them. No one spoke. What could anyone say? When the silence stretched so far it was about to bend into a pretzel, Chris could keep her mouth closed no more. What do you want from us? Help, Ron said. One word, simple, yet pregnant with unidentified needs. What kind of help? Chris asked. Just a moment. Mr. Imperial Representative, King Raymond said. Chris, you've probably figured out by now that Trouble and I answered the reporter's questions honestly. But if they didn't ask the right questions, we didn't help them get the whole story. That has crossed my mind, Chris admitted dryly. On the table, Nellie went right on translating everything into Aitichi. Well... There's a thing that I learned about the Aitichi from Ron's grandpa. The Aitichi take the long view. Show them a problem and they start looking at it from every direction immediately. They like to get all the input, all the information, everything they can know about it before they start doing something about it. 
They also like to start doing something about it a whole lot earlier than we humans might want to. Have I got that right, Mr. Ambassador? That is the way of it. They sure got into a war with us, Fast and Furious, Chris pointed out. Yes, but we were an exception to their normal rule. Maybe the previous emperor had allowed the wandering men to get more out of hand than normal. Some advisors thought it was smart to let misfits wander away from a civilization they didn't fit. Right, imperial counselors? It is possible that such fools who failed their master and the heavens might have wasted air, one of the green and whites admitted. He followed that up by spitting on the deck. Whether because of the admission or because of the blunder, Chris was left to guess. So they weren't expecting us, King Raymond said, and had no reason to suspect they weren't alone in the universe. Then, bang, we collide head on, and there are blood and guts all over the place and not a lot of brains. For an imperial court that prided itself on its foresight, it took them a while to admit that they'd been blindsided and do something about it. Which left Chris something new to chew on, but it didn't answer her immediate question. So, what are Ron and his grandfather expecting from us? Action? A shoulder to cry on? A battle fleet? Grandpa Ray turned to Ron. I think this comes under the heading of a warning to us. There's a problem out there. He wants us to know about it and maybe start getting our rumps moving towards some kind of alliance. Am I right on that? All of that, Ron said. But my chooser said to tell you that we also would like more. The king's eyes grew wide, and he leaned back in his chair, giving General Trouble a quick nod. What kind of more? Grandpa Trouble asked. Before I met Princess Chris and her amazing Nellie, I did not believe the words my chooser gave me. Now I understand much more about the remarkable and intelligent machines you humans have. He asks if you might provide us with very small explorers who can slip into a system and back out again without setting off the weapons that destroyed our ships. Now it was Grandpa Trouble's turn to lean back in his chair. Chris, you're the one that's been doing the exploring. What are your thoughts on this? Chris had rather enjoyed sitting in a meeting and not having to say a word. It also had been a joy to see two old legends doing their stuff. Suddenly she was reminded that she was one of those damn long knives and had to earn her keep. I'm divided, she said, for an opener to keep the silence at bay. I'd like to help Ron... Nellie translated. I'd like to do something to show his people that us humans can be a good ally. I hear a but coming, Trouble said. There is, Chris agreed. Not having any idea of what's on the other side of the jump, I'd hate to make a present to them of our best technology. I don't want to show them what we've got. I really don't want to let them capture and reverse engineer it. All good points, Ray agreed. Still, in my lifetime, we've gotten into one war already we didn't have to fight. I suspect Roth might be looking for some way to avoid a repeat of that experience. That is so, Ron said. But with the disappearance of each ship and crew, he begins to have trouble seeing through the murky water to any other outcome. We are at our wit's end. His words, for me to tell you. He hoped that you humans might have a different, ah, uh, perspective, a way of looking at things. The idioms Ron and Roth threw around told Chris, even more than the accurate map of human space, that someone had been studying humanity quite a bit. Yes, Grandpa Ray said with a sigh. Yes, we humans do have different ways of looking at things. 
Not just different ways from you I teach ye, but different ways of doing things and seeing things among ourselves. I need time, King Raymond said. My chooser told me you would. I am prepared to wait. Good. Now, if you will excuse me, I hope you will stay here while I get things moving outside, and maybe have a few words with my great-granddaughter. Crossy, would you take care of them? Don't tell them too much if you can, and see if you can't get something worthwhile out of them. You're asking a lot, Your Highness. Can I at least have the famous Miss Nellie? Chris nodded yes. So much for the benefit of this job, Ray grumbled. Trouble, you want to come with me? You too, Jack. The four of them left Admiral Crossenshield staring across the table at five Aitichi, with no one saying a word. Chapter 21 Outside, Jack used his new computer to tell the Aitichi Marines to rejoin the others. They quickly filed in. As the door closed, King Ray looked up and down the line of Marines standing guard. Those who'd been inside were in formal red and blues. The outside ones were in full battle rattle. Ray's back went ramrod straight as he faced the troops. Marines, I don't need to tell you that having Aitichi at Wardhaven talking to me is both an unusual and momentous event. The Marines answered him with minimum nods. I also don't need to tell you that it will complicate the life of an old soldier if this gets into the media. Even without pictures, I'm sure they'd all love to shout about this. I don't want to have to answer those shouts. I need you to keep quiet. No talking to your wives. No talking to your girlfriends. No talking to anyone. Do any of you have a problem with that? No, sir, Gunny growled, followed only a split second later by the others. Good. Captain, you can dismiss most of these men. But if you will, double the quarterdeck watch. I don't want anyone leaving this ship for a while. Does that include civilians? Civilians, the king said, then corrected himself. Oh, right. Chris has a batch of scientists aboard, don't you? He said, eyeing her as if it was all her fault. Yes, sir but they all have reserve papers that I can activate and put them under the UCMJ. Oh, I bet they'd love that, Grandpa Trouble said. They've already had their noses rubbed in those papers once or twice, Jack said. I can't say they liked it, but they have gotten kind of used to it. They should have known the danger of getting too close to a damn long knife, Grandpa Ray said with a scowl. I've heard that bitch a time or twelve, Chris admitted. Lock the boat down. No one goes ashore, the king said. Thank God there are few pubs in civilian country, Sergeant Bruce muttered. There are, the king said. Good. Tell the barkeep that the first two pints for you marines tonight are on me. Better include the boffins, Chris added, or there will be hurt feelings, and maybe hurt jaws. Gunny picked off Marines to stand guard here and expand the quarter deck. The rest left happy enough. Now, my princess, we need to talk. Me and you, and maybe the rest of your team. And where is that little girl I saw quick marched out of there? I am not a little girl. I'm twelve and a half, Kara pointed out. And getting quite an education, it would appear, the king noted. What are the chances I could lock you up in a deep, dank dungeon somewhere on Wardhaven and throw away the key? Kara's answer was a pouty face. Chris chose to verbalize one. About the same as me having a full-fledged mutiny breaking out on my ship. Oh, I see, said the king. She's being spoiled rotten just like you were. And for a whole lot better reason, Chris added. Grandpa Ray tossed Chris a quizzical look, but she doubted there were enough hours left in the month to explain herself. The king shrugged and asked, Is there a place I can talk to you and the rest of your team? 
My tack room is just down that passageway, she said, and led him there. A moment later, she found herself seated, with her brother Hanovi at her left elbow, her great-grandfather and king at her other elbow at the head of the table, and Grandpa Trouble across from her. Jack, the colonel, Penny, and Abby arranged themselves along the table below her. Somehow, Kara ended up at the foot of the table, grinning at the king opposite her, which raised serious questions about whose end really was the head, but Chris decided not to address that point. King Raymond began. I was glad to get the word you were coming home, even if it did involve bringing an Aitichi with you. I'd just been thinking that I really needed your help. Needed my help? Chris echoed. Something tells me that I've gotten too close to a damn long knife. The chuckle from around the table came to a quick end, as the king answered with a dry, No doubt. Well, Chris had dumped an Aitichi problem on her great-grandfather. Maybe she should offer to pull one of his chestnuts out of the fire. What kind of help do you need? Trouble here remembered that you had a couple of friends in college from Texarkana. Robert and Juliet, do you remember them? Yes, Chris admitted. They were the only ones from that godforsaken planet, and when homesickness about killed them, they kind of came together. By second year, I never saw one without the other. It happened that way for a lot of kids at Wardhaven U who were far from home. Those two couldn't be a problem. They aren't. Their folks are, Grandpa Trouble said. Isn't it always the grown-ups, Chris said with a theatrical sigh. When will they ever learn to behave? Not funny, princess, the king said. Juliet's a Travis, one of the five families that started up the planet. They were sick and tired of big cities and the city slickers who run them, so they set up Texarkana, with a catastral survey to start with. They based everything on a six-mile-by-six-mile-square township. A barony was 36 of those. A dukedom was 36 baronies. A duke had a seat in the House of Dukes and ran the place. Chris could still access Nellie on her local net. Nellie did the numbers for Chris, and also added that Crossy was not getting the Aitichi to say much to him. Chris started to smile at the Admiral's problem, then suddenly realized that the numbers didn't mean anything. Hold it. Population size doesn't matter? Right, Grandpa Trouble said. One township, one vote. One barony, 36 votes. The landowner voted the land. Remember, these folks were tired of big city ways. They figured the best way to make sure no one built a city was to give it no political say. And it worked how? Jack asked. Not all that well, Trouble said. It worked fine, Grandpa Ray put in. So long as the settlers were cattle ranchers and farmers from Earth's Texas. Space is big. How did Texarkana manage things for the cowboys? Now Chris was remembering some of the hats and skirts and boots that Juliet had worn her first year. And she'd even talked a couple of girls into going horseback riding one weekend. The other girls were complaining for a month after that. Juliet had taken to wearing pretty much regular college clothes after she and Bob got together. Suddenly, Chris saw where things were going. So long as Texarkana was just one little cow town after another, they didn't have any problems, Grandpa Trouble said. But when we dropped in a load of workers from New Cleveland, things got interesting. Not immediately. Right, Chris said. There was a war to be won. Didn't you evacuate New Cleveland right after the Port Elgin massacre? Immediately after it, Trouble said. People were frantic to get clear of a potential battlefront. 
They crammed themselves into ships and took turns breathing until they got someplace safe. And Texarkana was about as far from Aitichi space as you could go. They started with next to nothing. But one of the second generation kids had completed the mineral survey. The new arrivals knew where iron was and water power. And in no time at all, the dukedom of Denver was a going industrial concern. Using the workers from New Cleveland, Chris said. I can't remember Bob's last name. Duval, the king said. His father is a plant owner in the dukedom of Denver. Let me guess, Chris sighed. On Tex Arcana, a factory boss's son would never meet a Travis girl. Not in a million years. I was pretty shocked to see you show up with an Aitichi in tow. That was nothing compared to Juliet Travis coming off the shuttle, hand in hand with a Duvale. Grandpa, I didn't bring an Aitichi home. I just, well, brought an Aitichi home. You know, it's not like I want him to meet my family. Grandpa Ray lifted an eyebrow. The rest of my family... Her brother raised another eyebrow. The two of you are horrible. Just for that, I ought to. What? Both said. Never mind, I just ought to. If you three will kindly stop your dramatics, Grandpa Trouble said. There's a world here that needs saving. I still don't see the problem, Penny said. I'm with you, Jack agreed. Grandpa Ray leaned forward. To join United Sentience, or whatever we call this thing, you have to have a single government on your world. There are a few other things, and the list seems to grow every month, but one united government is something we have all agreed on. And, Chris, Penny, and Jack said, the industrial dukedoms are threatening to withdraw from Texarkana's central government and start their own. And how is that any skin off your nose, Grandpa? Chris said. If they want to mess around, let them mess to their heart's content. When they get it straightened out, they can join then. John Austin Travis is Texarkana's representative to the Constitutional Convention at Pitt's Hope. He's also the leader of the party that supports my position in the Congress. If he gets tossed out of the convention... My faction could dissolve in a leadership fight, and the pending constitution I support may get amended into something I'd never support. Hold it, Chris said, coming half out of her seat. I thought you weren't taking a position on the constitution. What happened to letting the founding fathers give the people they represent the government they want? He saw what some of the founding fathers and mothers wanted, Hanovi growled. Chris sat back down. Is it that bad? It's real bad, Hanovi said. I let them yammer on too long with no leadership. He could have had exactly what he wanted a year ago if he just said the word, Chris's brother said. But no, he had to do his sit on the porch on Wardhaven and let them find their own way. You give some people enough time and they'll find all kinds of new ways to stab you in the back and get someone else's fingerprints on the knife. You weren't this cynical the last time I saw you, Chris told her brother. I hadn't spent a year representing Wardhaven on Pitt's Hope, he answered. Hanovi had always been the big brother, ahead of her, confident, able to do just about anything. There had been times when Chris just about worshipped him. He'd even tried to keep her from climbing into a bottle after Eddie died. Now, for the first time, the idealistic optimist wasn't there when she looked at him, and Grandpa Ray had excluded him from the Aitichi plea for help. Maybe the king would bring him in later, but the ground was moving under Chris's feet, and she wasn't sure it would ever be quite the same again. Chris considered asking Hanovi for a full report on what was coming down on Pitt's Hope then decided she'd be happier not knowing. 
What do you plan to do? She asked. I'm going to Pitt's Hope, King Raymond said. Thank God, Hanovi said. Apparently, he left a lot unsaid as the king frowned at him. I'm glad you're going, Ray, Trouble said. So her brother had an ally. But it won't do me a damn bit of good if Tex Arcana blows up, the king said, eyeing Chris. If I tackle Tex Arcana, will you see about the Aitichi problem while you're at Pitt's Hope? Chris said, nodding toward the lounge. I'll put out feelers on the matter, King Raymond said, which left Chris wondering what that meant. If the king is going to Pitt's Hope, Colonel Cortez said, who will take care of the Aitichi? Have I missed something? I thought we'd leave them here on Wardhaven, under the king's protection. That was what I assumed, Chris said. But it doesn't look like that's an option. No, it's not, the king said, leaving no doubt about that. Are we going to keep them with us? Penny asked. It looks that way, Chris said. Your crew knows about them, Trouble said. I think it best that you take the wasp, crew, Aitichi, and all with you to Texarkana. You've got to keep them out of the media. I'll do my best, Chris said. Your Highness, is there anything else I need to know about Texarkana? Just don't start a war. Don't let the word about the Aitichi leak out. And don't lose me the leader of my coalition the king said. That ought to just about do it. Right, Grandpa Trouble said. You're a long knife. It should be a piece of cake.